Hey there. Welcome to the wise world wide online expo. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Damian Kassbauer. I'm streaming here live from Seattle uh, for a day of wise excitement. We got a lot of stuff lined up. Um, give you a little peek at what we're kicking things off with here. Um, Tiffany and I are going to do a little dance for you here in a second. And before that, uh, I'm here just to say welcome. Uh, we'll also have uh, Martin Klein, Tucker Dowd, and Simon Ashby during this introduction segment. And as we kind of get settled into this new live streaming frontier, um, keep us posted in the chat. Let us know how it goes. Um, it's a grand adventure. And so with that, I want to welcome Tiffany Dawson to the live stream. Hey, Tiffany. How's it going? Hello, Damien. It's going great. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm so excited that everybody is joining us today. Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. Uh, so Tiffany's been helping out on the marketing side of this and really could not have done it without her. Um, the amount of effort to pull together over 20 Audio Kinetic developer speakers, um, some external-wise folks, and just a, a, a full di day, like six odd hours. Tiffany, what have we done? I'm not sure, but I'm so excited to see this and hear from everybody. Um, for those who are curious about what the schedule is in detail, I've put the link in the comments and I will put it in the comments a few more times so you can grab that link. That way you can check where we're at and see where you'd like to join in during the day. Uh, and we encourage you to engage in the chat rooms because we will be there with you. We're going to be answering your questions. And I just wanted to say a big hello and thank you from Audio Kinetic for being here. Um, if you don't mind, Damien, can I mention our Audio Kinetic community blog? You should totally mention that. We, as you know, have a community blog that is for you by you. So if anyone who's watching has any amazing ideas or projects they'd like to share with the community, please feel free to connect with me and I would be happy to help you out with that. Awesome. And and I think that what you'll find today during this first introduction segment as we kind of get this rolling is that we're, we're really focused on this community piece. Um, why a live stream event? Why now? Uh, I think there's a lot of, a lot of things uh, keeping us all glued to the screen uh, during these current times and um, you know, preventing us from connecting in real life. And so this felt like a huge opportunity for us to um, try and put people in front of each other and really reinforce this idea of community, which is something that, as Timpity mentioned as part of the blog, is, is part of the fabric of Audio Kinetic in general, weaving the community into and making them a part of this, um, this adventure that we're all on. Uh, so, you know, does it take the place of meeting in real, real life? Uh, we don't think so, but it's what we can do right now to help um, during these times. And yeah, we're just, we're glad to be able to pull something like this together for y'all. Um, speaking of that, uh, mm -hmm. we do the Wise Up on Air and Wise Up Hands on live streams um, monthly, sometimes bi-monthly. Um, so be sure to circle back from time to time, get subscribed. Uh, we'll keep you posted and let you know when we go live. Uh, with all this kind of content coming in today, we know that there is a, a long tail on what we can um, dig deeper into. Uh, so we'll scratch the surface on a bunch of stuff today, but definitely uh, keep your eye on the future and get signed up on our streaming channels so that we can go deeper with you in the future. 
I'm really excited. I'm going to say goodbye from the video now, but please tune in if you're not sticking around. A little bit later, around 6 o'clock, we'll be sending out a link for a meetup where we can enjoy, chat, and grab a beverage of your choice. Excellent. Ah, well, Tiffany, the, here we go. Uh, we'll see you in the chat. And thanks for all of your help coordinating this. Uh, let's get this show on the road. Bye now. See ya. Okay, so we're getting in the flow here. Uh, my next presenter is going to be Martin Klein, founder and CEO of Audio Kinetic. Uh, he's got 40 years of creative experience in the field of audio technology. Uh, a legend, a veteran. Uh, Martin, it's good to have you here today. Uh, how are you doing? Hello, Damien. Hey. I'm very well, actually. Excellent. And uh, thank you, and thanks, Tiffany, too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, you have some words for folks, and I appreciate you getting setting the tone here uh, at the start of the live stream. Uh, it's great to have you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us at this Wise World Tour Online Expo. We're extremely pleased today to hold that online expo, considering the extraordinary and unfortunate situation that is affecting all of us. But I really hope that you are all well and safe. We hold a lot of events around the globe, but for the past 15 years, GDC has been the main event where we can actually meet and exchange with the community. But this year, considering the extraordinary situation, we're among the first to pull off. And the main reason is was that we care for the safety of everyone. Since the lockdown, it has been our priority to continue serving you without interruption, to pursue our development and also maintaining our connection with you. That's why we're here today. <clears throat> I have to say that we are extremely privileged to work in an industry that allows us to continue to operate and to be productive with such situation. Sadly, this year, GDC was for us a time to celebrate the 20th anniversary of, WISE, uh, of Audio Kinetic. <laughs> I know for some of you will say that we celebrated 10 years in 19, uh, 16, 2016, sorry. But that was 10 years of commercialization. Yes, I founded Audio Kinetic in 2000, and it took us six years to get to our first commercial version. So I guess that we will have to celebrate when AK turns 21, then we'll have wise will have the majority age and we'll be able to attend every parties. <laughs> <laughs> Since the foundation, I have to say that it has been an amazing journey for us. The value of audio by then was far from being the priority for developer. I also remember that our role was not only to deliver great technology, but we had to become the evangelists of interactive audio. Today, we're very proud of being a pioneer in this front, playing a major role in creating the industry around interactive audio. One thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is from day one, our vision has been to build a world where audio creator can channel creation without limitation. That has always been and will remain the driving factor that define what we develop at Audio Kinetic. The gaming industry will always be our, prior, our first priority and main focus. But since interactive is growing everywhere around us, our goal is to become the catalyzer who will facilitate the audio community to work in multiple industry on creation like location-based entertainment, AR, VR, automotive, robotics, and others. We have great plans for the community in the years to come. You guys and girls continue to inspire us and have been the key player in, sh in shaping the interactive audio industry. It's amazing to think about how our community as creator has been designing how games should sound and today influencing how our world will sound. I believe that we are at a point of a very big, bright future for interactive audio. I'm very excited about the road ahead of us and looking forward not only to the opportunities, 
but also the challenges. That's how we know that we are passionate and that's how we keep innovating. So one last thing, I stay extremely positive about the fact that this crisis will be an accelerator for that will help us define a better world. So please stay positive. I really hope that you will enjoy all our tracks that we are presenting today. And I hope that we will have the chance to soon meet again. Thank you all again, and please continue to develop amazing creation that inspires us. Thank you. Fantastic, Martin. So glad to have your voice as part of this live stream and presentation. Uh, thank you for Audio Kinetic. Uh, it's a great place to be a part of, and I uh, appreciate your words today. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, that was Martin Klein. Thanks for that. Uh, next up, we've got Tucker Dowd. Uh, let me just do a little dance here and tell you about Tucker. He is the market business analyst here at Audio Kinetic. Uh, his responsibilities include uh, things like researching industry trends, gathering statistics, uh, on AK's business segments. He's generally making sense of the data that we get uh, and helping it to use, use it to serve our community and business. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tucker Dowd to the live stream. Hey, Tucker. Hi, Damien. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, how are you doing and today? Can you see my, uh, really good, really good. And can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Uh, you're in presentation mode. So let's see if we can't get you out of that. And okay. before we transition uh, you over is, to it. So sorry, you're seeing this? Yeah, correct. Uh, hold on one sec. We'll get there. This is Try part this of the fun of doing this live, right? Is doing, doing a dance. This would be the part where that? Cha Cha. That looks great. I really like that. Uh, Okay. And now we're dancing. So, uh, so great. What's the weather like in Montreal these days? Uh, today is good. Um, Excellent. Mild, sunny. <sighs> yeah, we have uh, dappled sunshine here in Seattle too. I'm glad to say, and uh, and uh, I'm glad to hear it. So cool. Uh, let's transition you to your presentation, and uh, without further hey, ado, you got it there. Take it away. Yep. Okay, you've got it there? Yep, you're all set. Okay, I'm here to talk about the audio kinetic community. Um, so we can start by talking about where uh, the audio kinetic community resides. Uh, this map shows the top five countries ranked in order of the number of community members in each. Uh, so we can see that the United States ranks first place, followed by the UK, China, Canada and Japan. And these countries make up approximately 60% of all of our community. Um, so you're probably wondering, what about the other 40%? The remainder is spread throughout the rest of the world with higher concentrations in uh, Western Europe, Asia, and the Asia Pacific region. But uh, I have another slide that will help us picture the whole community uh, a little bit better. Um, the auto Biokinetic community tends to be clustered in uh, urban centers. Uh, so these are the top cities ranked by number of AK members in each. Uh, so for those that maybe can't make it out, we've got number one, Tokyo, then Montreal, Seoul, London, LA, Paris, Orlando, Shanghai, Vancouver, and Beijing. And these cities account for about 15% of all audio kinetic community. Um, our community has experienced significant growth over the last five years. In fact, we're adding thousands of new users every month. Uh, from the start of 2015 to 2020, um, our community has grown uh, by a factor of 20. Uh, so what does that growth look like? This, hopefully you can make it out, is an animation that shows the approximate location of users and where and how they've accumulated over time. So 
as we add users through time, we can start to see a map of the world appear. It'll re reset in a second. Um, so as for the other 40%, you can see we have community in Central and South America, uh, all of Western Europe, Australia, all throughout the Asia Pacific region, India, and beyond. Uh, let's switch now to some other demographic information. Um, this chart shows the percentage of uh, our community by age categories. So uh, almost three out of four users are between the age of 25 to 44, with uh, nearly half being in the 25 to 34 range. Um, and this one shows our uh, community by job type. Uh, in this case, I've got students ex excluded um, from the calculation, but we'll, uh, we'll move to them on the next slide. So sound designers make up about one in four of our community, um, and followed by audio programmers at 15%, game designers 11, composers 9, uh, and producers and audio directors at 5% each. Um, On to the students. About one in three of the community are students uh, accessing our educational material. If we look at students based on their country, so uh, where they reside, uh, about um, the United States accounts for about one in four of our student population. Uh, that's followed by the UK, then France, Canada, and China. These top five countries represent just over about half of uh, our students. And finally, uh, last slide, if you complete the WISE course and take the exam to get certified, you can take the exam to get certified. Um, this show, chart shows the top five countries by the percent of WISE certifications granted, um, so i.e. the location of the student. Um, so four out of 10 of our certifications go to people in the United States, followed by China at 17%, Canada 14, UK 9, and Japan at 9. And these countries together represent almost all, about 90% of the certifications granted. Uh, so that concludes uh, my presentation. Excellent, Tucker. That really does highlight the global game audio community. Uh, so many people. Uh, in the chat room right now, we've got Russia, we've got California, we've got Seattle representing, uh, I've got Orlando, uh, that population you were talking about. Um, you know, just all over the world, people using WISE. Uh, it's, it's great to see everyone. So thanks for that. You're welcome. Talk to you later. Okay, cheers. So that was Tucker talking about uh, our global game audio community and our global wise community. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna change over now to Simon Ashby. Uh, Simon's the head of product here at Audio Kinetic, um, co-founder as well, uh, responsible for product development of Wise. Uh, he's just been at the heart of it for all of these years, um, helping to drive the uh, inspiration of the product, helping to drive the um, just the look and the feel. As a sound designer uh, from long ago, uh, he has the history that has been just um, built into WISE uh, at its core. And I'm thankful to welcome Simon to the live stream. Hey, Simon. Hey, Damien. How are you? Ah, I'm doing great. Yeah. I always appreciate great. seeing uh, seeing you on the video camera here. Uh, after after all of these months uh, since I started last year, um, this has been the one constant, and I always appreciate uh, seeing you. It's great to have you. Great. Great. Should I just uh, should I just go? I got your presentation all queued up. I'm going to transition you to it, and you will be off to the races. Okay, okay. So, um, so yeah. So, looking at the schedule, everything that will be discussed uh, today, and what 
Tucker just presented. So I kind of wanted to uh, to like put in front of a uh, uh, view people watching um, all the ingredients in the decision making process, like every angle that we look at anything we add to WISE. And I've prepped a few slides for that. Um, so here it goes. So kind of a cube with three different axes. Um, so when we design and, and add elements to, uh, to WISE uh, or in, in general uh, in our business. So, so of course there's the, uh, the, the industry segment axis. So gaming being the core of our business, of course, but those axes are all now using interactivity to a certain extent and where there's interactivity, you need interactive audio, and that's where WISE wants to cover all those grounds. So AR, VR for sure, uh, but location-based experiences, for example. So in the recent years, uh, large companies like Universal or Disney have started introducing in their theme park attractions uh, some interactivity. So it's not only to go and enjoy the ride, but it's also interact during the time that you're in those rides. And, and finally, automotive uh, out there where it's a, it's a segment that the manufacturers of cars now are, now are defining as the second living room. And what do we do in a living room where it's a place where we can have some entertainment going? And we can imagine in a few years from now, we, like a lot of cars will be self driven. So what do you do when you don't need to drive? Well, you can be entertained. And that's another place where audio kinetic and wise, um, we have a place for that. So that's one axis. And the other one is, well, of course, wise itself. And like I've put cross platform. So this is one of the main reason behind wise in the first place was to allow for authoring once on one platform, do your final product, your final mix, and make sure and be sure that you can deploy that mix on all platforms and it will go well. Um, integration, super important. So of course, everything we do, we make sure that it works fine with Unreal and Unity, but also with any uh, game developers with their proprietary game engines as well. And there's still quite a few of those there. And by expandability, what I meant was just being able to take WISE and put that as part of your development pipeline and get into the automated build uh, system of the game companies, for example, or get to their uh, automatic testing thing. Or more recently, we added things like WAPI, for example, that allows for another application to interact with WISE, create assets, query stuff from WISE, and, and do whatever they need with that or just third-party plugins or first-party plugins. Some game companies have their own DSP effects and so on, so making that easy for them to integrate. Runtime performance, that's definitely something we obsess over, like <laughs> making sure everything we add will run as fast as it can. And we added so much in the last 10 years. So of course, we're taking a bit more resources than we were taking 10 years ago, but we're doing much, much more uh, nowadays. And finally, the user experience, like using the user interface, uh, making that system, uh, the state of the system clear for the user, reducing the number of clicks, uh, augmenting visibility, all those little uh, tweaks that improve workflow and performance and, and, and your time. And Rimi is going to talk a bit more about it later as well. And finally, um, Super important, as Martin and Tucker uh, presented, the community aspect. And we're doing that because there are human beings <laughs> using uh, the software uh, and, and through technical support, that's, uh, th there's always a good opportunity to get feedback about what's going well, what can be improved, uh, and so on, and making sure that our documentation is clear enough, making sure that the certification program actually help you understanding not only WISE, but interactive audio in general. And that's the same mission for the blog and the videos we've been publishing the last two, three years, where every week we try to put shed some light on something about interactive audio through the usage of WISE, but it's not 
just for whys. It's, it's just learning the trade, learning how to do uh, this relatively new art form that is interactivity and by extension, interactive audio. Mm -hmm. So, so that, those are kind of the I, all the elements that we're playing with when we say, okay, let's invest time into this feature or this project because it will cover uh, the most elements that we can see in this in this grid. And I I just use a little case study to illustrate that. So. About five years ago, um, when VR started, so Oculus where was at maybe uh, DK2, DK3, uh, PlayStation VR uh, was in the making and would be released. And, and as soon as we started like using those VR devices, we realized, oh my God, we need to be much better <laughs> in terms of rendering like high quality audio and more convincing audio in VR, especially just getting that sense of presence and, and so on. So we kind of set as a goal to uh, explore uh, the ren like rendering dynamic early reflections. So we've done a prototype for that, see if it, if it really held the thing, and it did. <laughs> so we started investing there. And as a second goal for that is well managed, everything sound propagation related. So if there's an opening, like the portal you can see there, that sound will go through that portal and, and get some diffraction um, <clears throat> applied uh, to it and so on. And just to show you, like, since the beginning of WISE, everything we've done with regards to spatial audio, so in blue, highlighted in blue are the things that pertains to like geometry and form uh, uh, phenomena, I'd say. So those are things that we're building like slowly. And we started many years ago and now we're at the stage differently that it's usable, it's performant enough to, to put in your game and, and we're, we keep improving on that. Like, so there's still a lot of work. And by the way, if some of you are still on the side saying, hey, not sure, it's probably too expensive and so on. Just know that the very first game that's been released using dynamic reflection was Call of Duty Mobile. So it's a game on Android and iOS, and they are using first order reflection on all the weapon sound and the, the main character sounds for this, this experience. So if you can do that on a phone, pretty sure you can do that on console and PC as well. Um, so just to get back to, to our three axes and and put in like everything we've done to sus to sustain to support this initiative of having geometry and form audio. Uh, so we built two sample projects: one using Unreal uh, that we call the Wise Audio Lab, totally dedicated to spatial audio, but also the Wise Adventure game, which had other objectives like showing Wise on mobile platforms, showing the unit integration. But as we were doing the level design of Wise Adventure game three years ago, we already made it in a way that later on, when we would be ready to integrate spatial audio into Unity, that we would have a place where we can test spatial audio inside Unity. And that's something else later today <laughs> that uh, Nets will have some teasers on that, and we have uh, news on it as well. Um, and anything related to like uh, runtime performance, uh, profiler improvement to again surface what's happening under the hood when you're using spatial audio. We wrote a dozen of blog articles and, and we're still at Audio Kinetic, we're still saying we need to bring spatial audio to the masses. So making it more affordable, easier to understand, to use, to integrate in your game. So again, just the building blocks, but Everything we do, we try to make sure that we're hitting as many check boxes as we can uh, in there. So, uh, so yeah, that's about it for uh, for my part. Excellent, Simon. Uh, great to have that overview and and a look at all the different pieces that kind of comprise the Wise ecosystem, uh, and and our investment in not only the technology and the tools, but also in the community and education and and really that's the you've outlined the spectrum that we'll be covering throughout the day today as we go through these different sections um, to talk about these things it's uh it's great it's great it really is a clear picture of of what we're doing here so thanks so thank much for that thank cool thank you damien 
All right. So that was Simon and uh, just a gift to be able to bring all of these folks together uh, as part of this live streaming event. We're kicking into section two. Things are going to get very exciting here as we start to talk about uh, WISE 2019.2 and what's new. Um, it will be interesting to get some hands up in the uh, chat, folks that are already jumped into 2019.2. I wonder who's out there already playing in that sandbox uh, and what kind of uh, experiences you've been having. Uh, if you haven't jumped in yet, we are going to give you some previews uh, of what is in store for you when you do get into 2019.2. And uh, first off, I want to introduce Geneviève Picard. Uh, she's the production director here at Audio Kinetic, and she kind of helps uh, herd the cats. Uh, welcome, Geneviève. How are you doing? I'm good. Hi, Damien. Hey. Good to see you today. Hello. It's the start of a, a long show. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, so far so good, I think. Uh, great to see you. Uh, what's on the wall? Oh, that's um, a piece we couldn't fit in the living room, so we actually uh, managed to lodge it in the office. It's a, a big shark um, because. Because, and, uh, yeah. And a few, yeah, and a few figurines, but that's it. Excellent. Uh, well, good. It's good to see the home office and uh, glad to have you here as part of the live stream today. Uh, if you want to get your presentation up in the Teams, we'll uh, yep. get you off to that here. I know that you have some uh, uh, some just great uh, exposition around the 2019.2 release, uh, who who you are as a kind of a critical component of that process a little bit about what that process is. And, um, I'm ready to hand it off to you. Take it away, Jean Viev. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Damien. So, uh, as Damien said, I'm Geneviève Picard and I'm the senior director of production for audio kinetic. Um, I come from the gaming industry as, uh, many of our viewers, I'm guessing today. Uh, I started out at Artificial Mind and Movement. Uh, it's a Montreal game developer now known as a Behavior Interactive. Um, I was hired as a software engineer on their engine team where I contributed to the physics engine. I got to play around with Scooby-Doo's uh, quadruped motion uh, where I learned to, that some code truly is platform specific. Um, then, uh, I moved on to EA, uh, first as a software developer, then a technical lead, and finally as a development director. At EA, I got to work on UI, cinematics, audio, even some projects that, uh, that use WISE. Um, I especially liked working on titles such as uh, Boogie and its sequel uh, and SSX on tour. I really had fun with the team, and some say one of the Boogie superstars judged the one with the big sunglasses uh, was influenced by me, apparently. <laughs> um, and I don't know what to say because she's the evil judge. <laughs> but um, Not fair, not but fair. That's okay. I, I can take it. Um, so, yeah, after helping out the Visceral Games on Dead Space 2 and 3 and Army of 2 twice, I moved on to mobile titles where I got to contribute to Scrabble, one of my favorite games, uh, and helped launch World Series of Poker. Um, I then flew over to CAE uh, to learn about the world of simulation and work on their visual IG. That's basically a game engine highly focused on streaming and procedural rendering. Uh, before landing here at Audio Kinetic. This was right at the time where the company was starting to grow. And uh, like many others, I thought WISE was made by a large Silicon Valley company. Instead, I discovered a tight-knit community with a great team at its core right at my doorstep in Montreal. So at the time, we were barely over 30 employees, and now we're just over 60. So my role at Audio Kinetic was to help grow the team and help them achieve more through focus mandates. 
I'm going to have a quick sketch here uh, to give you an idea of how we're structured. Um, we, of course, have finance and IT supporting us. Uh, and we have marketing and developer relations, also known as sales, uh, who work closely with the production teams. At the core of the production team is QA and tools and automation, who interact with all the teams. We've got the web and launcher team in charge of our CRM and installer. We've got the cross-platform UI team uh, working on the long-term replacement of the UI in WISE authoring. WISE R&D is making sure spatial audio and the next big thing will rock your world. And uh, WISE Experience is working closely, as Simon mentioned. Uh, I think uh, Remy is going to be speaking uh, to you and Bernard as well. Uh, they're working on uh, improving our workflows. The game integrations team uh, support our Unity on Unreal integrations of WISE. And WISE Core ensures the WISE Sound Engine runs optimally on all platforms. That's like. I've lost count, but over 15 platforms that we currently support. Uh, and customer support is uh, in close communication with core and integrations and help onboard new customers from developer relations. So how do we do all this? I mean, supporting all these platforms requires a strong plan. Uh, Help, I, I basically help the team uh, build a release plan. You can see a sample of what we had for last year. And uh, we had set out to release two partner plugins, certification updates, 15 patch releases, three sample updates, four launcher updates, and a major release of WISE. So of course, uh, I'm also there to keep track if we achieve our, our goals. And uh, as we go, uh, we've got our actuals and updated forecast. And uh, you know, sometimes the plan and the reality differ. Uh, plans are made to be changed. Um, but this is where I help people see through the matrix, as Simon would say. Um, and we have to layer, so not only do we have all these updates and patch releases and, uh, and mini updates, uh, we also have the next big thing, so 19.02. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm here to talk to you about how 19.02 came about. We made a plan here, we started developing, Testing and merging and stabilize, that was the ideal plan. We really wanted to be out in December, hence 19.2. Um, and to make that plan, sorry, just going to backtrack a little bit, uh, we collected input from Damien, Simon, Mike, Max, Martin, um, and we lined it up with our consulting mandate deadlines. We validated our own goals and assumptions, like Simon talked a little bit uh, about earlier. And then we set to get this release out. Keep in mind, with many releases in between, and cust customer support level throughout the year. So as you can see, uh, we slipped a few milestones, uh, but always keeping in mind that it's a fine balance between timing and getting things right. And voila, here we are a few months later with 19.2 out uh, and collecting bug and crash reports from the community, helping make wise better every day. Excellent. Back to you, Damien. Excellent. Thanks so much. I think I think you you hit it there right at the end. You know, it's it it is a balance. It's a balance between um, aligning with the plan, but at the same time making sure that uh, we have the quality in place so that when a feature is released, that it feels fully uh, realized. Um, it has the the fingerprints of of the team on it um, and and has had that thorough um, approach to presentation uh, as part of it and that's what this section is all about we're going to talk through all those features of 19.2 Jean-Viev thanks so much Captain Picard it's great to have thank you thank you for having me on absolutely thank you bye-bye thanks so much it was Jean-Viev Picard, Production Director here at Audio Kinetic. And uh, next up, uh, I'm actually going to be talking. Wow, I don't have a slide. I didn't make a slide for myself. Uh, that's so weird. Uh, let's fix that. 
So I am Damien Kaspar. Nice to see you. And great to be here. Software product manager. Is this what a live stream is? Because I think we're doing it. Like, it's totally live, right? I just made, just workshop that slide. I'm going to rock this presentation. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the profiler filter. And so without further ado, let me kick off a video for y'all talking about the pro profile filter toolbar. The WISE profiler captures a plethora of data about all aspects of the audio engine during the runtime simulation. That information is serviced through a series of profiling views providing targeted answers about voice behaviors and runtime performance. First, we'll cover filtering in the profiler filter, including the filter toolbar and filter expressions. Then we'll switch over to the game object profiler to look at filtering in the game object 3D view and game sync's monitor. When you're staring down a wall of profiler data, the ability to read between the lines and identify your focus is critical. The filtering toolbar gives you the ability to pinpoint specific objects in the sea of information in order to get a greater understanding. Let's take a look at this profiler session captured with the WISE Audio Lab. In this example, we'll use the profiler filter layout to focus on objects in the capture data that need to be assessed. Filter toolbars are linked globally across profiler views by default and can filter by text, object, or by using Mutant Solo. We'll begin by typing the letters FO in the text filter, which will leave only the fountain, football, and footstep objects visible. Clicking the Link Unlink button unlinks it from other views, making the filtered results local to a specific view and allows for further filtering. While the other views maintain the FO filter, we can now continue to refine our results in the voice monitor by completing the word foot, leaving only the football and footstep objects visible. Filters can be reset globally or locally and can also be synced or cleared across filters. Using a space in the text field connects strings of text using the AND operator making multiple text strings act as an additive filter. Building on the foot text in the filter, we'll add the space character and the word walk, leaving only the footstep objects that also include the word walk visible. Filter expressions provide the ability to include, exclude, and use wildcards in conjunction with text. Adding an exclamation point in front of the walk text will exclude objects that also include walk from the filtered results, leaving only the football objects visible. Engaging the mutant solo filter in any view may see what you hear workflow to profiling that filters all views according to mutes and solos throughout the project. By soloing the football field ambisonics object, we can hear and see only the football field loop and its captured data. The Voice Inspector view details the full voice pipeline of a voice from its source to the final output bus. While the Voice Inspector graph exposes the ability to view both the wet and dry path of a voice, the contribution list is where detailed information about the values and drivers that affect a voice are represented, either locally or at runtime. Additional visibility options can be accessed via the eye icon in order to view different properties. For instance, toggling the visibility for effects shows the use of the Convolution Reverb plugin on the outside aux bus. Once an opportunity for adjustment has been identified, navigating to the property can be accomplished by finding it in the Project Explorer using the contextual menu. In this next example, we'll use the Game Object Profiler layout. Leveraging filter expressions in the text filter using the asterisk symbol as a wildcard and filter for all text strings that include the word projectile at any point within a word. Objects in the Game Object 3D Viewer can be pinned in order to track object registration across the duration of a capture session. Scrolling through the timeline in the Game Syncs monitor allows you to navigate the capture session in time and pinpoint when an object is active. 
inactive objects are filtered from the list automatically, and when they're pinned, appear as gray text. The Game Object 3D Viewer also provides filtering based on Game Object Name or ID, and allows for these filters to persist across profiling sessions. Controlling the visibility of these filters using the visibility icon means that a list of usual filters can be kept available as your project progresses. The GameSync Monitor view shows the values of GameSyncs for active voices over time. RTPC values are presented for active game objects, and the value can be observed in the list view as well as by hovering over the voice in the graph. Filtering with profiling views brings a new way to focus and understand profiler data. It helps aid in mixing, debugging, and optimizing your project. Check out more at Audio Kinetic. Right. Mute. Ah, this is why we do these things, because it's like real life. Awesome. So welcome back from that. That was the profiler filter overview. Uh, as you can see, a lot of cool functionality built into uh, this new way to work with profiler data. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of the evolution of the WISE profiler. So uh, strap in for me and come with me on this road. Uh, WISE was released initially uh, with this complete set of profiler tools that allowed you to come to the game and see what was going on. A um, bunch of great data coming in that helped you visualize what was happening in the game and in the authoring application. Um, and from there, you know, we have a history at Audio Kinetic of working with several development partners to continue to expand on the functionality and features in WISE. Uh, and part of that uh, has evolved over time uh, as part of these profiling tools. Um, one of the first things that extended that original suite of profiling functionality was HDR and the inclusion of the voice monitor. Uh, this was a new view for profiling that uh, gave you a visibility into the, um, the way that HDR works and became a really invaluable piece to understanding what HDR was doing with uh, your sound and your voices as it dynamically adjusted according to the rule set that you applied. Uh, we um, developed that in tandem with the folks at Sucker Punch, uh, and they helped us you know, bring that out in a way that was a benefit for the entire community and in a way that was accessible for people as a kind of new concept at the time um, as one of these ways of working with um, sound in interactive audio. Uh, from there, we worked with uh, some folks at Ubisoft to bring forward uh, the Voice Inspector. Uh, the Voice Inspector gave us this ability to see um, both the runtime side of things as well as the uh, project hierarchy. So you can see for the first time now in the profiler the uh, journey of a single sound voice through the pipeline to its uh, output and all of the influences on it. Uh, again, another way to extend on that. Uh, additionally, this new feature in 2019.2 of the filter toolbar and uh, brings this ability to, you know, see through the noise of your project data and focus in on the things that are really important to what you're trying to understand about your sound in the game. Uh, and again, the ability to link all these views or unlink them uh, on the way really brings that kind of focus to your workflow when you're trying to identify either a problem or 
put your finger or ear on something in the mix that uh, that you want to understand better. Uh, so in that way, then all of these views adopted this mentality of uh, of filtering. We brought this to the Game Syncs monitor, the 3D object viewer, the voice monitor, uh, and the voice inspector. Uh, again, in this push mentality where all of the data is presented to you, um, you don't have to watch objects. Uh, you don't have to watch Game Syncs. Uh, we present you all that data and we give you the tools to be able to filter to what it is that you want to know more about. Uh, and that kind of brings us to this uh, profiling environment that starts to feel like a powerful tool um, for understanding what's happening in your authoring application as you're working, uh, as well as when you're running on a device and, uh, and yeah, understanding what's happening at runtime. The way that we build that for the future is through uh, community partners and wise ambassadors. So these are groups of folks that um, we want to leverage in order to make sure that we're doing the right thing with these features moving forward. And so whether it's profiler, uh, authoring application UI and UX, uh, parts of the WAPI, um, and, and other pieces of spatial audio, et cetera, we want to make sure that we're partnering with folks to bring these features out in, uh, in a way that makes them accessible, that gives you a comprehensive control over uh, your interactive audio authoring. And, uh, and we have some great things underway for the future as we speak, where we're working with um, folks in the WISE community to make sure that we're hitting the mark with these features. Uh, and that's been a great journey for us. Uh, so that's my piece on the profiler filter. Guess what's next? I'm excited to welcome uh, Tali Keklikian to the live stream here. Uh, Tali, how are you doing? Hi, Damien. Okay. Yeah. Hey, we're live. <laughs> I know, it's great. Hey, we, hey. we started this whole live streaming thing back in August of last year. You helped me pioneer uh, the yes. Wise Up on Air series. It's so great to see you again. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, cool. I hear you got some spatial audio to talk about today. Yes. So awesome. yeah, like you said, uh, should I start? Are you ready? <laughs> Tell me more about your role at Audio Kinetic. Yeah. So I'm in the spatial audio team. I work with everything spatial audio, and most of the time, I integrate uh, spatial audio in the two integrations we have, Unreal and Unity. Um, yeah, that's about it. Excellent. Yeah, I see you as part of that spatial audio team, really helping to push new features forward. And uh, let's hear more about what uh, came out in 2019.2 from your team. Yes. All right. That's what I'm going to show you today. Take yeah. it away. Um, okay. So, um, so first, if you don't know what spatial audio is, maybe there are some of you that out there. Uh, it's uh, re-simulating, simulating a real world phenomena. So um, in WISE, our spatial audio uses two models to do that. There is like the geometry, uh, spatial audio geometry model for like reflections, diffractions, transmission of sounds. And there's a rooms and portals, which is like sound propagation uh, through rooms and portals. Uh, today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what's new in 19.2. So I'm going to concentrate on the spatial audio geometry because that's where we have the most uh, new features. Um, <laughs> the watermelon helmet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, what I'm going to use today is Unreal. Uh, I have this map, which is uh, downloadable 
from the launcher. Uh, if you go in the Unreal Engine, you can download like our demo game. And when you uh, open the Unreal game of that, you get like a map with like everything uh, wise and then a map for spatial audio. And what I did is I copied the map spatial audio tutorial map and I created this map with, and I removed everything spatial audio. We're gonna add them all together uh, right now. Um, so, Yes, spatial audio geometry. Um, so here I'm gonna, I have like a building, I have a barrier, like an obstacle, I have a floor. So maybe I would like to all of these be interacting with my sound. Maybe I want like the sound to reflect on the surfaces or like diffract on them. So I would need to send those geometries to uh, spatial audio. Uh, before, we, what we needed to do is add a, a spatial audio volume to our scene and uh, we would like uh, choose which acoustic texture each surface has had. And what's new in 1902 is we have this occlusion value for anything going through the surfaces, so like uh, trans, uh, transmission of the sound. Um, and then we had like the annoying part where you needed to try to put this and have like the right size and everything. So we decided to change this and we're not going to use this and we're going to use our new component, which is called AK geometry. You click on your mesh, you add a new component and then uh, it's called AK geometry. So um, I'm going to go through the different parameters of this new but uh, uh, component but let's just see what happens when i play and i connect to my game so uh let's open wise i'm just gonna connect mm, i should have connected before and what's cool okay what's cool is that uh we have like a game object profiler view where there's a game object 3d viewer where we can see uh everything spatial view on here. So we see right now our obstacle is sent to spatial audio and we can see it in this view. Uh, so let's add everything else. Uh, uh, uh. What? <laughs> I said that's so cool. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm adding one on the floor. I'm adding one on this uh, building here. So let's play and see. Okay, so everything's there. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so all of these um, geometries will interact with yourself. So you may notice right now there's, there's a lot of triangles sent for like the floor and this obstacle here. And they're not really necessary because you could just have like a big triangle like this. And it's best to let, not send like a lot of triangles to uh, spatial audio so that there are just like less computations. If it's the same for uh, the sound, you should send the less, um, less number of triangles. So how can you do that? I'm gonna stop here and we're gonna check out the parameters. So if I click on my uh, OK geometry component, I have uh, different parameters. First is the mesh type. So I can use the static mesh directly and send it to spatial audio. That's what we were doing right now. So the static mesh of this object has all these triangles in. Uh, what we can do to reduce the number of triangles is maybe use another level of detail. Maybe you have like a lower level de of detail uh, that has less triangles and is also uh, like goes well with the sound, how you want to sound to interact with your, your um, your object, like if you have like, I don't know, little columns and everything, maybe you don't want all these columns on your building to be uh, interacting on, on your side, maybe it's just one, one surface is better. So you can have a different level of detail here, or you can choose to use a simple collision mesh uh, in Unreal. So if I use a simple collision mesh here on this one, and maybe the floor, because we said that there was a lot of them too, uh, we'll see uh, that these uh, are best for, there's just like a minimal number of triangles here. So that's that's better. So uh, now if I start my sound, well, nothing's really gonna happen. So you, the future uh, grandfather. Like everything, only the only thing happening is like, it's 3D spatialized. Right now. That's right. Go to your there is like some attenuation going on. Um, so 
what we want to do, let's start with the fraction. So what we want to do is go to our sound. So it's already uh, a spatial sound. So I got this positioning to flip, positioning plus orientation. I have an attenuation on it. But now I want to be able to diffract on the different geometries that I set to spatial. So I just need to click this, start the game. So you, the future grandfather, listening. So we can only hear that it's a little bit more. Uh, we can't hear it less than before. So let's see what's happening in our wise game object 3D viewer. So. What's cool here is that you can see everything in spatial audio. What's happening with spatial audio? So right now we're gonna we're getting some diffraction of the sound. So instead of like hearing that, well, we're hearing the sound through the structure, but we're also hearing the sound going around this obstacle here. So we see this with all those um, purple lines. So that's like the path the sound takes. Um, and also what we do is we create virtual positions at all of these places. So for example, uh, if I, oops, if I check here on the left here, I get one virtual source on this side because I'm hearing the sound coming from this side of this obstacle. I have another one on the right side and I have one on the top here. Um, and if you want to see like exactly what's happening with the filtering and everything, we use the voice inspector view. So if I go to the voice inspector, I choose the sound that is playing right now. I can see here the different uh, paths that my sound is taking. Uh, I have like three of these that are uh, paths um, diffracted, so they all use obstruction. Um, they're they're getting also a distance acceleration. So each of these virtual sources get distance acceleration depending on their distance with the listener, and we get some obstruction uh, depending on like the angle of bending the path takes. So all of the angles are like um, associated like with a percentage of obstruction, and then all of these are added to get like a, a the percentage of obstruction that we see now, which is like 48.8% for this one and this one and this one. And then we have like a fourth uh, path. And this path is like the direct path between the emitter and the listener that goes through uh, the spatial audio geometry. And this one has occlusion on it. So that's how we model our transmission of the sound through uh, surfaces. We use occlusion and in here we see 100. So why do we see 100? That's because we that's like the default value. When we added our AK geometry, uh, the default value for the occlusion value here is 1. So 1, uh, 0, 1 in the Unreal side, 0 to 100 in the uh, Y side. So if you want to change it, I can just click here to say that I'm going to overwrite this value. And uh, maybe we could put like 0.5 and try it out. So you. The future grandfather listening. So I think we can uh, see that we hear it more. Uh, let's go back here in our voice inspector. Now we see that we have 50% uh, uh, occlusion going on here. But now, uh, maybe we, we have a lot of things in our map, a lot of uh, geometry. I don't want to click on this and click on this and then overwrite this one and click on this one and then override this one, like it takes a long time. So what we did, we decided to uh, associate all these um, parameters, like the acoustic texture and the occlusion value with uh, the physical material uh, that you use in Unreal. So if you're already using physical materials, you can um, just associate them with a different uh, acoustic texture and occlusion value. So for example, if here um, I click I'm using the collision mesh, so I'm going to go and check out what's... No, sorry, I need to click on the static mesh. Check out my collision settings and see what the physical material is. So right now it's none, so it's the default physical material. But maybe you had something there that is different. So what we can do is go in your um, project settings. I already have it open here. You go to uh, integration settings, and then you have a map 
with all the different physical materials you have. It's already populated with all the different physical materials that you're using. Uh, like, for example, these ones that come automatically with these. So anyway, and, we are using... And Dolly, those can be yes. per mesh, right? Instead of per material, is that true? Uh, the physical material is different. So for the uh, collision, occlusion there's properties, just one... Occlusion properties per mesh? Occlusion properties per physical material. So for collision, if, you're, if your mesh is sent to spatial edge with a collision uh, mesh, it's going to be just one physical material. If you're using a static mesh, you can have different materials on your static mesh, and all these materials have a different physical material. I can show you after, but now we're using the collision. Um, so yes, so I will have a default physical material here and I'm gonna say that this has an occlusion value of like, no, I already used 0 0.5, 0 0.8. So it's gonna be 80%, for example. Um, and so let's try it out just here and we'll see. So you, the future grandfather. So if I go here, today, I should uh, still have 50% here because I am overriding this thing and we put 0 0.5 on this specific uh, geometry. So, yes, 50. But if I go behind um, the building, for example, which also has a. that this article I thought was smart to point out that. Back also has day, a uh, junk food, default physical material. Like now I'm getting an occlusion of 80. So everything else is getting 80 except for the obstacle that I've overrided for uh, 50%. Um, so yeah, let's see uh, how this building here works because this one, I have chosen the static mesh as my, as my mesh type. So this one, I can have uh, overrides for the architecture and the occlusion value for each of the materials. Um, but I have only one material on this mesh. Uh, if I go on the mesh here, I get, um, no, here, <laughs> there's different materials. Well, you can see them on this one too. But anyway, we have different materials and all of these have a different physical material. So if you have more than one, you can apply a different acoustic texture for all of these different materials by overriding directly in AK geometry or by associating them with the different physical material. Here, my physical material is none, so it's also using default, and that's why I got the 80% occlusion. Now, let's, uh, let's do something with acoustic texture because we didn't do anything yet. So maybe I want everything to be brick, if I do that, if we understood what I said until now, everything's going to be brick. So let's see if I start my game and go back to wise. So everything's brick now because I see that the color has changed. Before it was blue because it was like non acoustic texture. And now it's gray because all my acoustic textures are gray. I'm going to go in uh, my share sets and change my acoustic texture color to see maybe a uh, brick is going to be red. And in the future, I'm gonna override one. So maybe we could try a tile and try, I don't know, green. Okay, so if I go back here, everything's red because everything's brick. And uh, if I go back to my Unreal game, maybe this one now, change into this and override the acoustic texture for uh, my tile because I've changed the color of this one play and now we see that this one's green the rest is red uh, but acoustic texture only works for um reflections so like when the sound touches the surface reflects and comes back to the listener we don't have any reflections going on right now in our game like you saw maybe you saw you didn't see anything right now so we have to add the reflect plugin so the reflect plugin is added on an oxbus uh, if you already uh, know that, you have to go here, add a new Oxbus here, and uh, add the reflect, and then change the parameters because there are specific parameters for that. So what we did for 19.2 is we created a way to have, uh, like, create new ch children to in your um, hierarchy. Uh, with presets. So like I could click here and have like an empty auxiliary bus with everything default, or I could click 
in here and have it specifically with a preset. So it could be your presets that you've already created, or it could be ours, like these two. Uh, we added two. Uh, we added one for room auxiliary bus, and we added one for early reflection. Oh, by the way, this early reflection auxiliary bus and all the acoustic textures that I showed you before, uh, you can have them by going into your project, importing factory assets, and choosing the reflect one. So anyway, preset, early reflection. So I get everything is set for me, and all uh, my voice reflect is here. I can change things. Looks good. So what I do is I choose the sound that is playing, and I want to be uh, reflecting on my spatial geometry. I go to general settings, and I this just tell which early reflections uh, Oxbus I need to, to use. So I'm going to use the new one I just created. Uh, let's connect again. Go back to uh, Unreal. So you, the future grandfather listening today, uh -huh. uh, you're screwing up your grandkids' health mm -hmm. right now. That's right. Go listen to our epigenetics episode. Yeah, junk food is uh, ubiquitous now, and it wasn't in my grandparents' day. No, so you know, cool. no, they had lame, lame diets. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, of, of whole foods. And so, natural so that's. Well, that's I'm just gonna mute the the sound. Was smart to point out that back in the day, before junk food, it didn't mean everybody was just eating like hippies or something like no. that. Like, okay. Whew. So. So yeah, everything's there, my reflex set up. Uh, now you may wonder like, what are all these lines? I'm gonna explain it to you. Um, okay, so you can see here, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, okay. You can see here, uh, my sound is taking this path, oops, sorry. They're taking this path here, bouncing off the surface, going back to the listener. So this is a first order reflection, bounces off one surface. And then you can have more orders. I have put four, which is the maximum you can have for my presentation here, but you can choose. Um, what happened is before 1902, it was difficult to have fourth order. We didn't really like tell people to do it because it wasn't really working well. It was super, super slow. But now we decided to change a little bit uh, our engine, how the reflections get uh, computed and created. And you can use fourth order if you want to. Um, so yeah, so second order reflection, for example, the more you, the first order is yellow and the more you go to fourth order, it's going to be red. So this one, for example, is, uh, having two, uh, reflections before coming to the listener and other ones like maybe having until four. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. What else? Like, um, wow, Tali. I'm, I'm just the whole time. I think I'm echoing what is happening in the chat room here with my jaw just on the floor, like so excited, like the all of the uh, profiling in real time, being able to visualize um, the obstruction occlusion that you're talking about in the voice inspector, uh, the color coding. Oh, it was so good. Yes. Like, yes, uh, that's good. And again, this to me, this is that full circle um, implementation, right? It's it's one thing to have these tools at runtime under the hood as part of your game, uh, but as you just showed, like being able to profile it, to visualize it, to be able to see what is happening, uh, that was just fantastic. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, so how I, what, uh, I said that I was just going to show the AK geometry, but I just wanted to say that in the future, I might do other hands-on sessions on this Twitch channel uh, with Damien uh, for other aspects of spatial audio, maybe on like the, to, more like the theory behind it or uh, like the rooms and portals that I didn't talk about. Um, and also this is only uh, unreal, but we're also going to get unity, uh, hands-on sessions in the future. We're going to, you're going to hear That's about right. it. Stay in this tuned. Live stream. Um, and, yeah, and look for, yeah. and look for those, uh, wise up hands-on in the future with Thali as we dig deeper into spatial audio. Uh, this was just scratch the surface. Uh, deep into it, 
We want to go hands-on. We want to take our time so that we can bring folks along uh, as we're authoring spatial audio and covering the different aspects of it. So look for that in the future. Tali, thanks so much for yes. your presentation today. Thank you. Uh, so here we are. Uh, we're at the midpoint here for our 2019.2 section. And with this, we're actually going to take a quick five minute break uh, to take care of any business, do some stretching, jump up around and stuff like that. Uh, and so in the meantime, uh, we're going to treat you to a slideshow of, um, of, GDC Expo show floor. So if you see yourself in the slideshow, uh, let us hear about it in the chat room. Uh, we'll be back in five. Take care and see you in a few.
Okay. Welcome back. We got like smooth sailing for this 2019.2 second session. Uh, that first uh, piece uh, was great. Uh, Tali really brought the technology to the front, and I was happy to be able to do a brief history on the profiler uh, and the new profiler filtering that we have going. Uh, again, with Jean-Viev, Simon, and Martin uh, up front, helping set the tone and set the stage for us here at the live stream today. I hope you're uh, tuned in, having fun. I see a lot of great conversations in the chat. Um, and again, thanks to Tiffany for kicking it all off with me uh, first thing. So, um, hey, as we launch into this second part, get comfy. Uh, we're going to start out with a little uh, wise developer interview, and then we're going to dig deeper into some of those features of 2019.2. And with that, I want to welcome uh, the folks from Massive Entertainment. Uh, welcome to the live stream. Uh, this is Badoo Badoo. Hey, fellas. Good to see you. Hello. Hey. Hi. Good to see you. How's everything going today? Good, good. Excellent. Yeah, as, as well as to be expected when you're working from home. I mean, uh, it looks it looks like you got it pretty comfy, right? Uh, kids walking around, synthesizers on and bleep blooping over there, right? Yep. Damien, yeah. I feel blessed. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, privileged and uh, <laughs> and able, right? Uh, what are all those post-its yeah, it, on the window, though? Oh, uh, that's my son doing uh, some kind of art installation. He calls it "This is 80. And if you look carefully, it looks like the letter number eighty, but like in a negative space. It's very avant-garde. It's uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, I like it. I, this is actually one of my favorite pieces of of our current live streaming environment, uh, or or just shall we say conference. Uh, video conference environments is seeing other people's spaces, seeing their lives unfold during this time. Uh, it's a gift. It's a gift to be able to, to share that. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. I feel the same way about your room. I'm like, oh, look at all this line drawing stuff in the background and the yeah. posters and stuff. Right? Uh, graphical scores. Um, so let me get a, a, a legit yeah. introduction. Like we've known each other a while, but uh, uh, Rob Banton, uh, audio programmer at Massive. Uh, tell me a little bit about your history. Uh, just give me the, the high points. Uh, so um, I was one of those people that got uh, an 8-bit computer to program when I was about eight and a half uh, in Britain. There's a whole generation of us that had that uh, BBC course, how, making most of your micro. And I also was a musician. And at some point, those two interests collided. Yeah. And, uh, and then I ended up, I was not knowing it yet. The job didn't exist yet. But I was being an audio programmer in the Amiga demo scene, not knowing that that's what it would be called or that I would ever be paid to do it. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I was kind of right there in the C64, like rocking the SID chip kind oh, yeah. of parallel Sit, or in yeah. advance to that. Uh, so it's a, that was a very alluring time of, uh, yeah. of audio for, for computers. Uh, cool to hear yeah. that. Volume fades and hexadecimal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we got it easy now, right? Well, pretty much. Maybe not. Well, thanks to audio programmers, maybe. Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, meanwhile, yeah, Simon, give us a little background, uh, on you again i'm seeing all kinds of gear back there i'm sure that we could go deep into that uh in the future but but tell me a little bit about where you've where you've been um yeah sure i mean all this gear behind me is uh it took some while to set up and it's kind of taunting me because i never had the, the the time to actually sit down with it so it's just there blinking and calling me but uh no i do find time from time to time but uh uh as for my history well i've been uh, in the industry for around uh, 13 years now um i started off in uh 
um, in KGB training in Russia. No, uh, I, I came to Sweden when I was young and I was uh, around 12. I uh, had an interest for computers um, and music, played in bands, made my own music. Um, eventually, I uh, ended up uh, having an internship at a, a sound recording studio here in Malmö. And uh, those guys knew the guys at Massive, and at, at that time they were working on a game called uh, World in Conflict, which was a PC RTS game. Uh, and I got brought in there kind of like a temporary intern kind of thing with no experience whatsoever, and my job was to uh, record temp voice. Uh, and it was um, fitting enough because I was uh, the two factions in that game was uh, Americans and, and uh, fighting Russians, obviously, is the Cold War. And... Um, so I had to basically shout, uh, yes, comrade, no comrade, uh, you know, in uh, <laughs> thousands of variations for, for uh, you know, I don't know how many weeks. Uh, so it was, it was interesting. Um, but yeah, I got, that's when I learned how, what it is to, what it means to set up a good batch process, for instance, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, slowly moving, uh, kind of growing with the company, really, I, I feel like uh, Massive is where I grew up and I learned the, the bits. Um, I feel uh, I've been lucky enough to 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 meet a lot of talented folks uh, through uh, through Ubisoft, obviously, and uh, being such a big company, uh, having traveled to the big studios like in Montreal or working on games like Assassin's Creed or Far Cry, obviously, that's where I pretty much learned how the the big machinery, the well-oiled machinery, works. So um, yeah, audio directors like uh, Aldo Sampaio, for instance, uh, or uh, my good friend Justin Drost over at Redstorm. Yeah, just you know, you, you get to know people um, Dude, in this industry. We got Justin it's in like the chat right now. Like Justin's in know, the chat, he's, tuned he's, in. It's great to see him. Yeah, 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 Justin. yeah. It Justin. is a small world. Yeah, awkward, but, Justin. This is awkward. <laughs> um. So yeah, but uh, I guess that's kind of like I've been growing with Massive and Division became eventually what I end ended up kind of, you know, do doing the first sounds for the first prototype and then kind of growing with the team and growing the team and hiring the people and, uh, and going all the way to the kind of the audio director role, I guess. Uh, and now with this second game, uh, obviously that's where we try to... Uh, to learn from everything that we did in the first one and improve on it, improve the tools, improve how the way it sounds. And obviously WISE has been a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked a little bit about uh, about Justin and, and there's that Red Storm kind of partnership, right? Where they're, yeah. they're helping yeah. out with pieces of it. And so you've got kind of this distributed network of audio folks who are helping to to con to, to make the division what it is, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely uh, uh, an effort. Uh, I mean, we're basically like a family, but in, divided into a couple of different studios across the world. So we had uh, obviously Redstorm helping out, and we had uh, Ubisoft uh, Reflections uh, in the UK. Sure. Uh, we had the Ubisoft Annecy in France, and we had uh, people in, in, in Bucharest and uh, the testing teams there. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been, it, we even had some people from San Francisco for a while. So I, I think pretty much at some point, if you worked at Ubisoft, you probably have touched the division somehow, you know, in some way, sure. in some remote way. Uh, Shanghai, obviously, as well. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of. Um, there's a really a good uh, a good guy as well from Quebec, uh, Mike Villion, who's also been helping a lot on the project. So yep. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably forgetting something, but uh, yeah. it's been a very uh, very much a team effort from a, a lot of different studios in Ubisoft. Yeah, and then for you, Rob, you're kind of in the hive of engineers uh, yep. as an audio advocate and specialist yeah it's um you're in a kind of a what's a, an unpretentious way of describing it uh there's a lot of stones in the bridge and the one in the middle the keystone has to be there to hold the rest of it up yeah um other stones are maybe bigger or they may be more elaborate but you have to be somewhere in the middle and that's i ended up very quickly being in that uh, position dealing obviously with time zones um, remote working has got its own challenges in terms of communicating and in some ways having to over communicate to one, so people understand that you're a yeah. person and not just an email exactly um, and it, it, it had some very uh, again this is always like a, a I always feel growth at the end of this after you get through it all Simon you feel this way like there's a moment where you're not sure if it's all going to be worth it, but when it finally comes out, it does, and then you can reflect back on it months later. You realize, like, wow, that was amazing. But yeah, it's, it's both. It, it, that's that's true. But it's also like 
it's different also with the, with the game with the live game because you never really get out of it. You know, it's like it's a little bit oh, it's a little bit easier now. Oh, now we're back, and you know, it kind of goes like that with the update after update after update. But uh, yeah, obviously, of course, when the when the the main game actually ships, it it, it is a, a big moment, of course. Yeah, well, and the technology again. I think that that is one of the things that uh, that you spoke about recently in a presentation uh, that's online that will point folks to. But I wanted to unpack some of that because you really did push uh, the boundaries with technology uh, from an audio perspective across a three a, a many different areas. But there were three that I was thinking of specifically uh, thinking uh, about that presentation again like uh, bubble mm. space like let's talk about that uh, let's talk about mm. the environmental um, the way that you frame that uh, and, and yeah. all the systems there I think uh, one of the big I mean obviously as um, uh, most projects do after shipping a game uh, if there is some time for postmortems uh, that's kind of where some initial thoughts and ideas about this started is like hey what what went uh, good and what went bad with the first game and what, what was but what was very intense and what was how can we improve it and how can we make it sound better and obviously uh, we're building such huge worlds so that uh, our one of the biggest points uh, from the postmortem was like okay how can we how can we do better uh, to both um, make our world sound better, but also utilize all this data that's there uh, instead of manually drawing boxes and stuff? Mm -hmm. And that's how uh, it kind of that that original thought f kind of fueled both uh, things. Uh, I mean, I feel like the biggest achievement technically probably is the. Uh, the procedural reverb uh, and the uh, procedural paths that we did. Um, so from a very high level, it's a system that basically uh, raycasts uh, in an offline offline process during the night. It raycasts uh, the, all the interior spaces uh, in the level, and it generates an impulse response based on the the room size, uh, the room material, uh, and um, and basically that uh, impulse response in, is then streamed in at runtime using a custom uh, convolution plugin for Wise. Um, now, when if we I, did if that, if I understand uh, it correctly, yeah. this is the bubble space concept, right? No, not really. Not we're we're going to get to bubble okay, space. Great, yeah, great. I kind of, I kind of, I kind of derailed a little bit. I'll, I'll get back to bubble space. You talk through to that. Uh, great, great. Yep, yep, yep. So basically, um, when we have uh, when we have the the impulse ready. Uh, uh, we realized, I mean, with all this work putting in to actually generate a correct impulse for each interior space, we started talking about the pads and the fact that a lot of spaces in our game are abandoned. It's a, like a, you know, mid-apocalyptic kind of scenario. Yep. Uh, and it's like, it's not a, first of all, it's not super fun to like, uh, to make sounds of empty offices every day. I mean, because like, yeah, if you have, you know, oh, here's another empty hallway or here's another empty store. Why don't you do an air tone? And so we, we, we researched a little bit, a lot about like what air tones are and how they like, you know, the, the relation between the, an air tone and the, the reverb of the room and realized like we could probably use that impulse and that, that reverb to actually generate the air tone instead of asking a sound designer to create one. Uh, and obviously a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of, of um, uh, things that can happen along the way, but uh, without getting too into detail, we basically have a way of generating impulse responses and air tones for each interior space that are based on the space size and acoustics and uh, and material uh, materials of that room, and that saves us a lot. It, that, it's not it's, it's not always a great result. I think I mentioned that in my presentation. There's like the bigger spaces usually tend to sound better straight from the bat, whereas the small spaces or if something has been tagged wrong. Uh, because like if it, everything has been uh, tagged like a carpet, but it is a church, it's not going to sound like a church because it's it thinks it's smaller than what it is. Yep. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, th things at play, and a lot of things can go wrong. We're very de like by using the world data, we're ending up being super dependent on the world data, as, as in like the tech artists, the right. level designers, the the, uh, the people. So if they make a mistake, that, that that affects us as well. But the payoff is that we, we automatically get a world, interior world, for free, uh, and then we can go in and start overriding with, for, the, for the main spaces, for the hero spaces, where we actually want to use uh, sound as a tool for telling a story and so on. Right, and that's an offline process that happens. It kind of crawls the, the game data, uh, puts those impulse responses together based on game data and then kind of puts them somewhere where you can leverage them, audition them, and further tweak them. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it, it, I mean, we can't really tweak the impulse responses after they have been generated, but we can still tweak the pads that get generated out of that. Uh, so, yeah. And, and so once we have this, the next thing we're talking about, and this is uh, mm -hmm. basically um, a, a lot of this is uh, Rob's babies, basically, but uh, uh, the bubble space and slapback were the kind of the next step is like, okay, so we have a lot of this cool stuff uh, already generated, but what about everything else? Like, what about the exteriors and what about you know uh, how can we modulate the uh, how can we modulate the the sound of our game uh, using uh, runtime systems uh, so bubble space uh, Rob you want to talk about that just uh, yeah. from a high level this one thing I want to add about uh, about the uh, the impulse response generation is that um, because the technical artists later on optimize those spaces to make them uh, render faster we have to break we have to break it in two and we have an audio version and a lighting version and the audio version has the original physics data in otherwise the impulse responses would come out incorrect yeah. so if you have an l-shaped room with a concrete floor and carpet on that might disappear and it would affect the reverb um, bubble space is uh, one of those examples of something that we didn't have a, a fully formed idea, but we were edging up towards it, trying to work out, like, wouldn't it be really good if we knew how constrained the air was around the player in terms of what we call like the near field? And um, I knew of other systems that did this, but they are super expensive because they use 60, 70 ray casts in order to get an accurate representation, like a sonar around the player position. Exactly. So we couldn't do that because of you know everything else that's happening so recaps, i got it yeah. down to, i got it down to sort of 12 but in actual fact it's three but subdivided four again and then because of using some clever operators on the cpu they appear to be the same calculation but they're actually four unique ones quick math and yeah so uh, single input multiple data is what it's called nice. uh, all modern processors have it but it was a little bit of a mind-bending operation to kind of make it all work. But when it did, it suddenly just clicked. I was like, ah. And then if you look at the presentation, you can see that it, it worked so well that it almost hardly needed any tweaking after that. We had to essentially adjust what it was, what the Raycast were bouncing off of, which which was a, a, a separate thing across all our Raycast systems anyway. And um, there were some other tweaks, which I gave, basically I gave Simon a bunch of parameters to play with so he could understand what what uh, the sync would basically be sent to Y, so you'd know, okay, it's going to go to this big or this big, so you can then quantify the spaces in a more kind of um, reasonable way, like with the weapon's tail, so you have like those three yeah. sizes. Yeah. I mean, what we're using the value for is essentially, like, like I said in the presentation, is that we get, a, uh, we get a value for if something is above you, but we also get the value that we use the most, which is what, what's the general width around you, and that controls the reverbs, the, 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 the tails of the weapons, uh, it controls the amount of RFX that's played from the buildings, like we maybe you don't want to play a creek from a building if you're in open field and, and stuff like that, right? So, so it controls a lot and it gives this nice kind of natural modulation to the to the soundscape. I think and so that slapback was pretty much the same thing where we wanted to add an extra layer to the to the guns uh, gun sounds and not just rely on randomization of pre baked tails and reflections, but also add an element of um, element of uh, I don't know of kind of, kind of a feeling of a better sense of where you are at exactly. So if you see two big skyscrapers like this or two big buildings and you shoot and you hear pop 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 and then you kind of turn around you can still hear the echo in that direction and not kind of following the player orientation and stuff so it's basically placing emitters on building walls um you remember what we said about that at the start was that um, you asked me because I, I hadn't worked in division one and you said what did i think and i said I, I love the creative choices but i didn't think there was enough distinction in gunfights between the outdoor areas and indoors inside the hotel and mm spaces mm -hmm. slapback rarely does that because when you're outside suddenly you get the the room acoustics of the, yeah. the urban environment which you don't get inside and yeah. that really places the player somewhere where you're like okay this is now different it changes the emotional experience uh, much like in that movie heat where they're chasing the first bank robbery and they're going up between the, the cars and you can hear the the echoes around you that's a totally yeah. different one to the end gun fight where it's just pacino and and de niro at the airport and that's a suddenly a very closed intimate experience yeah yeah and, and the presentation I, I really it really encapsulates these ideas that you have and again the presentation of of these techniques that you walk through in long form during that presentation uh 
it's going to be a great deep dive for people to dig into after this live stream. Uh, it's online, and uh, and it really uh, it was illustrative of the creative choices that you were making in order to present the sound yeah. uh, in a detailed way, but also really clever tricks, I felt, with how you optimized and chose to optimize based on what was important. Uh, and and at yeah, the, we literally had no choice. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> we all die. Yeah. Well, yeah. it. Uh, but it's cool. Also, with uh, with the slapback thing, just to finish it off, it's like it. It is quite subtle, but like if you play in surround or if you have spatial audio, it's a bit more noticeable. Yeah, that's just yeah. a little addendum. Yeah, absolutely. And it gives you height. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, this yeah, was a Atmos game as well, you. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was uh, an Atmos game, and um, the, really, when I started, uh, uh, when I took the decision of making it, so it was not not just the perception of height, but also like I felt like uh, it gave it a better um, a perception for the the, the horizontal uh, levels as well. Sure. Uh, because uh, I just could feel the enemies better behind. I could perce perceive enemies better behind me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and there's so many opportunities for it, like the rain uh, sounds that we did and there, the helicopters, the drones, and uh, it just felt like a natural fit, really. Uh, but also ha helps with the giving more space to the mix and the clarity of the mix, I felt. And again, all of the systems that were created to make it seem more real felt even more real when you have spatial audio on. So Awesome. Emotion well, is the word you're looking for. Ta-da! And so we're going to be talking with Dolby Welcome. later on in the live stream. Yeah. Uh, they're going to be... Uh, discussing Dolby, we also have another developer who worked with Atmos, and and I think this is uh, it's great to get your experience on that and and get your feel for it. Uh, clearly, there's an opportunity there that you grabbed and ran with, um, and I think people who've been playing the division understand uh, what you were trying to communicate. So congratulations on uh, on getting that out there and and the continuing saga of uh you know live service uh it's yep yep <laughs> it's a tremendous accomplishment and uh yeah we're glad uh glad you're using wise and glad to have you here on yep. the live stream with us <laughs> oh wow oh, look at that Gee, don't. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay by the way my son lost the top to this on the beach last summer so if you can send me a new one that would be great yeah i'll think about that okay <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for participating in the live stream today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, thanks for being part of the Wise community. And uh, hey, we'll see you soon. We see will. See you later. Okay. Bye. Take care. That was Massive Entertainment. I'm uh, so glad to have them here on the live stream. And we're just going to take this on to the next level. Uh, Back to the overview, we're gonna be jumping into memory categories. We'll talk a little bit about the master mixer hierarchy, uh, the wise console, we got a video coming up, and media IDs. Uh, so some cool stuff going. And what, what I'm gonna do next is transition to um, Martin Dufour. He's the, uh, the next speaker on the list for us here, I've got him on standby and ready to transition to him. Hello, Martin. How you doing? Unmute your microphone and away we'll go. It's uh, all right. It catches the best this of us. This should be slightly better. At the worst of times. So yeah, I think we're doing all right. Okay. How are can you? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you great. You look yes, you look I'm good. Great. Um, I'm still trying to join the team so that I can show my slides for later. Excellent. Let's uh, do that. I'm gonna let you in and we'll get that all right. going. All you gotta do is do the do. And okay, so okay, and then I'll try, try and share this. 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 Mute the teams. Otherwise, we have problems. Or wait, did we mute the Google? Yes. yes. OK, do your thing. Like this, do you hear me now? Perfect. Still? Oh, it's like we did a little technical run through, and, uh, and away we go. We know exactly how to solve these problems.
So uh, before right. we get going, I did want to introduce you real briefly. I mean, I know you. I've known you for years. Uh, this is Martin DeFour. Uh, Martin De- is the CTO here at Audio Kinetic, uh, in charge of all things technical. Uh, yes, I have a rather wide range of responsibilities now, but uh, I'm still a programmer at heart, uh, so I'm completely focused on the technical side at Audio Kinetic. Uh, so doing a lot of the high level uh, thinking and planning, but also um, once in a while I try to tackle a specific project or, or, or prototype. Uh, and what I'm going to show uh, just now is, is a result uh, of that. Excellent. Well, let's roll right into it. Uh, take it away. All right. So you can see the slide here. Yep. Um, yeah. So the idea is that in 19.2, we did a uh, huge refactoring of the memory management system of the Sun Engine. Uh, so there, there were multiple reasons for that, but primarily it was to help solve a bottleneck that we had uh, for multi core rendering and also get rid of a long standing issue where it was pretty hard to manage the fixed size pool allocations that we had uh, with the default, lower engine default, having to specify a size for that 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 would be reserved at initialization time of the Sun Engine. Uh, So um, yeah, we've gotten rid of that. And what I'm showing on this slide is really the user facing uh, component of that. So on the left here is what you had previously. So pools, each with statistics of uh, currently used, uh, and there are also a maximum allocation. Uh, so the pre-reserved portion that I was mentioning. So this uh, is the advanced uh, profiler, uh, the memory tab. Um, so what we see in the new version here is that we've replace the term pool with category to reflect the fact that there are no more uh, fixed size pre-allocations being done, but all of the memory allocations from the Sun Engine are still organized uh, by categories for essentially reporting purposes. So there are no more <coughs> limits for each category, uh, although there's still the possibility to have an overall memory allocation limit for the Sun Engine itself. Uh, You will find that those categories, uh, there's more of them than there were pools as we tried to better segment uh, in a more meaningful way uh, what uh, our various allocation types. Uh, For example, you see here, we have a specific category for game object allocations, for events and structures hopefully giving you more information uh, about how exactly what's going on in the sound engine at the memory level. Another big change that you see between left and right is that the pools allocated per memory bank are gone. So this was kind of an indirect way to see what was going on with bank-related allocations. Um, For this, uh, there's a it's uh, the sound bank manager has its own tab in the advanced profiler. So this has more detailed information than what you had previously in the, in the memory tab. So uh, look for your sound bank information in that new section of the advanced profiler. So this uh, may look like a somewhat superficial change uh, from the profiler perspective, but really it's a complete rewrite of the the memory management system. So uh, we're looking forward to hear more about it, uh, feedback about it from the teams are jumping on 19.2. It's super cool. From a person who has lived in the abstraction of pools uh, to see now the clarity of categories and how how that is uh, presented uh feels like a great evolution it sounds like a lot of work it was it was it it was uh, the work of uh, multiple developers over the course of the release and uh yes caused uh, a a lot of uh we had to change a a lot of 
little details uh, along the way, but uh, yeah, we, we're glad it's out now. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to uh, go over that. There's one other thing I just wanted to mention while you were here, because then I'm going to transition to a cool video about command. Uh, con what am I talking about? Yeah, console overview. But first off, you know what we finally got in the master mixer? Work units, right? Work units. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was a, a big uh, proponent of that. I'm glad it's in. Yeah. Same. Same. That was, uh, that was a nice touch. It put a little ting on the uh, on the 19.2 release that just uh, sparkles a little bit. And uh, it's great to have that. Sometimes it's the little things. Like... It is and can be. Yeah. So thanks so much for taking time today. Uh, great to have you on the live stream. Great to see you. As always, uh, working more. Uh, and uh, take care. Thanks. All right. It was a pleasure. All Catch right. you later. Yep. See ya. Uh, that was Martin DeFour. He was talking us through memory categories. And now we're going to jump into a video about the Wise Console. Today, we take a look at the WISE console. Let's go. The WISE console is a replacement of the WISE CLI. It can be found under the bin folder in the installation directory. The WISE console is found right beside the WISE CLI and the WISE executables. The WISE CLI is still available, but we recommend using the WISE console. So let's see what the WISE console is. The WISE console allows you to run different operations. For example, generating sound banks, uh, running a WAPI server, converting external source. A big difference with the WISE CLI is that each operation available is documented in the <laughs> console. So let's take a look at the documentation, for example, Oops. for generating sound banks. So generate sound bank dash dash help to get the full help of the command. So as you see, there's many options and also, at the top, we have the arguments. So when specifying the generate sound bank operation, you need to specify the project. And also, optionally, you can specify any of these options. For our example, we will be generating the sound banks for the integration demo. So let's take a look at the integration demo folder. And let's find the integration demo project. So copy path. So we will be looking, so we will be calling generate sound bank on the integration demo project. We will be specifying the verbose option to get more data in the screen. Also, we will be specifying a platform windows. And then we have our sound banks generated with no error for the integration demo project. The wise console documentation can also be found online and as an option during installation. Thank you for watching. Awesome. Great wise console overview from Bernard, who we're going to be speaking with a bit later uh, about WAPI. We're also going to have the integration section coming up next after our next speaker. So stick around for that. Um, great to have that overview. Uh, next up, uh, I'd like to welcome Michael Cooper to the live screen. 
Michael is a software engineer at Audio Kinetic. Uh, he works on the UI and sound engine development for the WISE platform. Uh, great guy to have around. Welcome, Michael. How's it going? Hey, Damien. Good, good. Yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, thanks. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I hear you're going to talk to us about media IDs. I heard the same thing. I awesome. can't wait. I'm going to transition you to the presentation mode and let you take it away. All right. So, uh, yeah. So I was asked to talk about a new feature we brought into 19.2. Um, uh, a new feature to help with the management of media IDs in your project. So um, I guess the best way to go about this is to go uh, over a quick explanation of how WISE manages your media IDs at the moment. And then we can go through the uh, new workflow we've introduced. So taking a quick look, I've created a super duper simple project. Um, one sound effects with an audio asset called drum.wave and another with guitar.wave. And I'm oh, sorry, I skipped over this one. I have another instance of drum.wave. So uh, when you import audio assets or WAV files, uh, WISE associates or yeah, associates a 32-bit pseudo random number, a media ID to your audio asset, uh, which will represent um, the, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, uh, will represent the generated audio asset or the WEM file in your project. It's like a magic um, number associated with it. Pretty much. Cool. And that's the only thing the sound engine will use to refer to that um, audio asset. So, um, I mean, if you want to know real quick what are the uh, how to determine what audio assets are uh, sorry what media IDs are associated to your assets um, well I have the uh, the workspace here and I opened it okay oh, it's still open so here are the work units and for each uh, sound effects you have the sound effects you have here the audio asset or the wave file used the file name and Here's the media ID. So when I imported this uh, WAV file, WISE decided this was a good number for that WEM file. Great. Um, and so that's great. It has a WEM file, and that'll be that. And for the rest of the life of this project, that WEM file will be known as that ID. However, one interesting fact comes up is um, what if I have multiple instances of the same WAV file? Uh, if, they, if they generate the same WEM file in the end, you want to ship only one version of that WEM file. You don't want to have multiple, uh, multiple copies. Uh, With a WEM file being the, uh, the, um, yeah, the compressed version of the WAV file per platform. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. So if I were to take a look at this file, actually not this one because I don't want to mess it up right now. <laughs> look at this guy. Um, so, you know, you've imported a WAV file. There are multiple things that are done to it or can be done to it before you get your generated WEM file. You can decide to, I know, apply some fades to it, maybe trim a bit off beginning and end, and, and whatever other properties you decide to modify on the source before conversion. And then on top of that, you have your conversion settings that are applied before a WEM file is generated. So to show that real quick, uh, I've also created one sound bank that includes uh, all my sounds. And if I were to generate that sound bank, oops, oh, my project's in a kind of intermediary state, but that's okay. We'll have a look in our generated sound banks. And you can see we have our, our sound banks generated, and our WEM files. And I believe this is the ID we looked at earlier, but point is, our files are now known as that, and only that. Seems legit. Seems kind of legit. So if I were to fix my project, because I goofed it, there you go, seven, generate again. We can also go here and see what audio assets were used. We have one drum.wave, which will now be known as this, and one guitar.wave, known as this. So why do we have only one file? Well, going back to this, 
I have two instances of drum.wave. And I'll open the source editor to show that. They're both identical. They have the same exact edits, and they use the same conversion settings. So they result in the same file. And if I were to change that just, just a bit and generate my soundbanks again, go back over here, suddenly I have three files. And sorry for all the skipping around. I don't want to take up too much time. You're now doing great. You're doing drum... great. Awesome. Thank you. So we have two drum WEM files. And so that's great. Why are we showing all this? Uh, throughout all the edits you do in your project, anytime you do an operation, either by importing an audio asset or doing an operation like I just did where I changed uh, a trim or a fade in, WISE will reevaluate the media ID associated to that audio asset and all other instances of the same source file. So in this case, I have two instances of drum.wave. It evaluates both, checks the media IDs that were associated previously, checks if there's a clash, and if so, associates a new ID to the file that just changed, or files, uh, here, plural. So that's great. And as long as you have the whole project loaded, WISE will always do those operations and make sure every, make sure everything is in sync and unique, which is fine. However, one of the scenarios that may happen is, especially with teams that have many, uh, many developers in it, you might decide in a large project to not have the full project loaded. So we'll close this and reopen it. And as you can see, this work unit isn't loaded. Yep, and so, so that's a super is... cool feature, right? Being able to remove work units from loading uh, cuts down on the time it takes to open, especially on a super big project, tons of objects in it. Uh, it shortens that load time and and makes, uh, makes everything run smoother. Exactly, cool. right. But that being said, WISE can't fully guarantee that a media ID is unique and doesn't clash with another one if it doesn't have the whole project. So fine that we can, you know, that's the case. You load the work unit, WISE will reevaluate everything, assign new IDs as appropriate, and that's fine. And you still have a valid project. Where that really comes into play is, uh, suppose your game has, you're now working on a DLC package or you have a game as a service, you have a new character and level, whatever it, it may be. You don't want WISE to evaluate IDs and change IDs on assets that have been shipped. That would be problematic. Obviously, there are ways to get around it. If you have a big project, I'm sure you have some kind of source control software managing your project. And you can go in there and figure out what changed, what shouldn't have. But it's a big pain in the butt. Developers, sound designers don't need to deal with this. They don't need to worry about it. So what have we done? The idea is we've removed the management of media IDs from the work units, and we've created a separate file to manage all this. Uh, so, and we're, I think we're going to talk about Wise Console after this. Uh, we just had a little bit of Wise Console just now, right, so it's, it's exact. Perfect. So I've opened uh, a command prompt uh, in the. Uh, the folder where the uh, wise executable is. And if we try to wise one, run wise console, show all the commands. So there are three new commands that have been added. This is the one that interests us. This will, in effect, remove all media IDs from our work units, dump them in a single file, and will be set to go in our new workflow. So if we, whoops, do that real quick. And sorry, I need the You're doing app great. To my project. Oh. Perfect. So it's been changed. And coming back here, the file's been updated, and we see that our files no longer have a media ID list. And we have a new .media ID file that's been generated. And for each file, 
We have the instance in the work unit that represents the instance of the, the audio asset, the ID allocated, and a hash value. This hash value basically represents everything that, was, that went into creating your web file. So all the edits we did in the source editor plus conversion settings. So now the idea is when WISE loads the project, oh, I detected external changes. When WISE loads the project, it'll first load that file. As it's loading your work unit assets, we'll try to match any media ID that's already been allocated, respect those, uh, and then go through the process of looking for clashes, allocating new IDs if necessary, and uh, fixing clashes that occur. Um, but with that flow, the idea is that this file only gets updated by one central person. And um, probably during major milestones of your project, but obviously whenever you feel is appropriate. And that's done with the other command here. This command basically loads your project, goes through everything I described, but ensures that the whole project is loaded and updates your media ID file. So with that, um, you have, well, you have no chance or a far better chance of avoiding clashes in media IDs and accidentally modifying something that's been shipped or shouldn't have been changed in the first place. Um, so that's pretty much it. That pretty much goes over it. Uh, if I could mention one more thing, if you want to experiment with it, it works pretty well. If you decide it's not a um, the best fit for your team, you always have the reverse command to going back to the old workflow. Um, that also, uh, as you mentioned earlier, we have this like cool feature of unloading work units, which makes things lighter and faster. Um, this will come even more into effect or be more beneficial with future releases of WISE, where we're going to be adding features to that as well for loading and unloading work units. So probably a this media ID uh, central file will be more beneficial as uh, future releases, releases come out. Uh, and final note, like I said, I talked real fast. Uh, if need be, you have uh, this page that uh, goes into painstaking detail to describe what I just whizzed through. Uh, just look up wise media ID in Google. I'll bring you here. Awesome. Uh Great overview of media IDs and this new feature of uh, off, uh, offloading those to their own file. Uh, I think it's great um, that, again, teasing that future as we continue to expand this feature outward. Uh, it really, it's a, it's a sweet hack for a developer working at a large scale that needs to manage their assets in a different way and providing that solution, providing those those ways for developers to do that is, uh, well, it's a key piece in, in making sure that, that we have a tenable solution for the most people. So yeah. cool, cool to have your work on that. Thanks so much for, uh, for dropping by the All stream right, well, today. Thanks for having me on. All right, cheers to that. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right, hope to see many people during the- uh, The AK well, beverage at the Take end. Care. Yeah, see you there. Ciao. Oh yeah, I'll be there. All right. Oh, yeah. Ciao. Great, that was Michael Cooper schooling us on media IDs. That was pretty rad. Uh, real happy to have you know these these features that are focused on uh, developers and their integration strategies. Uh, it's it's great to be able to uh, yeah have solutions for folks when they need them. So we are rapidly approaching the integration section, and by that I mean it's right now. Uh, we're going to roll this one minute video and then get off to the races. Let's start fresh and go from this audio file to having it play in game in Unreal. To do so, you will need to import the audio file, prepare it so it fits your in game purpose, put it in a bank to be loaded by Unreal, and then hook up the sound to some in game action. Let's begin. Go to your Wise Projects Project Explorer. Because we have a sound and not a piece of music, right click inside the Actor Mixer hierarchy and choose Import Audio Files. Then add your audio file and make sure it's creating a new sound SFX and not a sound voice. Let's have a listen. 
Notice that it takes a bit of time for the sound to start, but this sound should be played instantly on collision. So head into the source editor and define a later starting position. And that's better. Now for the game engine to call this sound, it needs to be an event. So right click the sound, make a new event that plays the sound. Next in the sound bank layout, make a new sound bank, which is the package of sounds you'll give to the game engine and put the event inside of it. Then generate sound banks and save your wise project. Now head into Unreal. When I press play, this ball will fall and collide with the plane. So first, create a sound bank asset. Then get the event from the wise picker and assign the sound bank to it. And then generate sound banks into this project. In the blueprint, you'll set the collision hit to call post event on itself and then select the event. Let's try it out. Now, because each minor collision calls the event, this will sound somewhat unnatural. So let's limit the calls to only collisions with high impact velocity, like this. That's it. So that was your one minute intro to the uh, Unity integration, it's the Unreal integration, right? Uh, and, and I'd like to welcome to our live stream the next guest. Uh, we've got Benoit Santara here. Benoit, how are you doing today? Pretty great. How about you? Uh, doing fantastic. Things are ebbing and flowing in just the right way. And uh, glad to have you here. Cool. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So you're heading up the integrations side of things at Audio Kinetic. Yep. And for six years now. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Uh, and today you're going to share a presentation with us about that Unreal integration. Uh, I can't wait. Let's rock. Yeah. So just going to go a bit hands-on about how to get a sound plane. You saw Med's excellent uh one minute wise video about it. Interesting thing is uh, that was made under what we now call the old workflow. Uh, so you saw me it's creating sound banks and whatnot. Um, now this is a thing of the past. Um, so let me show you um, how that is. So um, you're all seeing my screen? Yeah. All right, so let's start in our launcher. Uh, so. I've already set up a WISE project, uh, a WISE project, and I have an Unreal project with WISE integrated already. So let's dive right into it by clicking these two buttons: open in Unreal, open in WISE. Of course, Unreal takes a while, but it gets there. All right. So, um, how do I get a sampling in that new workflow? So, uh, the beginning is familiar. So you just import your sounds inside of WISE. So let's just create this simple ambience here. Uh, I'll set it to looping. Then I have water drops random containers uh, that I put water drop sounds in. This is all what you're used to. Now, um, I want you to pay attention to the Unreal side here, because when I create my play events for these two containers, they appear now automatically on the Unreal side. Um, no need to do manual event and bank creation like you saw in that one minute wise video. Um, there's a WAPI connection now allowing you to basically send everything you're doing um, in WISE directly to Unreal without even thinking about it. So once that done, when that's done, uh, you just generate all of your sound data. We'll just generate Windows for now. So now that's completed. And you hear this cool ambience when I preview it from the content browser. Um, so no sound that's... from your presentation. No sound from my presentation. Red. Because of course I just I just demoed this like <laughs> <laughs> we call this live streaming um, for a reason, man. It's like uh, things are going to go wrong and we'll just uh, ebb and flow with it. It's all good. Yeah. So let me just close everything, save everything, and I'll just see if we can try again. 
I, I'm thinking that Unreal might not like um, broadcasting audio from Teams. Maybe. Oh, well, well yeah, this has been a unique solution for us. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm having trouble loading my init bank somehow. Um, let's just try and see if I can recover from this. If you need me to make mouth sounds, I will. <laughs> I'm here for you. I just heard sound oh. from your desktop, so that was good. Right. And then what about this? Nope. Nope. All right. So, of course, um, it breaks when we're doing it live, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Um, Keep rolling. Keep rolling. But, I mean, trust me, sounds going to be awesome in your game. Yeah. Um, the important so the last thing here, you wanted yeah, is that it's that it's this. Yeah, keep going. Right. So you've got this web connection. Assets are created. Trust me, when you generate some data, it works. Um, and then all you have to do is you can just drag and drop that event in the level. If you want a 2D ambience, then you can set that to auto post. And then, I mean, it should work, but it's not. Um, I heard that. You can always remove. Yeah, that was unreal. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, but I mean, we can always remote connect wise to it, as you saw Tally do earlier. Um, yeah, so now because I don't have an init bank, there's not a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, but I mean, the important part is really, um, I mean, you all know that uh, the runtime part works. Uh, this is just a small snag I, I ran into right just right sure, now. Sure, sure. Um, but uh, what we've really streamlined is the synchronization between uh, wise and unreal. Um, so you saw the the events appear automatically. Um, if I go back into wise and decide to rename my events, uh, they just get renamed automatically. Um, I'm thinking I might have a setup problem where the connection isn't all there between my two projects because I copied and pasted a lot of them. Um, Fair enough. But but I think the, the main on. key that we're talking about here is the bi-directional communication between Unreal and WISE. Being able to update an event name in one tool and have it propagate to the other. Um, yep. So, I mean, you can see it here. I, if I rename from Unreal, don't open it, just rename it. It gets propagated to WISE. Everything keeps in sync. Uh, you won't lose any of your assets, any of your data. Everything is still there. Um, you can, as before, just integrate into anything. So if you want your your weapon to do a water drop instead of that big, scary uh, firing sound, you can just add one drop to an animation timeline. Um, yep. Great. I see you, Damien. That's, you're doing great. All right. So, I mean, that's that's... Hey. Pretty much it. Uh, we did do a wise hands-on uh, just before confinement, um, when you were in our offices back in March. Uh, so if you're if you're interested in seeing the workflow work, can you guys hear me? Um, just just have a look at this. I think we're going to show just a small part of it um, right after this segment. We'll put the link to it in the chat, and uh, and folks will be able to jump over to it after this and get the deeper dive hands-on like you're talking about. Uh, this one piece of it, the bi-directional communication, uh, in addition to that event-based packaging that was such a key feature of 19.2, uh, it's, again, just a, a great workflow speed up. Uh, for people working between Wise and Unreal, it really pulls things together. And uh, yeah, again, great to get the short overview from you about this. Um, I, th yep. I think that uh, I think that once folks get their hands on this, they're going to see that event-based packaging, that kind of a bankless workflow, um, and really feel the power of being able to author in Unreal without sweating the small stuff. 
uh, and letting Unreal handle the media management as part of its regular asset pipeline. Exactly. So I, I heard you say bankless, uh, just so people know. Banks are still there, they're just hidden. I know, uh, I know. <laughs> if, if you want more details, as I said, uh, we went into uh, uh, in depth with that, that whole concept during that live stream. So uh, do have a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Benoit, thanks for taking the time to stop by the live stream with us today. Uh, great to get your perspective on it. Uh, bit of live stream and hiccups but let's be honest like we are living on the edge of technology here like i mean it wouldn't be a live stream if everything went right <laughs> well we got a, a few more hours to go but uh, i'm really glad to have you here uh on the live stream and i, I look forward to hearing more about event-based packaging in the future folks out there uh that are using it let us know we're looking for feedback and uh, benoit is uh you know working to bring this same workflow to the future of our Unity integration as well, which sets me up for, uh, for Unity. I'm gonna spin a one minute uh, intro to that. Thanks, Benoit. Uh, Thanks, Damien. See you next time. See ya. Let's start fresh and go from this audio file to having it play in-game, in Unity. To do so, you will need to import the audio play file, prepare it so it fits your in-game purpose, put it in a bank to be loaded by Unity, and then hook up the sound to some in-game action. Let's begin. Go to your Wise Projects Project Explorer. Because we have a sound and not a piece of music, right click inside the actor mixer hierarchy and choose import audio files. Then add your audio file and make sure it's creating a new sound SFX and not a sound voice. Let's have a listen. Notice that it takes a bit of time for the sound to start, but this sound should be played instantly on collision. So head into the source editor and define a later starting position. That's better. Now for the game engine hey. to call this sound, it needs to be an event. So right click the sound, make a new event that plays the sound. Next in the sound bank layout, make a new sound bank, which is the package of sounds you will give to the game engine. And put the event inside of it. Then generate sound banks and save your wise project. Now head into Unity. This ball will fall and collide with this plane. So let's click the ball, add the sound bank and the event into the list of components and set it to play when colliding. That's it. Fantastic overview of the Unity integration from Mads. And in fact, I want to invite Mads onto the live stream right now. Mads, how's it going? It's going great, thanks. Uh, How about you? Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> we got a flow. We're doing this thing, uh, you know. Yeah. It wouldn't be a live stream if we didn't have some kind of uh, you know s strange technology uh, hiccups. But I think we're generally doing all right. Folks still following along in the live stream <laughs> uh, chat room. Let us know. Uh, should have uh, this segment uh, happening now, and very shortly we'll be joined by some special guests. Uh, but Mads. What do you got for us today? Yeah, so to, I got the place here of uh, introducing some Unity stuff. Uh, I'm normally not on the integrations team, but I, I was one of the main creators of the Wise Adventure game, and I wrote the Wise 251 and Wise 301, which is uh, the basics of using the Unity integration in Unity. Yeah, these are the uh, certifications so, that uh, that we offer, yeah. and we're going to talk a little bit later in the live stream about those in a deeper dive kind of way. But the the ones you mentioned are specifically focused on the Unity integration, the Wise Adventure game, and uh, yeah. And you're no stranger to this live stream. We've had you on a hands on uh, with with once before the Wise Adventure game. We'll get a link to that in the room so folks can check it out at their leisure. Uh, uh, what are you going to walk us through today? Yeah, so uh, just just to test something out, uh, can you hear this? I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. So I see it some too. water drops, some uh, Benoit Wise project that I'm using. 
Excellent. So uh, let's continue on from that. So uh, if you just close that down, just just to start out somewhere for those who like just need to go get all down to a more comprehensive level of things, we got this nice Unity tab in the Wise Launcher that you can uh, access all of your Unity products. And once you've made this Unity product, it will appear in here. For example, you can see here that I've I have two demo projects. One that is not Wise integrated, so you have a, like a button here. The nice thing about this launcher is also you can just click here once and it will generate some basic information here and then where to place the WISE project and so on. And then when you click integrate again, that's about it for integrating WISE. There's not really that much to it. Um, so it's a two-click process. And so it makes it very easy to game jam something, uh, get started with something in Unity. But yeah, let's uh, let's let's head into a Unity product I already uh, integrated WISE with. And let's just cover some basics of how to get sound in there. So I'll open the WISE project as well, because for now, we don't really have event-based packaging in uh, Unity. So, uh, whoops, that's the wrong. That was the WISE adventure game I opened there. We'll get to that in a second. <laughs> and the Unity project. So we've... For now, we've created these assets. We have imported the assets, and we have two events now, right now. But in Unity, we still need to make a sound bank. So we'll right-click and make a sound bank. And in this sound bank, we'll drag in the work unit so we get both uh, events in there. And I'll save the project, and then I'll jump into Unity. And instead of generating the sound banks in, in WISE, I'll just click Generate in the WISE Picker. So the WISE Picker is a pretty nice tool when you're working in, in Unity because it, it, it simplifies this process of adding components and so on. You can just drag and drop things from here. So I'll click Generate Sound Banks, and there we go. So um, let's just quickly create something so we get some sound here. Create some ground here. We'll create some a sphere here. Whoops, we might need to be, make this a bit bigger. We'll make this blue so we can look different than these. So, and I'll add this uh, rigid body to this one so it falls uh, down and hits the ground. And say I I want to make a trigger this time. Uh, instead of uh, detecting the collision when it hits the ground, I might want to make a trigger instead. So I'll make like a box here over here. Make it bigger. Disable the mesh. No, actually, let's let's add a transparent mesh so you can see how it looks here there. And now. For adding audio to these things you created in Unity, all you got to do is just find some sound. For example, the water drops here. Drag it on to the inspector or the object. If I just drag it on here. And now you'll see you have this AK ambient, which plays the correct event and so on. So it's really just a matter of dragging and dropping. Um, pretty easy in that case. Um, and that also makes it easier for someone who's not has any experience with programming. For example, you can drag and drop things in and play around with this, and without having to write a lot of code. But uh, we also, in this case, we need a sound bank, so we'll drag in the sound bank on. The, let's take the ground here, and just because we need to load the things because before we can use them, we'll set the load on to awake. And here we go. Now, actually, this will play, but in my case, I want the I want this to activate whenever I I take the sphere into the trigger itself. So I'll change the condition, trigger on to AK trigger enter instead, and then press play. And once I take this in here, whoops, it fell down because I forgot to put it as a trigger. There is a trigger, so we, the sphere can get inside of it. And you probably heard heard a water blob, right? So that's a bit. That's about it. So you can easily create some triggers. You can do some collision. Look at the one minute wise video if you want to get started with just integrating some basic stuff. But know that you don't need to do a lot of programming to get this done. But that doesn't really hinder that you can. You, you can get do all sorts of advanced things, but you can also get started easily and prototype something. And I think that's the so big that's, uh, that's the big strength of the integrations, right? Is that we 
put these things in front of people so that they can just jump in and start making noise with these yeah. tools, right? Uh, exactly, yeah. That's, that's, so, that's great. So that's a next great thing, overview. Yeah. So it's just to, where if you want to learn more about this, you can go into, you can look at the WISE 301 certification, which is covering these WISE units integration fundamentals. Uh, but you can also open up the WISE adventure game, which is the sample you use in the certifications. Um, and take a look at some of the things going on in there. Uh, we've integrated uh, all sorts of, used all sorts of methods to use the wise units integration. Uh, so you can see how to put it inside a, a script uh, to embed it in some way, or you can add a component and use it in that way. And it's actually all here. So it's not just a wise project, it's also the entire Unity project itself. You can change things, delete a tree if you don't like this tree. So anything you can modify and edit there. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll jump on to something new coming in the Wise Adventure game, right? This is a super exciting announce for us. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here for this and happy you're here, Mads. Uh, you know, we're at the beginning of something really exciting. Uh, I'm going to roll this uh, little teaser that you made for it, and then we can wrap down a little bit about it uh, as we speak. Ta -da! So that is exciting. We're talking the Wise Adventure Game Spatial Audio Edition. Yeah. So the, yeah, exactly. Because that's one thing that's been missing from the beginning. We knew we was missing, but we so we could make some preparations for it. But it, besides the fundamentals, there's a lot of like spatial audio components in the uh, Wise integration as well. So uh, if you if you take a look at my screen now, yeah, you can see how. Actually, that besides having this live stream where we will go through how to integrate all these things, we will also put this in the Wise Adventure game. It's sample itself, so you can go in and play with it. So, for example, when you go into the menu, audio, you'll see there's a spatial audio toggle there where you can choose all sorts of different audio reflections to play around with that. Uh, dynamic static or late, take off late reverbs if you don't like that. And, and also some uh, radio to play around with some different things. So, so all of this is the things we will cover in the uh, live stream section sessions. And uh, yeah, and the way that's uh, going to be going a, is is we'll be going hands on over the next few months uh, as part of this series of integrating spatial audio into the Wise Adventure game as we're simultaneously preparing it to be released for folks so that they can get their hands on it and mess around with what we've done uh, over the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's going to be focused on like, if you have a question or anything you want us to do in that, those live sessions, join us and post questions because we'll handle them right on the spot there. Uh, and it's, it, we wanted to make it part of you helping us doing these things rather than, than just uh, something extra we show off. So join us and, uh, and help us out with the spatial audio. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, like you say, the, the engagement with the community during that process yeah. helps feed that process. And that's back to that idea of our community partners really just helping us evolve this technology in the right way. Uh, and all of us learning together and working together um, towards those ends. So yeah, great. Exactly. Uh, so fantastic having you step through the the first pieces of the Unity integration with us. Uh, I'm excited about our collaboration on this spatial audio live stream uh, in the Wise Adventure yeah, looking game. Looking forward to it as well. And uh, thanks so much for being part of things today. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Bye. All right. Take care. <laughs>
All right, so that was Mads, and uh, it's again a great, great to have so many of the people behind uh, what we do here at Audio Kinetic. Um, like Mads said, you know he worked on the Wise Adventure game, which was a game created from a 300-page document that I wrote before I started at Audio Kinetic, and and from that now he is, uh, you know full-time audio kinetic working with us here to continue to grow wise. And it's from those roots that we really are building the foundation of this, uh, of wise and, and of audio kinetic. So I'm going to give you a tip off for the next section and we're going to roll right into it. Um, we got a, a developer interview lined up with the folks at gearbox. And then we're going to talk about a couple of plugins. So stay tight. Uh, throw those questions into the chat if you have them. And uh, meanwhile, I'm going to round us up here with the folks from Gearbox. Let's just check in on them over here in the group meetup. Hey, folks, are you with me? Hello. Hi. Hey. 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 Great to see you, you today. Uh, doing fantastic. Hey. Thanks for your patience. Uh, good to see you. We made it. Yeah, we did. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'm doing a little hustle and flow here on the live stream. You know, if you've been tuned in at all, you know that this is uh, just all fun and technology here in the magic world of reality. Uh, but I say that, and when I say it, I mean great to see you here today. So thanks again for thanks, joining me. Thanks, good to see you in. too, Damon. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm going to do a short introduction and then maybe you can expound on your role at Gearbox a little bit more for me. Uh, I got Mark Petty, I got Josh Davidson, and Raisin Varner, and Brian Pfizer. Uh, Fieser? Fieser. <laughs> I was preparing for it. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I should have prepared better. We didn't know that's how you pronounced it uh, like a year until like two years into his yeah. tenure at Gearbox. So. Well, years, right? <laughs> the problem is it's spelled wrong. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, is, it is German, so. <laughs> nice. So we'll, let's start with you, Mark. Tell, tell me about uh, how you landed uh, where you are. Um, well, I've been with Gearbox since uh, 2006. Um, I, I contracted in 2004 on uh, Roadhill 30, Brothers of Arms. Um, I came from um, a recording engineer background, uh, music recording mainly, um, spent a lot of time in the studio. Uh, one of the guys that I was working with happened to be the old audio director here back in 2004. Um, so I came in and started doing some sound design and um, I really loved working in games. Um, it was a, a new tech uh, for me at the time and um, and it, it was it was a lot of fun and super interesting. So um, then in 2006, uh, hired on as a sound designer and I've been here ever since. Um, I really, uh, I love first person shooters and I love the, the games that they make here. So it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Seems like a great fit. Cool, and then team wise, uh, do you want to introduce your team or? Uh... Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, uh, Josh Davidson, uh, senior sound designer. Um, uh, Brian Fieser, uh, lead senior sound designer, um, and Raisin Varner, uh, senior composer. Excellent. Hey, you said Brian's name right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, have to, I have to literally consciously think about it, though. Uh, Progress. Always, uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. It takes a while. It's only been four years. So. Nice. And, and how's everyone holding up uh, in, in the current social distancing climate? Yeah, I see you're all in, in your studios. I've got my uh, Cubase project on right behind this window. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah, we um, we've had to we had to run through some challenges. Um, uh, Vo was a big one because um, we have DLC content for Borderlands uh, ongoing, and we had to figure out how to uh, keep that flow of uh, voice acting going. Um, so we ended up coming up with ten portable kits, uh, and we shipped those out to the voiceover actors. They come with complete instructions as well as a tablet. Uh, we do all our direction via the tablet. They record straight into an H6, um, upload those files, we preview them, 
uh, and then we do any pickups as we need to. Um, in some cases, we've had them change from like uh, a living room to a closet uh, to redo takes uh, just for acoustic reasons. But um, but so far, it's 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 worked out with less hiccups than I thought it was going to. Yeah, that's a sweet pro, right? Jump in the closet, do a little dance. Uh, yeah, man, uh, clothes clothes are are great. For absorption, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, uh, so it's uh, so it's 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 worked out really well. Nice, nice. And you you said DLC is kind of constantly in process. So Borderlands Three is a live service. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're we're constantly pushing out content, and uh, um, we will uh, for months to come. So yeah, uh, we're we're always we're always trading out. Um, uh, different ideas and, and new DLC content for Borderlands 3. Now, a big piece of that is the weapon system, of course. And I would imagine that that's part of that DLC uh, strategy. But you also have that very unique ability to kind of mix and match components of weapons, um, pieces of things. Do you want to talk about how you uh, are doing that moving forward? What's your... What's your strategy there? Yeah, Brian, you want to um, kind of give us a backstory on that system? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, with DLC comes new gear, new weapons. Um, and we're able to you know, jump on that stuff and react to it pretty quickly with our modular system. Uh, and the, sort of the gist of the modular system is that you can kind of think of it like audio Legos. You know, each, each individual piece is a sound cue. And by building you know, thousands and thousands of assets uh, for these individual parts over the various years, we're very quickly able to take those parts and assemble a new weapon uh, for DLC content, for example. Uh, and I love the, the modularity of that. And do you find that you're like uh, putting these pieces together and all of a sudden you've got something that's just like, where did that come from? Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, but that's Borderlands. You, know? <laughs> um, yeah. you kind of throw a bunch of stuff together and you get something something cool. But at the same time, the system, you can be very controlled with it. So uh, while it does have the flexibility to just be able to throw a bunch of random parts in and just go, what do I, what do I get out of this? Is it something cool? Uh, you can also be very precise and very controlled about how you want that weapon to sound. And some of that precision from a sound perspective uh, maybe talk me through some of the ways that um, that sound changes based on, let's say, the improvements that you might make to a specific weapon type. Well, an example of that would be so. Um, well, there's like fifty something different uh, parameters in Wise that interface with the different design elements of each weapon. An example of that would be like accuracy. Um, and when a gun gets more accurate, we want the sound to change. But how do we do that? Well, we do things like we'll take the, um, the sound of the bolt of the gun cycling back and forth, and we'll amplify that in volume, and we'll bring everything else down a little bit, and maybe even do things like um, shorten the tails or shorten the transients um, on, on some of the weapons to make it sound like the gun is a bit more precise, right? Like it's running a little bit more clean. Uh, to give that sense of accuracy. Awesome, awesome. And I got to imagine some of it is like layering in su low frequencies or sub frequencies as the weapon gets more and more powerful as well. Of course, yeah, we'll, we'll layer in low frequencies and sometimes we'll actually take them away too. It just depends on what we're trying to achieve with the weapon. Sure, and it's all about, uh, you know, communicating kind of the flavor of that, of that weapon uh, audibly so that it gives players this idea of how things are evolving as they make those changes. Absolutely. It's not, I mean, sometimes it's subtle, um, but it's more about the feel, right? You want the player to feel that the gun is different and maybe not necessarily notice a huge audible difference, but it's more about the feeling of the weapon changing. Yeah. Yeah. And again, across all of these different modular components or pieces, um, across how many weapons now in that game? Uh, I don't know what term we're using. Uh, yeah. Bazillion. <laughs> bazillion. Yeah. A bazillion. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
So that's great. Uh, are there folks in, in the Borderlands community who will like do run throughs with the different combinations? Uh, see that yeah, a lot? So I've seen a couple of YouTube videos of somebody trying to find every uh, combination and recording it. Uh, but they didn't even get close. Uh, <laughs> I watched the entire thing and it was a couple hours long and uh, they, yeah, they didn't even come close. There's, I was actually surprised at how many things they missed. Um, and for us, when we're developing, you know, it's so easy for us to use developer cheats, so to speak, and just spawn whatever kind of weapon configuration that we want. Um, and we can just pick them up and run on and play with them. But you realize that the player might never actually find that weapon configuration. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, that is one of the gifts of being a developer is having all the tools and the toys uh, in debug to be able to do that. Um, and yeah, you're always kind of balancing the effort you put into something with the hope that someone will uncover it or discover it. Uh, yeah, somebody's going to run into it eventually. Ab yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the feature that I know, Josh, you did a great video overview of it. Uh, do you want to run down the system for um, for those giant speakers? Man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the mouthpiece speaker thing was uh, a pretty cool little collaborative thing that happened in our department. Um, it was bas basically the gist of it is, if you haven't played it, it's a speaker that uh, charges up and explodes. Pretty simple uh, interactive object device, but we needed to to basically have one voice play from multiple locations because this speaker array like lines up all sorts of w different walls in the uh, boss battle arena. So uh, I worked with Julian, our audio coder, to actually make sure we got the blueprint all lined up and and clean and everything like that for for the sound to play. Uh, um, the sound itself, we used uh, serum, uh, some so basically some big dubstep kind of uh, wobbles and stuff. And I, I layered in some electric guitar from uh, our technical sound designer, Ricky Meisner. And uh, also another thing that happens whenever we, uh, whenever the speaker is charging up is we high pass filter the, uh, the, the, the music the, the soundtrack of the music in the game to kind of give it that kind of like DJ kind of effect. But also it helps the explosion of the uh, speaker have a lot more impact as well. So uh, it was pretty simple, but I think a lot of people touched on it in our department and stuff, even, even though I was like the sound designer for it. Yeah. Well, and it's this giant room full of speakers, right? And the speakers actually physically yeah. propel you. So it is this beautiful synchronicity of audio and gameplay. And I think that, when we're yeah. talking about like the perfect intersection of game audio, it's when you find those opportunities uh, to build that kind of interaction in. Uh, right. Yeah. It, yeah. Totally. And another cool thing about that uh, about that fight is the music actually goes from being two D to positional from the speaker mm -hmm. location, so it gets cast to it. Yeah. So using the spread parameter in Wise on the attenuation for it. Yeah, and then we had the music was also built in chunks so that we had risers that would play in transitions between each phase of the fight. Um, and then on the music bus, we also had the we had the filter sweeping going on with a limiter following it. Uh, so we actually have a music bus just for that fight alone. Um, because as soon as you have all the spikes in the filtering, we need to run a limiter after that. Yep. And then we also mixed the music really high, so you got that kind of you know screaming in the club type of effect. Um, yeah. So it just, it was uh, per the perfect close to that, uh, that little prologue area. It's kind of like, welcome back. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And all hands on deck. Now, talking about music, Raisin, like, what's the general, like, vibe that you're trying to go for as far as setting the, setting the mood and even some of the, the puppetry that you do to, um, to make the music fit the moment? Yeah. Well, each planet has kind of its own style to it. And then um, and that's kind of an interaction between some creative goals and then kind of like what the natural voice of the composer who's owning that planet happens to be. And so I always try to find a kind of a nice sweet balance point there between, you know, what their authentic voices of a composer is and then how they would voice those goals within, you know, the music style guide. 
And then uh, as far as technically the way we build it is it's similarly uh, built by components. Um, so we have two values in the game, one called interest and one called threat. Um, and now all these little components are separated into various intensity levels. And so threat would pick kind of what intensity level. Yep. And interest drives an underlying structure of how dense the arrangement gets. So every single one of these little containers inside one of these intensity levels is actually seven stereo stems. And then when those stems, we also have random options so that every single time you cycle through that music sequence container, it picks one of those random little layered options in there. And so you could build one small, you know, you could build like one unit of intensity, but then have like 70 variations. And so as an eight bar cycle around, you get this kind of like generative groove box. Yeah. Or you could take a more linear composition because some of the ambience just didn't lend themselves to that approach. And you can start to chop it up and then have the piece sort of like, you know, train car style, randomize the order. And then the uh, uh, mix density of the arrangement is also doing this. And so you can play through the levels and just get very, very different results. Yeah. Well, and it's systems, right? Uh, and and yep. when you're composing for a system, you're taking those considerations. Uh, the game is feeding that. Uh, is it just simple uh, simple numbers driving that? Or are you doing some kind of, um, I don't know, like enemies contribute to a parameter value that escalates intensity? Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. Ever since BL1, we had a very basic sort of like almost like a points value system where we assign a points uh, value. So if it's a badass enemy, we would go in and assign a point value. Uh, we leave most of those as manual entries on each little definition for each uh, enemy variant, uh, mostly just because some badass versions are more difficult than other badass versions. And like some enemies feel like they make a bigger impact when they enter the fight than others. Yeah. And so there is, you know, a bit of a qualitative assessment there as well. Um, but yeah, so then you add all that stuff up and that's, that's like a really rudimentary way of trying to figure out how intense the game has to be for the player at any given point. Exactly. And we're just scratching the surface of this music system, but of course you've got the compositional piece that goes into consideration. Uh, we've got the, the wise component where you're establishing your systems, your relationships, your transitions, your 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 layers and and how those will be affected by then this third component which is that yeah the game is uh you're authoring these these values on the game side um that's driving the system in wise and the composer has to keep all that in their head as they're as they're writing the music for these things I, uh, I heard that uh, someone, I was at a demonstration of one of the composers on our team, and I heard a couple of people mention they were given nightmares <laughs> afterwards. So <laughs> one goal achieved, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, great. Thanks for those overviews. Uh, it's, uh, we'll, we're going to throw a link to the, uh, the videos on weapon design and, uh, and the other system. Uh, people can dig in a little deeper at home, uh, but it's great to be able to take these and these short snippets and uh, and put them in front of people to think about during this event. Uh, tell me what uh, what are you playing with at home now that you have a little time? I know Josh uh, just got I a just new got, toy. Josh, you got the new toy. Yeah, <laughs> I just got a new toy. I'll show it. Oh. It's right over here. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. There we go. Uh -huh. Is that it? There we go. Oh, Little yeah. Profit Rev2. Rev <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that, that'll that keep you busy. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. Anyone else got new toys that they're playing with? Or maybe something they're just dusting <laughs> off to try, uh, to try out? Not necessarily a new toy, but um, I've been trying to record as many household items and objects that I can, things that I may have overlooked or taken for granted, like my uh, pressure cooker, for example, it's got a great steam release. Yeah, yeah, you can mm -hmm. control it too. So um, I've just been going around and, just, and recording as many things as I can. I've got a squeaky screen door that I just recorded and used for some creature content. So that's what I've been up to. Making the best of your time. That's great. Great to hear. Yeah. 
one of the coolest little things uh, I've been, uh, I picked up uh, more in her uh, about three months ago. I've been learning it and been using it in score for one of, uh, for an upcoming uh, release, which is really cool. Uh, but one of the most fun things is I was playing around with, you know, bowed acoustic guitar and we had a theme of a train in the music and somehow the bowed acoustic guitar is how to sound like a train horn. I don't know how I couldn't <laughs> repeat it. I don't know if I could by design make that happen. Yeah. But that was like one of the cooler uh, things uh, last week. Just playing around, and I was like, "Oh, uh, very nice, very nice." Not bad, not bad. Mark, anything, uh, anything fancy going on over there? I don't know about fancy, but it's. I, I will say that that being at home and being around my guitars and stuff like that has provided a lot of opportunity to just sort of dive back into um, taking breaks and playing and. Um, uh, it's been nice. Um, uh, I'm going to set up uh, my part of my drum kit back upstairs again and um, start diving back into that. And um, and the kids have, have uh, gotten into the guitars, and, and so I've been sitting down and teaching my son how to play. So it's it's uh, um, it's kind of spurred a, the other side of sort of the old side of um, of the music side of me. So it's 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 been a lot of fun. Nice. I'll look forward. Mark just doesn't want to. Mark doesn't want to flex his Animal Crossing house. He's just, <laughs> yeah. he's being modest. That's what yeah, he's I really do. been doing. I do play a fair amount. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I'll be looking forward to the Mark Petty Family Band uh, recording right. at some point in the future. Uh, and in the meantime, I just want to say thanks for uh, joining us here on the Wise Worldwide Online Expo. Holy free holies. Great to have you all here today. Thanks for sharing your information thank, with thank the community. You. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We appreciate Thanks. It. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Cool. All right. Moving swiftly on. That was Gearbox Software. Uh, great to have them as part of the live stream today. Uh, really thankful for them uh, sharing all their experience. Um, yeah. Great folks. Uh, great to have them on the stream. So back to the talks. We got uh, a talk from Igniter Live coming up here, um, which I'll introduce here in a second. And then a GME plugin subscription overview. So first of all, let's talk about Igniter Live. This is a new developer plugin uh, available um, uh, yeah, available. Go get it. Go run out and do it. Um, but I'm going to have Jean Gravel talking about that here in a moment. Uh, video, if you turn your video on, we got you. And voila. Hello, Jean. Good to see you today. Hi. Hey. Brian, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say, Excellent. you know, you're on the, the QI, QA side of things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I've been a software developer for almost a year and a half now. Excellent. But you also uh, have... Software, software tester, sorry. Sure. But you have a long history of, uh, of audio. Uh, you, got, you hung up a new guitar today. Uh, yep. <laughs> so you've been in audio for a while. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, I've, uh, I've graduated from uh, computer music uh, in Montreal, so I've, uh, I've, d I've done everything that was uh, given in these courses from uh, programming to uh, um, uh, video game sounds, and I even uh, did a 32-speaker dome composition uh, using uh, cymbals uh, and percussion sounds uh, using uh, spectral analysis and uh, uh, the uh, software open music, so I've Touched, you know, poked around with a lot of things, and I've been playing guitar for almost uh, eleven years now. So yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to your presentation today on Krotos. Uh, you actually gave this as part of the company All Hands a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, definitely. So get that queued up. Uh, and we also had a hands-on with uh, with Matthew from Krotos that we'll get a link up to in the chat room so that folks can go deeper with the developer uh, and Igniter Live so that, uh, so that after this live stream, if you want to take a peek, um, we'll have that there for you. 
in the meantime, yeah. John's going to give us a quick overview of it. And so on your mark. I, yeah, I'll just test first if uh, we hear sounds from my, uh, my wife's uh, uh, presentation. Great. I had it for a second, but I lost it. I uh, will. Um, Wait, wait, wait. Yep. I just found out uh -huh. what I need to do. Had it, lost it, uh... almost. Meanwhile, how are folks out there in the chat rooms? You finding it all right? It looks like uh, people are doing their thing and uh, engaging. It's great to have everyone tuned in today. Uh, so, there we go. I like what I I'm seeing. Just to... You want to test the audio? I hear it. It could come up a little. No, no, let's keep it where it is. Yeah. Because when you change that RPM, right, you're going right. to be, uh, I know what's going to happen then. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, so yeah, uh, I can... I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jean. Excellent. So, uh, well, I'm going to be demonstrating today the Ignite Live plugin. So, why is Ignite Live? Uh, first and foremost, before being a wise plugin, uh, uh, well, Ignite Live is a plugin that gives the ability for some designers to create. Uh, design integrate vehicle sounds for their productions. So it's developed by Kratos Audio, and they first developed this plugin as a VST to be used as a, in a dot. And uh, today I will be presenting to you the fruit of the partnership between uh, Kratos Audio and Audio Kinetic. Because of course the main perk of porting this plugin to Wise is to give some designers uh, the ability to control of these parameters using uh, RTPCs at runtime for uh, dynamic sound processing of the vehicle sounds. So uh, this plugin comes, uh, it's actually a bundle of plugins. So there's three different tools offered to you. So let's dive right into it. So, uh, the first one is the granular engine. Uh, so it's in WISE, it's uh, added as a source plugin. So all you're going to do is create a new sound SFX. So let's call it uh, granular. And then you can add a source in your content editor. And here they are. So there is Ignite Life. This is your granular engine. And uh, coming with this granular engine, there is uh, 25 assets of uh, 13 uh, different uh, vehicle models um, that range from uh, aircrafts to uh, uh, motorbikes, a, a tractor, there are sports cars. Um, there's even a sci-fi vehicle the, uh, example we'll see later. Uh, so, um, so there's 13 different uh, vehicle models. This means that for some of them, there is uh, both a engine sound and an exhaust sound that you can use inside of a blend container. So you can adjust uh, the balance between both of these sounds to get, to get the, the perfect sound for your, uh, for your project. Um, so how does it work? You simply have to load your car model here in this little window. These car models are uh, packaged inside of a special kind of file called a Q file, which contains all of the data uh, that WISE will use uh, at runtime. So for instance, if I play this uh, demo engine uh, the car, and then I can access the RPM and change my sound using the RPM, or uh, using the load uh, uh, fader here. So yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. So it's made very simple for some designers to uh, integrate car sounds for games. Now, the second part is, uh, of this plugin is if you want to use your own uh, recordings of cars to uh, design your own vehicle sounds, then you will be using the analysis tool, which in this case is a uh, offline plugin. So you won't be able to use it inside of WISE, but it is packaged with uh, the whole bundle. So for instance, uh, you can find it in the uh, authoring folder. So if you go to your, uh, in your project installation, uh, I mean your WISE installation, um, so from this iKinetic here. Then you go to the authoring folder, x64, release, bin, plugins, ignite live, and here you will have the analysis uh, executable. Um, so this, uh, so if you open it, you will be met with this, uh, this UI here, where you have different, uh, different tabs for each of the uh, engine uh, parts of your sound. So there's three different tabs for the engine and three different for the exhaust because there's a hiddle sound, a unload sound, a, 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 and a offload sound. And uh, also this one is made uh, pretty easy. So we have here a, uh, a clean uh, tab and you can load your own WAV file here. 
So for instance, here I have my uh, a idle sound uh, of a car. Then you will see the uh, wave file appearing here. And then all you got to do is analyze. And so the analysis tool will, of course, do what it's supposed to do, uh, this analysis. So it's going to make a harmonic analysis of your sound. And it's going to create this uh, beautiful heat map. And using these harmonics, it's going to cut your sound into different grains so that uh, if you, uh, you change, uh, you transition through your sounds, you change the RPMs, uh, there will be no uh, sound artifacts or bumps in your sound using these different grains. Um, so now it's uh, analyzing. And then the great thing is that, of course, uh, most likely your recordings will not be uh, always so clean. So there's a, uh, an option to edit this, um, this heat map if you want to make this, uh, this line very smooth. So you can edit analysis. And then the heat map is going to pop up. And then you can manually uh, you know, just change uh, the harmonics and write like this. And then it's going to do another analysis and uh, recut your sound into different grains uh, to be used. So now it, it may be processing. Uh, I know that earlier it was, uh, oh, I think it's done. So now, once you're happy with all your sounds, you can go back to the vehicle tab where uh, all of the uh, information is gathered here, and you can uh, have a playback of your sound. So for instance, I can uh, play my vehicle. This is oh, all right. It doesn't matter, but it's a, it's just a, a a place where you can uh, uh, preview all of your sounds when you're done uh, editing all of these white files and adding the grains for your sounds. Once you're uh, satisfied with your project, you can export your package. So you hit export package, and then you are met with all these different options because. If you want, you can only package the engine granular part. You can only package the engine uh, loop, uh, the gearbox, and you have different encoding um, options here. So let's package this one, and we're going to call it demo engine one. And then it's going to create my Q file. And if I go back to my granular uh, sound SFX here, and then I can load this new uh, demo engine one. And then I'll be able to hear my sound that I've just created in the analysis tool. And uh, yeah, so this is how you will you would use both the analysis tool and the render engine together to create your own sounds. And then there is a third part to this plugin, uh, which is the synth, which is what which was probably uh, bundled because uh, to give the ability for sound designers to create their own sci-fi vehicle. And uh, so there is a pretty cool example given in the factory assets of uh, the Ignite Live here, where they put a blend container with a Porsche sound and a synth. So let's look at the synth. It's a pretty simple synth, but a pretty cool one. It's a four oscillator synth, which uh, each of these oscillators have two different uh, uh, wide forms you can blend between. You can even uh, load your own custom waveform, waveform you've worked in a, separate software. And then all of these parameters are also accessible to an RTPC. So for instance, here we have uh, the pore sound, which has a RPM RTPC tied to it. So this is the, the pore sound only. Then we have the synth. And then if we blend it together inside of another blend container, then we get our new sci-fi car. And then both the synth and the, uh, the, the Porsche sound will, um, will change depending on my uh, val the value of my RTPC, my uh, RPM RTPC. So uh, yeah, that makes a, a quick overview of the three, uh, three different uh, plugins available um, in the Igniter Live uh, plugin. Uh, so all of these different plugins have a different license. So if you want to only add the granular engine and use the uh, 25 assets are provided. You can only get these for your game if you want to. You, but you, you may also buy only the, uh, the synth if you want to use the synth for 
maybe sci-fi vehicles or um, uh, just for, for music or just for SFX, this is also possible. And uh, if you want to use your own, uh, design your own car, well, you will need the analysis tool. So, uh, but like anything that is wise related, uh, it's free to use inside of the authoring. So uh, don't wait, get your hands dirty, uh, download the latest wise version, uh, get the plugin and start creating your own sci-fi vehicle. Awesome. Yeah, I love, I love that it's there today. Like, go check it out. Uh, get your hands on it. Yep. As you've shown, Jean, it's like the accessibility of having those, um, those test assets already in the project waiting for you. Yep. Um, the depth of, uh, of the authoring tool outside of that. Um, yep. You know, granular, loop-based, synthesis, like it's a it's a fully featured suite that really shines once you start parameterizing from the game engine and pushing and pulling those yep. different uh, mm -hmm. values uh, using data from the game. Uh, and again, yep. we go deeper into these different areas in one of the recent Wise Up hands on with uh, with Matthew from Krotos. So be sure to look for that link yep. and dig in deeper with that. Uh, Jean, thanks so much for your uh, overview of Igniter Live. Uh, nice work. Thanks to you for hosting this uh, this uh, this whole presentation. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I'm having fun. It's great. It's good to see you. <laughs> All right, yeah, uh, go wheedle on that guitar a little bit, would you? Yeah, I will. I will. It's going to be a good stress relief. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cheers. Thanks a lot. All right. See ya. Okay, that was Jean Gravel. He uh, ran us through Krotos Igniter Live. Uh, we're going to move on very quickly next. Uh, we're going to get an overview of Tencent GME from uh, Samuel and Denise. Uh, let me get them queued up here in, they call that the green room. Uh, what a strange term. I'm sure that someone on the internet could figure that one out for me. What even is a green room? We're almost there, fellas. Uh, and I see you have already prepped your presentation. You are way ahead of me. So with that, I would say uh, welcome to the live stream. Good to see you. Hey, hey, hey. Good to be there. Ah, I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> <laughs> so how's it going over there? Going pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Denis, can we hear you? I'm no getting Denis no Denis yet. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. There he is. Ah, there you go. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, default microphone got broke. So sorry about that. It's a pleasure to be here too. Nice t-shirt, Samuel. Hey. Thank you. I'm getting uh, I'm getting ready for my Lady Gaga costume change here at the next break, so we'll see. I got Great. I got uh, like to see that. And then we'll be color coordinated. So uh, you are going through the Tencent GME, which is uh, which is out now. Uh, I'm excited for that presentation. I'm going to move you to it, and please take it away. All right. Well. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Samuel Longchamp. I'm a software developer, and I've been uh, busy at integrating uh, Tencent GME as a solution for uh, chat and voice chat uh, in WISE that's uh, provided by Tencent, uh, our friends at Tencent. So all I'm going to do today is just have a, a few, uh, present to you basically just the, 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 the product as, is, as it is uh, today. And uh, then Denis is just going to show you how um, the, the pricing part and how uh, the project uh, setup can be done. So just quickly, what I can see here is a big schema of what the Tencent GME solution is doing in WISE. But uh, I'm not going to go over every detail. Basically, all you have to understand is uh, that there are two parts to that plugin. And one part, of course, is on the server since it's a voice uh, online voice service. Um, Part of that uh, system basically joins into WISE voices from the input, your microphone, and the output to a server and receiving end that comes back to WISE 
as uh, objects you can use in your pipeline. So that allows for a plenty of stuff and interesting um, sound design ideas that uh, can be applied with the standard set of tools that WISE offers, um, such as spatialization and effects, uh, runtime effects on those voices. Um, and uh, we're very thrilled to have that uh, system come into uh, WISE for many uh, platforms and uh, system. We're integrating new ones as we go, uh, and there will be new versions as well with newer releases. Um, so that's the basic idea of what uh, Tencent Jamie can offer in WISE, and I'm just going to leave it to Denis to show more of how do we set up this. That's great. Uh, and, it, yes. and I'll take a pause real quick just to uh, just to pull back. Like, as a feature in the game, uh, you know, having voice positionally located, um, this is, I hate to say it, it's a game changer, right? It is. If you have, it is. You're absolutely right. If you have a game that relies on that kind of positionality for other players in a multiplayer situation, uh, it's, it's a, it's a solution to something that um, you know, is not solved by having a, a raw Discord channel rocking, right? Because it gives you the exactly. gameplay edge of having the positionality. Um, yeah, exactly. And yeah, so those who have played big battle royale type of games, which have PUBG, and there's always already an implementation of of that Tencent GME system in PUBG Mobile that you can try today. And basically, all distance attenuation uh, that can occur and team-based uh, communication, so you can talk with your teammates, but your enemies can also hear you from a distance too, with all that that uh, sound design element of how, how the, the filters can be applied based on distance or hills or uh, every possibility is open. Excellent, excellent. Thanks for that overview, Samuel. Uh, Denise, let's uh, transition to to how that works on the on the subscription side. Take it away. Yep. Sure. Uh, so now that you've seen this uh, awesome new plugin, awesome new technology that we we had to make a partnership with Tencent Jimmy with that, um, you must be wondering how do I get it. So um, it is actually pretty simple, and uh, just like all plugins, it is available on our website. In the partner section, you just have to click on Tencent GME and then start for evaluation. It's as simple as that. So the nice thing here is that, um, of course, there will be like a setup that is required on your WISE project to integrate the plugin and uh, download everything that is required for it to work properly. Uh, but the subscription itself, it requires like for us to make some kind of connection between your project and an application out there in the cloud. Uh, once you get through that uh, basic stuff, I'm not going to go through the whole start the evaluation process. You read the documents and you say, I, I do agree. I want that plugin. Uh, once it is done, we automatically create an application for you in the cloud so that your project can connect immediately to that application. Basically, you're ready to go uh, for uh, starting like chats with users all across the world. Uh, once another thing that is uh, that is uh, actually relevant is that you might have noticed that since this is used per user on a per user basis, um, once your game gets into production, that might actually get to use huge volumetry, huge a lot of people chatting all over the place, and it wouldn't make sense to have like a single price for that. So we had to make some kind of arrangement and introduce a new kind of building model just for that plugin. So it's not like once, you don't have to pay once like a huge amount of money, but you pay based on what you basically use on a per use basis. And uh, because that required you to basically have a handle of what is my consumption, how, is, how does that work? We created like a whole new section so you might know about that project page. And interestingly enough, it has been redone. I don't know if you've noticed, uh, because it grew up within years to have like all kind of uh, stuff. So we added some clarity, I hope, and don't hesitate to give feedback on that. Uh, so we separate all the sections, and we created like a special section for Tencent GME. 
that is available only if you have the GME plugin, of course. And what that section shows you is, uh, well, your consumption on a daily basis and uh, the ability for you basically to manage what will be, what you will have to pay on a monthly basis that time. Um, so yeah, that's pretty simple. Basically, you just have to uh, trade out on the website. Once the application is created on the cloud, you just have uh, uh, the live consumption that is displayed on your project page, new project page with a lot of new gizmos that uh, I'll let you circle around. So that's pretty much it for the subscription part. Uh, Excellent. Well, and and that really just closes the loop on the on that pipeline, which which again uh, is authored in Wise is instantiated at runtime in your game, but then uses uh, the cloud to to do that rendering uh, and and ties that whole um, subscription model together. Yeah, absolutely. Right so on. Uh, it was like a missing part that we had to, to do on the website to, to give you the ability basically to try it out immediately and to have the application ready for you and all set up automatically uh, just, you know, through a couple of clicks. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it's so great to have that overview from uh, the two of you. I really appreciate you folks out there in the world through this uh, so that they can just jump in. And that's out right now. Yeah. Go get it. Thank you for having us. Yeah. 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 Uh, great Go to see it. your faces and uh, appreciate you uh, joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good pleasure. Okay. Bye. Great. Ah, that was awesome. A little Tencent GME run through. Uh, really appreciated being able to see how that uh, came together. Um, What's cool is we are rolling over here on this live stream. I think we're on hour three. Uh, who's keeping track at home? Because like, yeah, I'm in the flow now and we are just moving. So this kicks off the next section of the Wise Worldwide Online Expo. This is the WAPI and authoring part. Uh, I'm going to introduce Bernard Rodrigue. Bernard is the Director of Development at Audio Kinetic. He joined in 2005. He's been around uh, a long time helping to build the framework and fundamentals of the Wise you see today. I'm super happy to have him here. It's going super well. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, you've been tuned in a little bit. I've seen you in and out of the chat room. How's, uh, how's it looking on the world outside? Well, there's a lot of action on the chat. Uh, a lot of people are watching. I'm, um, I'm uh, surprised. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, you got some cool stuff to show us today with Wappy and, and even another little fun bit. So I'm just going to let you get to it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just uh, joining the Perfect. conference right now. Yep. The We're doing that. And I love it. Carlos down in Florida says hi. <laughs> it's good. Well, it's great to see the community uh, coming out for this event. Uh, great connecting with folks during this time. So you see my presentation? Perfect. Yes. So uh, WAPI was, uh, has been around for a couple of years now and um, it evolved over time. Uh, it's it's now a mature and used a solution. Um, and what what is it, Wappy? So we, and and since the beginning of this uh, this day, we I think we mentioned Wappy a couple of times. Uh, we mentioned Wappy during the Unreal uh, presentation, uh, in particular. And so Wappy is a is a way for programs to communicate with uh, wise authoring. Um, and so let's uh, go to my next page. Uh, so WAPI is an open door uh, for other program to to get, uh, to talk to WISE and also access uh, different information. So uh, give access to WISE user interface, give access to WISE project, the audio file, sound banks, 
and also the sound engine. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do with WAPI from uh, being an external program and trying to communicate with WISE. Um, and is a big list of uh, different things uh, that can be done uh, through WAPI, like retrieving objects and their information, for example, getting names, notes, and property like uh, volume about a different object also changing uh, information on these objects, creating new sounds, importing audio files, gener generating sound banks. And that's what the Unreal uh, Engine is doing with the new uh, sound bank less workflow. It's generating sound banks uh, through WAPI um, and actually uh, without even writing uh, files on the disk. Um, so there's a lot of features that allows you to take control over the uh, your project in the interface. Uh, through WAPI. And all of this is um, actually accessible through uh, different languages uh, for uh, your program. So C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, Python. And in, in particular, um, C Sharp and Python are probably the most easy to start with. Uh, we have uh, out of the box samples uh, ready to be used. And actually, we can uh, probably uh, right now take a look at uh, the samples folder. Uh, before we jump to the introduction uh, one minute video, so uh, you'll find the, f the samples under the, the SDK uh, folder under the installation directory, uh, SDK samples and authoring, arise authoring API. And you have all these, um, samples over there. And uh, so that's a transition for uh, the one minute video that uh, Metz uh, did about uh, how to use WAPI with Python uh, and, and WISE. So I guess we can go from there. To create a WAPI function that connects WISE to your game, you can do it like this. Prepare your computer by installing Python. Install the WAPI client, modify one of the audio kinetic samples from the web page, and execute it. So let's do it. We need to install Python 3. Once Python is installed, make sure the WAPI client is installed, and then open your preferred code editor. If you don't have one, you can use Notepad, but I'll be using VS Code, which is free. To get started, let's modify one of the audio kinetic Python WAPI samples. So copy paste the code into your editor and save your file as .py. Time to modify. We won't be getting any information from WISE like in this script, but instead we'll make WISE connect to the game. Just like if you were to open WISE, then remote connections, pick the game and click connect. So therefore, let's delete everything inside the WAPI client, except for the last client call, which we're gonna use. So instead of getting an object from WISE, we need another function so to find your specific call, you can go to the audio kinetic web page. The one we'll need is the AK wise core remote connect, and then just replace it with the first input. Next, we need to specify the host, which is an IP address. If you are running the game on the same computer, then it's just the local host with this IP, 127.0.0.1. You can now either run the code from your editor or open the command line and write p y and drag in the file. That's basically it. But if you want to execute this faster, you can make a bat file with the command, which you can then call from your game, your stream deck, and so on, and connect the profiler without having to switch to wise. That's it. We're back. So uh, I forgot one slide. Um, so uh, so here's a, a couple of examples of uh, different uh, things that can be done or uh, different types of program that could talk to WISE. So, uh, so we know about the Unreal integration uh, for WISE, but also there's uh, DW integration uh, like Reaper. Uh, there's a Reaper integration right now uh, available uh, on GitHub by uh, Carl Davis. Also, uh, others, audio software have um, integration with WISE. Um, and so game engines, scripts, uh, 
automation is is a big is a big one uh, because you could automate uh, things that you don't want to repeat uh, through Wise uh, Wapi. So now let's jump to Wise and. If, if you're starting with WAPI, I uh, just want to show a, a few things uh, so you're aware of what's available for you to uh, to work with WAPI. So uh, we're in the integration demo uh, project right now. And over here, we have um, the, the log summary area. And let's click that. So in there, we have a WAPI tab. Uh, it's, it's probably empty for you. Uh, but the thing that you need to do if you start working with WAPI is go to these uh, settings here. And on the WAPI tab, uh, select all those uh, message and enable them. So th that will give you more information of what's on what's happening on WAPI side. So let's go back to our folder where we add our Python uh, WAPI sample. And uh, let's actually run this. Uh, this thing and run the Python uh, version tree of what we're going to call the RPC uh, script. Man, anytime I see and, someone rocking the command line, it's like the matrix. It's, it's just beautiful. <laughs> I love it. You are uh, a gifted individual. Okay, back to it. So now we have the script. Uh, it was successful. It was able to connect to Wise Retrieve uh, version of uh, the instance running. And also, it asked Wise, what is, can, can you give me uh, more information about the default work unit? So it gives us the ID, name, and type. Uh, but now let's see what's happening in Wise. We have, oh, we have something in the log. So now we have information about uh, those two functions called uh, being made by the script. Uh, we have the actual get info call and also the, the object get call. Uh, to retrieve the work unit information. So yeah, that, that, that's one key piece uh, to help you troubleshoot uh, your WAPI uh, scripts. Also errors will be uh, shown there. And um, yeah, a, a good place to start. Um, so, and that brings us to, I guess, the next part. Uh, we have two other videos. Um, so, so far, we, I did run a command line script. Uh, so, might be useful for certain uh, situation, but uh, the next video will show you how to do the full circle and have uh, WAPI integrated in the user interface. Uh, and for instance, having, for example, uh, custom commands or add-ons right into the, the menus here and being able to run uh, WAPI scripts from there. Uh, so jump to it. Today, we learn how to set up and use the text-to-speech WAPI scripts for WISE. Let's go. So first, the whole project is on GitHub. So you can browse the source code and also uh, look at the instructions for uh, the setup. And first thing is that you need to have Windows uh, to use this program. Also, you need to have Python 3.6 or more recent. And, and next, we'll be installing the WAPI Python uh, client. So we'll copy this command over here. So that installs the WAPI client uh, using the Python installer and we are done. So next thing we need to do is to create the add-ons directory under the app data folder. So let's do that right now. So we'll create a new directory and add-ons. Let's go in the directory then. Uh, next thing we'll download the entire repository from GitHub. Once this is done, we will unzip the files in the add-on directory. So, so we have our add-ons here is empty and we go in the zip file 
and we copy the commands yp text to speech and readme files in on the add-on directory so we're done with that so at this point we're ready to load the command in wise so to tell wise that we have a new command uh, we'll be using the search field on top of the toolbar and type greater sign to search commands and then uh, reload so we'll find command add-on reload and we click that so now our command uh, was loaded um, so let's create a sound now type hello and the text-to-speech system is using the notes field for the text to generate so let's um, type hello Bernard and right click the sound and now we have the generate text-to-speech menu here which is uh, coming from the command we just installed so let's run that so this is actually generating a wave file on the original folder and now we see the hello sound is now blue and we have the wave file imported and we can actually play back hello bernard so now let's take a look at the source code for this so we will be opening our folder with Visual Studio Code. And let's take a look at the different files found on the fold, uh, in the folder. So we have our JSON file uh, that defines the command generate text-to-speech here. It tells wise what to run when we execute the command. So here we have our Python script and also the ID of the selected objects from WISE. Next, we have the actual Python script, which is a WAPI script. So first thing the script does is it asks WISE, I have this ID, now tell me the name, the notes type, and is the sound a voice and also the path and then it gets the information and then you can proceed with the rest of the script so let's close this okay uh, now it runs the PowerShell from Windows to execute the speech synthesizer and that will generate a WAV file and from this WAV file we're able to uh, create import uh, instructions for WISE. So we have the WAV file, the where in the project we want to place the sound, and then we use the import function to trigger the import of the WAV file. And there it is, we have our WAV file imported to WISE. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed and see you. Today we take a look at wise commands and how to make your own command add-ons. Let's go. In wise, most of the actions in the menus are commands. Also in context menu, there's commands listed there. Commands are listed under the keyboard shortcut and commands menu, which opens the list of commands. This list shows all the commands built into WISE. Today, we'll learn about how to create new command add-ons. Under the Create menu, there's three options. The first option is about creating command add-ons on the installation folder. This can be useful if you want to share um, commands across your different projects. Then there's the create in the project folder which is useful to share your commands with your team if you are distributing your project under source control. 
And the last option is to create the command add-ons under the user folder, which can be useful if you want to have your commands uh, for several different projects. So for this example, we'll be using the create in project folder. So then we are prompted to create a JSON file for our uh, command add-ons. So let's name our command uh, definition file personal um, and save. This will automatically create a new command definition file. For this example, we will delete the content and take a look at the documentation for the command add-ons. So right now I'm looking at the online documentation for defining command add-ons. And under this page, there's a list of all the different uh, fields that can be used to define command. Also, a list of all the different variables that can be used in the fields. And for this example, we will be using this sample from the documentation, which allows us to open work unit file with Visual Studio Code. So let's format this. So let's go through this sample and see how, how it works. So the first thing we see here is the ID of our command. Uh, this ID must be unique across all the different commands. So it is recommended to put um, the name of your name or and also an ID, an ID that uh, specify the command. The display name is being used to display in Wise. The default shortcut is being used as the default one, which can be overridden in the keyboard shortcut dialog. The program field here defines which program to run when the command is launched. So this can be, uh, for example, a path to uh, a program on your computer and don't forget that on JSON file backslash characters need to be escaped. So we will go back to our uh, code uh, program. So uh, Visual Studio Code uh, as a code batch file uh, available in the path. Uh, so we can just trigger this. This is enough. So as an argument to code, we will be passing the file path of the current selection. File path is actually the work unit file in this case. Uh, here we have a list of uh, menus. So the first one is the context menu, which define a sub menu for our context menu, also a list of different object types for which we will be uh, we will make our command available and we will add the work unit also. So main menu defines uh, a main menu in Wise. So let's save this. So we will go back in Wise and now we will hit the reload button. So the reload button reads all the command definition file found under the three locations. And after this, we should be able to find our uh, Visual Studio Code command registered. So let's go. So from this point, we should be able to see our command here, also listed here. So let's try to see if it works. So. So now we have our work unit open in Visual Studio Code. So let's close this work unit. And let's see how it behaves, uh, for example, if you have uh, a, an error in your JSON file. So let's remove the last character of the file, which makes an invalid JSON file. So go back to Wise. And now to trigger our command, instead of going to the menu, um, we will uh, trigger the, re the reload command. So the greater symbol in the search can be used to enumerate all the commands found in Wise. So, uh, and we can type, um, for example, code. Uh, our, com our command is still there because we still haven't 
reloaded our command. So let's reload the commands. And, and now, if we go here under the log, we will see command manager invalid command add-on. So there's an error in the actual command could not read JSON file. So let's fix that by pulling back our character, saving, and then reload again. So this time we have no error. So let's try to see if our command is now available. Yes, it is. So we've learned how to create command add-ons. Command add-ons are useful to customize your workflow. So thank you for watching. Right, so we want uh, the, our users to be in control of their workflow, and we provide them the tools to to achieve that. Excellent. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, yeah, part of that ecosystem, being in control of it, uh, it's a beautiful thing, uh, and the the things that you're building to empower that. Uh, got some cool plans for the future of that I know that we're going to be talking about more uh, with the next release but uh, for now I think that's where we'll leave it and uh, I really appreciate your time today giving us the overview uh, if folks have questions about WAPI uh, drop them into the chat uh, or get your hands on it now it's it's there it's waiting it's waiting for you um, to extend the functionality to bend the authoring application to your will. Um, and you'll see and hear more about it in the future. Uh, don't forget to find that uh, wise up hands on that Bernard and I did with WAPI as well. There was a cool example where we um, built a JSFXer interface uh, to be able to bounce waves between an online synthesis tool and, and wise. Uh, just mm -hmm. no limit. So, and let us know if you got cool ideas for WAPI or if you're building cool things. Uh, these are things that we would love to hear about and would continue to fuel the development of, uh, of WISE. So, thanks again, Bernard. It was a pleasure. Excellent. Cool. That was Bernard Rodrigue talking about WAPI today on the WISE Worldwide online event. Expo, yeah. How is everyone doing? Uh, I'm clocking in at four hours over here, and I think we got a ways to go. But I'm I'm charged. I'm energized. I'm gonna blow right through that scheduled break because we're running about 20 minutes behind. Hey, 20 minutes, not bad. I'm gonna take it. Uh, so, what we're gonna set up for in this next section is going to be, uh, it's gonna be a cornucopia of great presentations from uh, across the support, biz dev, education, and certifications. But first, we're going to jump in with a special WISE developer uh, here in Seattle, actually, from Camouflage. And so let's see if I can't uh, wake them up in the magic room. Uh, folks, how is it? Hi. Oh, Hello. Yeah. good. Yeah. Is this working? It's just, <laughs> it's like magic. I love it's it. Seamless. Se seamless. That's exactly what I was going for. Uh, <laughs> good to up with you. Early night and RJ Manningly from Camouflage. Uh, how's everyone doing today? Pretty good. Yeah. It's been fun to uh, peek into this stream every now and then see what everybody's up to. You know, like lately have been feeling pretty isolated, I'm sure. So it's like really nice to see the community again. 
ah, yes, this is exactly why uh, we put this together. Uh, it just there it brings us that a little bit closer during this time of social distancing, doesn't it? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, so great. You guys are working on a project together. Yep. Yep. Okay, and uh, and it's awesome. I'm glad to hear it. it's Iron Man VR going to be coming out uh, at some point. And you know, I'm kind of wondering, what are you doing to keep busy outside of work right now? Ah, uh, I don't know who wants to go first. You should take it away. Okay. Um, I mean, kind of doing much of the same things. I've been biking around a lot. But I did start a new project with kind of RJ's nudging, which is uh, an Arduino project. Cool. What are you going to yeah. make it do? Uh, I want to make a MIDI controller, which I've never done before. I've never done anything with Arduino before, but it felt like a decent time to, to start. So I've been kind of like going through some of the tutorials uh, last night, I was able to get as far as making a knob turn, like fade up and down the brightness of an LED. So I think I still have a ways to go, but it's pretty fun. <laughs> sure, pretty sure. Baby steps, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, because basically I have like a, a keyboard that's like that big. Yep. Um, and, you know, it has 25 keys. I don't really need those because my sound design style, I really just want something to trigger and then I want like mod modulation wheel or strip and then like a pitch bend. Yeah. So I'm getting rid of the keys and I'm going to try and make something like that big. Awesome. Uh, that sounds like yeah. a fun project. And yeah, I mean, the tiny victories, right, are what build towards that bigger success. So be yes. being able to control that LED, right? Um, tiny steps. Uh, which I think you mentioned RJ tipped you off to this and you know, RJ is no stranger to the Arduino. Don't you have like, <laughs> don't you have an Arduino that like pushes a button? Uh, it, I, I actually have been doing raspberry Pi mostly, but you know, same difference. Yeah. Yeah. I made a, I made a garage door opener at one point that, uh, I tried to get it to like hook into the electronics of the, the garage door. Thing, but I couldn't make it work, so I just ended up making a, a motor that pushes the garage door button for me. <laughs> it's like Legos, right? Yeah, there's there's a Lego piece in there. I mean, you know, what project is complete without one? I mean, that's that's good stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so climbing any good mountains lately? Doing any good uh, house projects? Uh, I mean, kind of, kind of limited. Trying to respect the uh, the, the stay indoors uh, edict, but uh, and then and then house projects have been, as I'm sure you're aware, limited to <laughs> whatever resources you have at home, since you don't really want to get a. I went to Lowe's like, kind of right before the things were getting started, getting crazy, and it was like a zoo. People were, yeah. I think, going for survival supplies or something like that. So probably been probably. kind of avoiding that. Yeah. Anyways. Well, so speaking of avoidance, <laughs> like living in VR, right? Uh, are we one step closer to it? And uh, and I know Carly, you've you've done some work on VR before at a previous company. Uh, mm -hmm. What was that about? Uh, so I think I started working in VR a little over four years ago. Um, I was working at a studio called Fun Bits at the time, and uh, we just got a lot of. Um, like a demand for prototypes and demos and such kind of like land on our, our doorstep. And at the time I was the only audio person um, there. Well, there are two of us at the beginning and then it was just me. Um, so I just kind of got like thrown in the deep end of, of VR audio development and I didn't really know anything. <laughs> so, you know, it was just like experimenting, a lot of experimenting and uh, trying out a lot of different tools and stuff. But you came um, into VR kind of when nobody knew anything, right? It was all kind of, what are we doing, right? Yeah, yeah, or like you would, you some people would com compile some information to into like an article or something, 
and it would very quickly uh, get out of date. Like yeah. uh, one thing that happened a lot was like there was a lot of different spatializer plugins, and very quickly they started getting bought up and like stopped uh, stop being available and stuff. So you'd have all this great like research and and like um, examples of these various spatializer plugins, and then very quickly they weren't available to use anymore. So it was, it was pretty wild. It was a tumultuous time. I remember uh, being part of some VR developments, and and we were all kind of making it up, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like we're past that yet? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. No. Not really. I think I think one of the things that like we have tried to do to maybe kind of sidestep it a little bit is uh, like maybe uh, I know this is kind of a heresy to some some VR folks, but like try to like avoid total reliance on the spatialization tech itself. Um, and it, and you know we've actually tried getting back to or like experimenting with getting back to some like you know regular classic 3D video game audio implementation styles um, and making those work as much as they can. Yeah, I mean, uh, the one um, limitation of, of spatialization technology right now is it has to collapse the audio to a mono point source, uh, which works for a lot of subtle details. But when you're trying to convey something like really large, close up, really loud, like you want some spread in to come across. Uh, And so RJ and I have been able to experiment with spread using um, the WISE uh, 3D spatialization mix uh, feature that got added um, kind of somewhat recently. 2019, I think, was when it first showed up. Yeah. Um, And with that, we're able to drive it with an RTPC and one of Two of the absolute best RTPCs to drive that value are Azimuth and Listener Cone. So that way, um, you know, the, it's not like if, say, for example, we have a, a stereo sound, it's not headlocked and, and stuck no matter what you do. It's actually adapting and, and changing with the player's focus and their look direction and on all this stuff. You know, I think with VR, um, the, the azimuth and the listener cone is quite a good um, portrayal of a player's focus is, is where they're, yeah. they're looking. Now, an azimuth is a built-in parameter that you can bind to any RTPC, so that comes out of the box. But when you talk about listener cone, that's a little... F- also built in. <laughs> <laughs> that's also built in as a parameter. <laughs> okay, great. You nailed it. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, RJ, you should explain really quick, like, kind of what the difference is. I know I lumped them together in one category, but they are uh, different. I mean, there's probably somebody much smarter than me over at Audio Kinetic who can, but I mean, the, the way that I think about it is azimuth is just kind of the, like, XZ, the horizontal plane direction that you're looking, um, you know, so it doesn't really take looking up and down into account, um, which we kind of find for, like, much bigger moments. Um, whereas the, uh, the listener cone is, is, you know, basically you kind of draw one of those, uh, pet just got home from the vet kind of cones around the listener's head. Uh, and, and that's, it is exactly that it gives you kind of the zero degrees is right in front of you. 180 is directly behind you kind of in any direction. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of two sides of the same coin basically i think listener cone kind of gives you maybe a little more fidelity which sometimes you want and sometimes surprisingly you actually maybe don't want mm-hmm. um, it's actually a really useful one for controlling uh, volume mix as well because again like i said vr the player focuses a lot of or, you know the look direction is a great way to kind of understand the focus um so if something is theoretically not in focus and not important if it's not in focus, then you can have the power to mix it out, which is really great. Yeah, you can let your your 3D objects kind of start to self-mix a little bit. Yeah, because really what you're doing in that, you know, with this idea of, uh, you know, player focus or listener focus is you're trying to simulate what we do automatically as humans as part of our, (laughs) you know, ability to differentiate sound sources and their importance. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. 
really, really good at doing that in real life. And I think in virtual reality, we kind of take a step back a little bit. Like we're not, we're not so good at filtering all of the information that's coming in when we're in VR. Personally, I think like just uh, from my own personal experience, like I get overwhelmed really easily. If there's a lot of visual stimulus and, and sound stimulus, um, it can be a bit much to handle. Uh, whereas like if I get, if I have the same amount of visual and sound stimulus outside of VR in real life, like I'm able to, to kind of deal with it a little bit better. So I think like, at least for now, like it's helpful to have these little tools to, to get it to kind of behave like our, our brain already does in real life. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. And to come back to it, like the cool thing about pretty much all of this stuff is, you know, none of it relies on like uh, special spatial tech or anything like that. You know, again, like all of these things are just out of the box wise that we've kind of, you know, seen the features exist and, and started messing with them. Well, and in the beginning, it felt like we were almost at the at the cusp of a analog digital, you know, conundrum, right? When I think that ultimately the best solution is going to be a hybridization of yeah. both the techniques that we've learned. Let's even go back to film, games, and now applied in this VR. Um, and it's really that hybrid of solutions that is going to make the best experience. Uh, at least that sounds, yeah. sounds like what you're saying, yeah? Yeah, yeah and like even with us working on uh, various projects, like we can't, uh, we have all these great tools, right? But whenever we rely on them completely, it doesn't sound as good as it could. Like we still have to be very conscientious of of all these things, like even in the design process, like what frequencies are we choosing? What's the transient shape look like? All of that is still extremely important, and it's not like these tools are going to like take care of that for us. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, like we have these these huge steps of um, like uh, design and then implementation and wise, and then you know trying it out in VR. And so we have to make sure like we're putting a lot of focus and attention and time in, in all of those steps. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and starting to close that iteration loop, right? Because right now, as yeah. you said, it's this process where you go from A to B to C to D, uh, and and the tighter you can keep that iteration loop or get that iteration loop over time, the more refined you can make those things, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I I don't know if it's any more than any other, you know, medium, but definitely. A surprise for me coming into VR is just like how many times it takes before I get something right, you know, because there are so many steps along the way that basically many steps for you to like not have kind of made your your uh, your first guess at how to do it <laughs> be correct. Yeah, it's a lot of translation. Like, I mean, any sound designer is familiar with the experience of like having something that sounds great in DAW and then you get it in you know, whatever your implementation platform is, in this case, WISE, and you're just like, what, what the heck? This doesn't sound like at all what I had in the DAW. So, you know, that's one translation that you have to solve. And then in this case, we're taking that from WISE and then we're experiencing it in VR. And then it's like, what the heck? That doesn't sound like I want it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, as you mentioned, like speeding up that iteration loop is is totally important in, in VR. And, uh, you know, being able to do live tuning and and all of that as, as quickly and smoothly as possible is, is super important. Absolutely, because we're in the world of like HMD, you know, auditioning, flip it up, yeah. tippy tappy tip, and then, mm -hmm. you know, go back in, how did it change? Uh, That's I, to get a neck headache from having that <laughs> on your head all day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been in situations where we'll actually have multiple listeners, uh, and by that I mean multiple headphone jacks <laughs> plugged into a system with multiple people listening, one person with their hands on, you know, wise making those changes, uh, one person in the HMD doing their dance, everyone else kind of mm -hmm. watching on a screen separately and, and making comments, you know, that is a workflow, and, and we all adopt these unique workflows to, yeah, try to get around the different 
pieces of that process. Uh, yeah. But it's an evolution that, that we're excited to be a part of uh, as someone providing technology for that space. Uh, and, and we know there's a long way to go, right? Uh, like when, when I said earlier, yeah, that, that VR was kind of a, at one point a wild west, and, and I asked if that was changed today and you said no, uh, I would ask the same question about game audio in general or interactive sound. Right, it's like we could say that twenty or thirty years ago it was uh, it was totally crazy, uh, but would we actually say that today it's a something that we've figured out? No, definitely not. No. <laughs> so, but I mean, I think I think the thing that's nice is it, it seems like conversations these days uh, with respect to VR, like people are more and more kind of like knowing what they want. Yeah. I think maybe the difference that between now and, and a, a few years ago is like, you know, games were coming out, people were putting audio in them, but uh, uh, I mean, aside from maybe a, a select few people who were who were like developing specifically for it, you know, like a lot of people didn't even have like the right language other than, you know, Spatializer, right? Yeah. We all have heard Spatializer, but I think, I think the conversation's getting a little more in depth lately, which yeah. is great. Totally, totally. And with that, I'm going to just leave that hanging off the edge there for everyone. And, uh, and I'm going to say thanks so much for joining me for that discussion today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Ah, well, it was great to take kind of uh, pause from the, the details uh, and the nitty gritty of, of uh, features do a little higher level thinking, get a little uh, perspective of the VR world from y'all. Uh, hear about the scene uh, on the ground where you're at and uh, appreciate you being a part of the live stream and part of the community. It's great to have you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Excellent. Stay good. <laughs> cool. All right, later. All right, so that was Camouflage uh, rounding up with us a rollicking talk about VR. That, uh, that went some cool places. I'm super stoked to have had them as part of the live stream, uh, developers using WISE, uh, part of the WISE community, and, uh, and good friends. I've worked with RJ in the past, and it's always a pleasure to see him. So with that, we're going to transition to Guillaume Renaud. He's going to talk us through bug reporter and community bug fixes. Uh, let's just see if we can do this, because we've got technology. Yeah, Guillaume. Do we? Yeah. How's it going? Hey, Damien. Hey. Good. All right. Hey, community. How are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing great. Great to see you, Guillaume. But, uh, so, whoa. 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 Two times fast. Ten this? times fast. No, I can't do that. No. Okay. <laughs> Hey. This is awesome. Yeah. I mean, I've I've been watching everything. You had to pull me in because I'm watching the stream at the same time. Yep. Uh, looking at all the comments. Uh, yeah, it's fun. You know, I missed my, you know, meeting in person with the community. I especially missed the morning meetups at the, uh, the audio podcast. Yeah. But yeah, we're here now. It's great to see you. It's great to see everyone. That is a big piece of this, right? It's like uh, these conferences, these are our opportunities to touch base with folks, tell them about the cool stuff we're doing, meet people, right? Meet the community face to face. Mm -hmm. um, even today, as we work uh, separately in our own spaces, uh, this is a missing piece. And so having this live stream is that opportunity. And uh, yeah, man, sight glass, that coffee, I'm missing it. Yep. <laughs> Big time. Real. Uh, Big time. Carousel lunches, carousel yes. con, like the micro talks and uh, the and just the random encounters with all the people. Always the, yeah. the random encounters. So, uh, you know, you're part of the support team at Audio Kinetic. Yes. Uh, you've been there since twenty fourteen. Uh, yeah, in six years. I try to help. Yeah. Uh, I've I've lent on you in the past 
for uh, recommendations and suggestions. And it's uh, great to have you here today uh, talking about well, stuff. About, yeah, about, yeah, our community again. No, but yeah, so uh, some of you have uh, worked with some of the people that participated. Uh, not our users have um, a project that includes support. So not all of you have met me, so nice to meet you. And what I want to talk about or show you today is uh, ways that we can be reached even though you don't have support access. Great. And I'm transitioning to that presentation. Take it away, Guillaume. Thanks. So now I'm sporting our nice corporate stuff, but yeah. So, well, the first thing before I demo anything, uh, there's one way, when you are, you're using WISE and it crashes, it's going to pop the crash reporter or error reporter. It's very important to fill that out and send it our way because we receive them, we look at all of them, and the best, uh, the more we get, the more we can um, uh, maybe get familiar with frequent crashes and with different instances it helps us debug and yeah and there's another thing let's say you don't have wise crashing but you want to say yeah but i have a bug and it's not in wise it's maybe the launcher maybe an integration maybe uh, it's not a crash but it's a bug and you want to tell us about it so when that happens there's a way you can reach us for free that we call the bug reporter so using your wise launcher you just uh, go here under the help menu and you will find the report a bug. And what this does is give you a few steps to describe your problem and uh, send it to us. So as I'm logged into the launcher, the, it already fills in my uh, email company and all that, and it presents me with a drop down menu to select my project. So I'm going to use AK test to for this demonstration and yeah and here we get to the meat of it and the main message here is you know it's a bit like washing your hands you want to do it quickly and get done with it but we've learned recently if you take your time and you put a lot of care into it everybody's going to be better off after it so yeah let's say we found a wise authoring malfunction in this version of WISE. So what I'm saying is here you could just say uh, something like this, which is uh, a fake bug, right? But uh, it's really important when, when you have identified the steps to reproduce to take the time to be very detailed here. Uh, what could be obvious to you may not be obvious to us and the more details, the better. So how do you reproduce the problem? in steps. And then even if, of course, it's uh, getting to a bug, maybe we're not going to reproduce right, aw right away. So it is important to tell us what you see, what happens when the bug happened, and what you expect. Because sometimes, yeah, uh, the more information, the better. And then if you did or didn't, let us know if you find a workaround. And then in this step, don't be shy. Like, I want to include my project to, because when you select the option to send your project, you we never grab your, the WAV files by default. And it's just to get all the specific uh, structures and events of your project because they may contain clues to the problem. And I'm going to select logs and all that. And you can even have other attachments if you want. If you have a bunch of pictures, I have a Bender picture here because I love Bender. <laughs> and of course, I accept that logs uh, may contain sensitive information. So ideally, we like uh, if, if it's a, a, a problem, you can reproduce, let's say, an integration demo then that's perfect. You send us back an integration demo that shows us how to reproduce a problem, and you don't have to worry about sharing stuff from your uh, your uh, your project, your in, your uh, your dear intellectual property. Shall we and say sensitive data? Sensitive data. Thank you. 
And that's it. It's sent, and it goes to um, it goes. Now I'm gonna get tons of message from the dev saying, "What the what the hell? What's your problem?" But yeah, so we read all of them, uh, and if they're descriptive enough, uh, we'll we'll have devs try to repro and all that. Of course, the bug reporter, uh, I didn't mention it, it tells you. So this is a, like um, uh, sending uh, the report and don't expect uh, a reply. We can't respond to everybody that sends uh, bug reports. But the more we get, the more problems we solve. Which brings me to another thing I wanted to show you, Damien. Yeah, yeah, and that relates to release notes. So here I'm looking at the release notes for 2019.2.1. Uh, we have our typical SDK updates, uh, features, mm -hmm. API chains you should look out for, and our bug fixes. Yeah. Uh, what this doesn't say, there are several of them in there that came either from crash reports or bug reporter. Yeah. Hands but, up in that chat room, folks that are reading these release notes. I mean, when these come out, this is like Sunday morning, cup of coffee, reading the release notes. Here's all the cool stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, but some of these but, you're saying. Yeah. Some of these came from either bug reporter reports or crash logs. Uh, starting next week, when we release 2019.2.2, you'll find a new section below that's going to be called Community Reported Bug Fixes, where we'll put all together the, the, the fixes we made based on reports from the community. Awesome. And this is just another and way that we try to close the loop with what we're doing and the community involvement. So as you're participating, submitting these bugs, we're circling back and letting you know that uh, that it was valuable for you to spend that time for, as Guillaume said, to take that time uh, to be articulate about the, the problem that you're experiencing so that we can help everyone uh, make WISE better. Because there's a good chance if you found a problem in WISE, you're not the only one affected, but you may be the first one to report it. Nice. And we would appreciate it. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks for that overview, Guillaume. It was, uh, I think, helpful for people to see what the process is and know that there's a, a voice or many voices. How many voices? It's a sound voice. Are we talking about? What? Sorry. Dep depends on your platform, your limit. But, Someone's yeah. listening. There's a listener. <laughs> How many listeners do we have here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so great. Thanks so much for... Uh, for that overview uh, and thanks for being part of the live stream no problem a pleasure cool i can't bye wait bye. to see you again soon take care yes take care okay so we had guillaume talking about the bug reporter and community bug fixes and we're moving swiftly on next up would be mike drummelsmith uh mike is the oh how do i put it well one of my favorite people but also the development relations director at Audio Kinetic. Uh, and so I'm welcoming you, Mike. Uh, Mike, are you here? I am, I am. Excellent. It's great to see you. Thanks for uh, just getting joining my, us. Getting my screen sharing here set up. One second. Cool. We're doing the dance, and uh, I love the way this works. Uh, live streaming today, we're deep into hour four. Um, for those of you following along, I want to know how many folks sustained the entire duration. Uh, of course, I've been exercising this whole time prepping for this, so I kind of had a, a lead on y'all, but uh, it's going good. Uh, how about for you? Are you ready for this? Ready as I can be for the eight minutes or nine minutes Right. Probably on, so. Well, and that's not too dissimilar with uh, how you split your time on the ground at conferences. You have like, you know, a minute here, true, a minute true, there, true, true, true. always on the go uh, and and always a pleasure. So I'll hand it off to you for uh, a brief talk about licensing with WISE. Okay, so uh, I'm Mike. Uh, many of you will have, uh, will have maybe met me already. Um, at show A, show B, show C, on the phone, by email, whatever. Uh, I handle or I head up the team that handles the licensing at AK. We call ourselves developer relations. 
Uh, some of the people at work call us sales. I don't like that. Um, but today uh, we'll just go through a little bit about uh, actually licensing wise. So the business side of the wise experience, we've gone through a lot of sound design stuff today. We touched on programming stuff today, authoring, WAPI, this and that, some more general sound design principle stuff. And now we get down to some some business and some numbers and it's everybody's favorite thing. And yes, Canadian spelling on favorite there. Um, Love so, it. So the, the, the basics of our license, everything's up on the website. Uh, the basics are at the link there. I'm not going to go to the page and scroll, scroll all through, but it's, it's a simple table. It has our pro tier, which is what we call our level A and level B tier, and then our premium tier, which is for the larger budget games. And then there's also the starter license, which is a free tier for very small budget games who have slightly lower uh, audio needs. So it limits you to uh, 500 assets, but we have hundreds of those projects come through uh, every year. Now, to get more detail on things, though, you go to the second link. Now, you can get that from that first first location by clicking on any of the price numbers. It'll basically get you through to that second one. And this is where it breaks everything down. Uh, those of you who have been with us for longer uh, will remember the giant table of numbers that we used to have on our pricing page. And that's more like what this is, only better, or this is better organized. So this goes through the CoreWise license. That's an important part. Um, all of the plugins, so all of the AK plugins that we make, some of them you've seen today. You saw some Reflect stuff earlier. Uh, don't think we really showed off any any other stuff, but Motion is about to be very cool again uh, with, uh, with some of the next-gen console stuff. Uh, Convolution is one that's probably the most, uh, most used of our plugins. Uh, alongside SoundSeed, and we have three SoundSeeds now. Uh, and then all the community or the uh, premium, uh, the preferred partner plugins, uh, which are the McDSPs, the Isotopes, Rev, uh, Krotos Igniter you saw earlier, and then some of the community stuff, which is uh, smaller plugins. Um, some of them may not be available on every platform, but these are things like Audio Wind, Audio Rain. Uh, we have a polyspectral um, multiband compressor available there everything's worth checking out and uh, as we saw with the gme demo earlier adding any of those plugins to try out with your project is super easy um, that pricing page also covers support which is an important part that guillaume just uh, covered a little bit and then extraneous stuff like uh, like dlc um, but the important thing to know here is that when you look at that page it makes everything look like it goes in steps or as kramer might say levels we want to really make sure you understand it is a bit more of a curve. Uh, so the more you talk with us, the more curvy those steps may become. So if you have a budget that is just going into one of the upper tiers and you're trying to target three, four or five platforms, make sure we know that. Don't just say, I got a big budget because Guess what? If you tell me you got a big budget, I'm probably not going to try to give you too much of a discount. Uh, but if you tell me that you got a situation, we'll work through that situation. Uh, and we kind of see it a philosophical value to wise. We don't just see it as, again, like I say, list price and you're done with it. No, it's one or two platforms, maybe 1% of your budget, of your production budget. Again, we don't care about the amount you're spending on marketing or the bosses Ferrari, don't care. Um, when you get into three or four platforms, that nudges up a little bit, maybe one and a quarter percent. And then if you're saying we're targeting eight platforms, then yeah, we might be talking more like one and a half percent. But list price will always be the ceiling. Obviously, we can't ever charge you more than what it says on the website, but we can definitely charge you less if it makes sense to do that. And that's the big thing. We will work with you to make sure things make sense in the context of your game, your budget, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, the key thing here on the bottom. It's ask and you may receive. Because you say, hey, can you give me something? Doesn't mean you're going to get it. Uh, without naming names, I did have one case where we were dealing with a, a company that had a multi-hundred million dollar budget. And then they said, so what are you going to give me as a discount? And I just had to laugh at them on the phone because <laughs> they did not need it. <laughs> I would always much rather give... 10 discounts to indie studios versus one discount to a triple a 
Now we do have, uh, for, for teams that have either like no money at all, uh, but are still trying to make a game that doesn't want to fit within the context of that free license. We do have a royalty model right now. It is simple in that it's 1% of your gross sales, so it kind of maps along with how Unreal handles their, their 5%. You get all the platforms with it. You don't get any plugins. You have to buy those separately, which usually means those teams aren't using any plugins. The reporting is a bit complex, uh, and larger teams definitely never want to go down this road. It's basically telling us what you've sold on every platform. And there's no cap. So if you happen to be a team of three and you make a game that generates $100 million somehow, then yes, you would you would be giving us a million dollars. Needless to say, it's not the most used business model we have. We probably have about 60 or 70 titles on it now. And uh, most have given us zero dollars because there is definitely a floor to what you pay on that one. Um, we are in the process of introducing something new though. More and more games are going free to play and games as a service. I can't remember, I guess it was uh, when we were talking with the, the massive team uh, earlier today, Damien, you mentioned that they were, uh, they were kind of a service game. Or no, sorry, Borderlands, you were talking about service games. And more and more games are these service games, these games where instead of we release a game and then next year we release the sequel and so on and so forth, it's this is our game for the next X years. We want to get it in front of as many eyes as possible, uh, on as many devices as possible. Maybe you pay something up front. Maybe it's free to play. It might be a mobile game. It might be an everything game. This new model that we have simplifies things a lot because one of the problems with the service games is that every year you got to think about well do we need a new dlc license do we need continued support are we adding any platforms oh do we really want to pay for you know sound seed grain on this oh geez we've already bought a license the games as a service model uh simplifies all that so basically you don't pay anything up all the way through until launch um when you get to launch you can then if you have third-party plugins uh those you have to pay for we we can't give those away they aren't ours to give but if you're using any of audio kinetics plugins that would be included in this license you want to ship on 10 platforms go ahead and do it uh, and the reporting will be it's not available yet but the reporting will be basically on a monthly basis just telling us what tier you ended up in um everywhere from a zero dollar tier, which is the way we're looking at it right now. If you're generating less than $100,000 a month, don't pay us. Uh, so if you're making a small mobile game, this might be your way to get a free license. But if you're generating $100 million a month, no, you won't be giving us a million dollars a month. God, I wish. But um, <laughs> it, 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 the top tier does cap out. So those super, super successful games those uh like like a division like a borderlands if they were on this kind of model they would probably be just capping that out and more likely they would be saying how about we don't report anything on that monthly basis and just let us buy it out for a year or for three years at a time uh, so this is a new thing that uh, we have a couple of teams signed on for it now but uh it'll really be rolling out more over the over the next couple months um, awesome and uh the other really important thing I want to say, because I get this constantly, and I don't really honestly know the best way to uh, explain it other than maybe on a live stream with uh, 150 or so people watching. So your license is done. It finished. And you're freaking out because, hey, you just went to build your sound banks and uh, they failed. Well, first off, take a breath. It's all cool. The first thing you need to do is go to your project page and check, is there a new license key already there for me? Because we do send a notification email out to all the project members, but that gets sent from our central server with sometimes one person, sometimes 38 people, all getting individual mails with the exact same text, which means spam filters. Um, so you might not have gotten the notification that uh, that the new key is there, but it more than likely is. Um, so you just go and you update it. And this is where the wise launcher really comes in uh, and is awesome because if you have linked your license key to your project through the wise launcher, uh, beside your project, there's a little key icon. That is how you do that. Then you'll get a notification jewel on that when a new key is available. So you should always know. 
But if for some reason I've missed it or one of my colleagues on my team has missed it and the thing is actually expired, just go to your project page into the licensing section, click on contact your DevRel rep and say, what the hell? And, uh, and we will get you all set up unless there's a really good reason to let it expire, as in you haven't given us any money. Um, so, yeah, so that's the important thing to know with what happens when your license stops working. Uh, and I think that is the end for me. And since we're not actually doing questions, don't worry about the questions section. But you got my email there, and you can also ping me on Twitter. Some of you prefer to do that. Uh, every so often, people write me on LinkedIn. I don't go there very often, so you might be waiting a long time for an answer there. And I don't Insta, sorry. That's all good. Hey, Mike, so great to have the overview of that. Uh, what I love about it the most is that it's, uh, you know, it, it really is an artistic process. I can hear the artistry in your voice as uh, that business relations. Uh, you're trying to um, trying to find the right the right solution for folks out there, uh, and and that really well, the comes interesting through. thing. I was on a call with someone just a couple of days ago, and I was you know talking him through how much his game might end up costing him, and this guy was pure business. He was not a not a sound person. He wasn't the producer on the game. He was just the money guy. And he's like, I don't understand. What do you mean you don't have this like written down on the site? I'm like, because your situation is different than God of War, than Assassin's Creed. Let's talk. Let's let's get through this. Maybe maybe it'll be less. Like if you were just going putting something into your budget, add it all up from the from the pricing page and say this is the most it will cost us. Yeah. And then go and be the savior to your team when you've budgeted 12 grand and you end up coming in at 10 two and you go, Hey, I saved us 1800 bucks. Take me to dinner. Bam. I'm going to get reality. Cool. Okay. Yep. Thanks for being part of it today. No problem at all. Uh, and thanks for being part of the live stream. Good to see you. See you guys. Yeah. Hi everyone. Cool. So that was Mike Drummelsmith talking about wise licensing. Again, a valuable perspective to have on the live stream. I really appreciate, uh, yeah, all of the people who we work here at Audio Kinetic. Uh, they just bring so much creativity to the role, and we are a creative art uh, and a creative software company who's who's working creatively to be creative. Yeah. That's exactly what I was trying to say. And speaking of that, I'd like to introduce Natalie Bouchard. Natalie is uh, leading our education and certification initiatives here at Audio Kinetic. So welcome to the live stream, Natalie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on you. Yeah. Hello. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. Yeah. How's it going out there? It's good. I'm, I can say I'm a little nervous, but at the same time, I'm excited. So it's both uh, emotion at the same yeah. time. Well, we're going to have t-shirts too. Yes, I have my t-shirts. And that's why I have my ears, my cat ears that to go with, with my t-shirt. Excellent. Excellent. And so you're going to talk us through some of the educational initiatives that we have out there in the WISE ecosystem at large. Yes. Uh, I'm excited about that. You're getting your presentations uh, shared over uh, over in the okay, presentations so. room, and that's super exciting to be working with so much technology. How does there get to be so much technology in the world? Oh, wait. Okay, that's kind of so, what we do. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just, I just need to understand how to share, yep. actually. It's that little arrow in the middle with the square yes around I, I it. did it mm -hmm. okay uh, i don't see it yet but uh, i'm patiently waiting i'm optimistic <laughs> i think we'll get there i see it maybe coming it has arrived ah it has arrived as have you and so with that i will leave it to you Thank and you. hand you over to your presentation. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Talk to you soon. 
Well, hello, everybody. I'm, as I said, very excited and nervous at the same time to be here. Um, you may have seen me before at uh, GDC. Uh, you know, I was at the reception desk giving you t-shirts, tools, socks, managing the beer event too. And uh, as uh, Damien mentioned, I'm also taking care of the education and online certification, all the program I also manage. All the, the educational program for schools, teachers, students, and of course, audio professional. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit to you, to you about that. So what is the audio kinetic educational program? It's, you know what, education has always been very, very important at audio kinetic. Um, we, beyond the free academic license, we, we want to give back to the community and help people on their interactive audio learning journey. So when we decided to create online courses back in 2014, if I remember well, the objective was to lower the, the bar to entry and make the learning material free, not only for schools, but also for individuals wanting to learn wise by themselves online. And as you see, everything is free. Free wise learning material, free academic license for schools and students, and free wise learning curriculums for schools teaching wise. Um, so about this, the uh, academic license for schools, it's kind of easy. All you have to do is register your school via the Educinetic website, create the course, and then you'll have access to the academic license with no sound limit. So not only schools can download the free wise learning material, but also they have that free academic license and they get listed on the creator's directory. So uh, I'll talk about the creator's directory a little later. Um, so students can go to the creator's directory again and search for a school teaching wise in uh, their area by city, by country, it's very easy to find. And uh, so it's easy as we are, as do re me, or one, two, three. Um, online certification. <laughs> we have four online certifications. Uh, again, everything, all the material is free. We have the WAS WISE uh, 101, which is about WISE fundamental basic uh, information of WISE. Uh, the tool one, which is to help composer to understand more about WISE interactive music or mu interactive music in WISE, I should have said. Um, WISE 251 is about performance optimization uh, on any platform. And the WISE 301 is about unity integration. And I will have a special guest, guest right after me, giving you more information on each of them right uh, So stay tuned. But I would, what I would like to tell you about uh, those uh, certifications is that, or the learning material is that, that you can do it online, it's free, you can do it at uh, your own pace. It takes about 16 to 20 hours to go through each certification. Lessons and quizzes are linked together for a better understanding of the concept demonstration, demonstrated sorry, within the lesson. And there are related videos that do not replace the lessons nor quizzes. They are more like a complementary material. So again, learning material is free. If you want to get certified and get listed on the creator's directory, you have to take a D exam. Um, but otherwise, it's free. One thing that is very uh, important for us at the Duke Kinetic is the Certified Instructor Program. Uh, in a nutshell, the certified instructors program are well certified instructors are endorsed by audio kinetic to teach wise if you are seeking to become a wise certified instructor you must attend and pass a four-day program focused on instructional techniques and a deeper understanding of wise as it relates to the wise one-on-one -on -one learning material the four-day program is given by video conference, and it takes place on Mondays and Tuesdays over two consecutive weeks. Uh, so it's easy even now during the, the, the pandemic, you know, you can, you, can, <laughs> you can do it from home or even on the beach. I mean, wherever you can have access to, uh, on, uh, to uh, internet uh, to do it. 
Uh, and of course, to be able to participate, you must obtain the WISE one-on-one -on -one certification, the basic. If you want to teach it, you, want, you, you need to know it. Um, we run the program uh, every three to four months, and there's a, a, a capacity of six participants per session, so small groups. Um, and the next one is in May, but it's too late to participate, but most probably the next one will be in August. And uh, I will share a link uh, to get more information about the program at, uh, and dates at the end of my presentation. And one of the benefits to become uh, a WISE certified instructor is not only, of course, you get certified, you get uh, listed, I'm sorry, on the famous creators directory, but the school or schools, uh, your teaching app would automatically become certified schools. That means that if you teach at multiple schools, all of them will become certified schools. So it's a kind of an argument if you, you are a teacher and you want to uh, teach uh, in more than one school. So that can give you like a, a plus. And the other plus is the WISE uh, certification, the 110. Though the students who studies with study with a certified instructor can acquire the WISE 110 certification uh, along there was WISE 101 certification and it's a plus for the students certified and of course listed on the creators, creators directory. Uh, everything for a deeper understanding of WISE. Uh, numbers, I have a few numbers for you, uh, interesting ones. Uh, so there's 295 schools right now that, that are teaching WISE around the world. 33 of them are certified schools. Uh, about the online education, 16,000 users have started a certification since the start of the online certification. 200 new users every week are starting the certification. And from the 16,000 users, uh, we have 1,500 who got certified, meaning that they validate their knowledge and they pass any uh, of the exam uh, of all the any online certifications. And we have 56 Y certified instructor right now. Uh, you may ask why there's a discrepancy between the schools, the number of schools and the number of Y certified instructors. So there's, there is a lot of uh, certified instructors that actually they they, they are within like a game developers and they, they help other around the, like within the, the company with why. So that's why the different discrepancy uh, is there. And as I said, everything is around the world. And just to give you an idea uh, of what I'm talking about when I say around the world is here is a, vi a visual that speaks to itself. So this is a map of the world and the red dots represent like a uh, all this, the, the users that have started a, uh, an online certification, sorry, <laughs> I'll take a breath, an online certification. And the, the green one is uh, represent the, the ones that have, uh, that are certified. So, so you see where the people, more a lot of people in Europe, a, a lot of people in the United States, a lot of people in Asia as well, China, Japan. So it's good to see in a nutshell, how it looks. Um, and because we are, uh, you know, it's an online expo, I have a special bonus. And so, what is this? So, take your, grab your pencils, your notepad, take note. So, I have a 20%, 20% off, but of what? <laughs> it's of all the certification exam. There's a fee, the rest is free, but the, 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 there's a fee for the, uh, the D exam, but for today, I have a 20% off when you purchase any certification exams, 101, 201, 251, and 301. Uh, there's, when you buy the uh, exam, you, there is no deadline to take uh, the, the, the certification, so you can buy it now and take it in six months, 12 months, it's, there's no problem. The only deadline is uh, the code. <laughs> so the code will be valid until May, 31st, so end of May. Um, and community, yeah. I talked to you about the creators directory. So just 
what is it exactly? It's a place to, to seek and be seen for schools, for certified users, for content providers. So there's there are three lists. There's a list for uh, schools, licensed schools, certified schools. Students can go and, and, and look for a, a school to teach uh, that teach us in their area. Uh, all the certified users are listed there as well. And last but very not least, the content provider list is a place for developers from indies to AAA studios to find audio professionals with wide experience. You can help them with their game audio or you, as a content provider, can register and get listed on this directory. Um, something else regarding uh, for a, a education from the community, because as you may have noticed that, uh, notice, I'm sorry, that uh, we are committed to our community and we are always tr try to find new ways to help you. So to help you teachers, students and schools with any support related questions, I do receive a lot of questions technical questions where sometimes I, I you know, I have to ask because I, I'm not, sorry, I'm not that technical, I can help, but not when it's too technical. So now we have the, the, the community Q&A uh, that can help you with that kind of question. So you go on the, the, the community Q&A, you look, of course, first, if there's a um, already like a top, um, a question on your topic, and if not, you post your question there. And the good, the good news is that we now have a resource dedicated to answer questions from for you students and for you school, for you teachers. So um, another, another thing for you guys <laughs> to help you. So recap, quick one, free academic license for school, free learning material for schools and individuals, four WISE online certifications, WISE, one WISE certified instructor program, Get listed on the creator's directory, post your technical questions on the community Q&A. All about education. Uh, and here's my, the list, my resources. Damien, will that, uh, those resources will be sent or yeah, we'll, be somewhere? Yeah, we'll have a follow-up blog post uh, that, that'll list those Perfect. resources. Uh, and, and really, Natalie, think of that. The main point of access for most of this is right through the website. Uh, you land at yes. audiokinetic.com and the resources that you're talking about, the certifications, uh, the community Q&A, the creators directory, these are all linked off of our homepage. Uh, and that's your one-stop shop to start digging in on this educational side of things. Uh, Yep. Thanks so much for the discount codes. We've got folks in the chat room who are lighting <laughs> up like, yeah, I'm into that. <laughs> this good, feels good. like the right time. And uh, it's great to see uh, it's great to see you uh, every year at uh, at the conference. I would show up and, <laughs> and see your smiling face. I'm so glad uh, to mm -hmm. have you here as part of the live stream today. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. and, and don't hesitate to send me an email if ever you have any question on the education and part education program. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. See you soon. All right. So that was Natalie Bouchard. She gave us an overview of a lot of the educational ecosystem and initiatives that we have here at Audio Kinetic. Uh, fantastic overview. Moving swiftly on, uh, following quickly on her heels, I'm going to have Robert Brock presenting on the certifications piece of what Natalie was talking about. I'm just queuing that up here and putting that in focus. Thanks for joining me today, Brock. How's it going? Fantastic, Damon. How do you do? I'm doing fantastic as well. And you're down you in... Yeah. I'm down in Arizona where it's 104 degrees Fahrenheit or otherwise known as 40 degrees Celsius for, for most of you. It's only April. Can you believe it? Wow. That, yeah, that yeah. escalated quickly. <laughs> yes. Yes, it did. It went very quickly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Hey, and I, hey, Damien, I just want to say you're doing an amazing job of facilitating this whole thing. And so Thanks. one of my roles is I'm the director of education at a school called the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences. Uh, we're a partner with Audio Kinetic and uh, work to create the certification program. 
uh, with Audio Kinetic uh, and have been teaching it since 2007. Something else I teach, though, is audio for live television broadcast. Ah. And, and to know what you're dealing with right now <laughs> to facilitate getting 20 people online, getting line checks and screen shares and doing the lower thirds and all this kind of stuff, you are literally doing the work of 10 different jobs simultaneously. I bow down to you. Thank you. Thanks for that. And, uh, oh, and, and being the on-air talent. Let's not forget oh, that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Got it. Well, it it uh, it's it's been a great time. We're at the top of hour five, and I couldn't feel better about this. Uh, it's a small price to pay, right? At at the at GDC, you know that we rage for like days and days yeah. in this same capacity, and so. A few hours here or there on a Wednesday, it's pretty casual, right? Yeah. Right on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Well, we'll your presentation queued up, and I'll let you take it away. Uh, talk. Yeah. Let's talk about certifications. Yeah, so let's expand a little bit on what Natalie was just talking about as far as the certification program. Uh, to get to the certification course materials, the, the key thing is that Natalie talked about is from the beginning, the goal was to make the materials accessible so that anybody could get started on WISE. And so when it comes to accessing those materials, you know, just on Audio Kinetic's main website, it's pretty simple. I want to learn something. And so you just go to learn. You say, I just want to learn WISE. And that's going to bring you into the, uh, this kind of environment where you can scroll down and you'll see the four different certification programs that Natalie just mentioned. Here's the WISE 101, the 201, the 251, and the 301. Um, so first of all, to understand like who would be interested in, in utilizing this, uh, you know, I even saw like in the comments, a lot of people, people use it. A lot of people think that the certification program content might be for just students. Uh, but in fact, there's a lot of industry professionals that use it to get acquainted with WISE. I know it might be hard to believe that there's people out there that may still not be familiar with WISE that are already in the game audio industry. Uh, but oftentimes, this is a first step for them. And when we wrote the course materials, we wrote it with the idea that somebody has an understanding of audio, uh, but we're not going to assume they have a background in game audio. But we also wanted to balance it and not make it so fundamental that an experienced game audio integrator would just be kind of bored to tears. And so if somebody has that background, but they just don't necessarily know the environment of WISE, um, then this will get them up to speed equally as well. And for example, the WISE 101 course here is really designed to get you through the fundamental ideas of putting sound into a video game from scratch. We use an open source game called Cube. Uh, and so you, we take the game, we start with absolutely no sound at all. And if you were just to click into the get certified materials, the way all the courses are actually laid out uh, is uh, in the materials here. Oops, I'm sorry, 201 looks like. Back out of that. Uh, in the, ooh, he's out of control. By certifications, there we go. Uh, if we click on get certified, uh, you'll see that it's broken down into multiple chapters. And the chapters are based around kind of workflow concepts that are really ubiquitous across any type of game integration. It's not, it's, it's not a, an explanation of what the, the WISE features are. It's built around, here's something that we all need to accomplish in game audio integration. Oh, and by the way, this is how you do it in WISE. That's kind of the flavor that it's written from. And so if we click here, for example, on starting on lesson one, then on the left-hand side over here, you'll see just a breakdown of the different chapters and the different materials. And everything is really written from this perspective of, here's the idea of what we need to accomplish conceptually. Um, here's how we're going to go about it. And here are the step-by-step -step, uh, things that you have to do in order to accomplish that. And you just compare your work against the screenshots. And you just move your way through the material step-by-step. -step, and it's very easy to follow material. Uh, the, uh, you could uh, probably move through the 101 course material in, an, in a couple days. I mean, if you committed yourself over a weekend, you could move through the 101 course material. We have a lot of game developers that, uh, as they onboard somebody into their team, if they don't have a background or experience with WISE, or actually have those people take the WISE certification just so that they know the baseline understanding of what that person should know once they get to the end of it. You know, terminology, concepts, layouts, all that kind of good stuff um, is all going to be discussed in there. I want to uh, I want to interject because, like, yeah. I'm imagining a Jackbox integration to this certification program. Like, this could be a party game. Game audio party you know, game. Yeah, I was actually noticing in the comments, like, somebody talking about how they kind of use it as a tool around game jams and things like that. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and so the nice thing is, at the end of every lesson, 
you know, uh, the last step is to always build your work into the playable version of a game. Uh, so there's a degree of satisfaction. It's, it's like, that's the whole goal. That's why we're doing this, to play games, not just to, you know, integrate and code stuff or something like that. And so that's the trophy at the end of each one. Um, along the way, um, you can uh, test your knowledge on things. Um, there are uh, related quizzes for any of these items. Uh, if I kind of back up here, uh, you'll see that, uh, 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 for example, uh, you've got uh, at the top of each one of these sections, it'll say start quiz. This is just a fast way to test your knowledge uh, on the materials. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not a graded per se. I mean, you'll see your results. But it's just to kind of test your understanding of the materials. And then as Natalie mentioned, there's, the only cost is when you want to actually become certified. There's, a, there's the certification test. And so there's the exam that's up here. Uh, but you can use the quizzes to kind of see how you would do uh, before taking that final test. Uh, so WISE 101, uh, like I said, is really designed to give you a pretty fair overview of the uh, environment of all things WISE and get you to get familiar, familiar with concepts from switching systems, dealing with real-time parameters, dealing with spatialization concepts. Uh, a big emphasis is on things like optimization. Uh, and a lot of people that are new to game audio integration, that's not something they've ever really had to think about before is this idea of optimization. Uh, and so uh, once you get done with that, uh, then, you can have the opportunity to move on to other tiers of certification. Uh, a lot of people, perhaps even on this call, are composers. Uh, and so that's really, after we completed the WISE 101 course creation, uh, the next big thing that everybody was asking us about was, what about game audio integration uh, for music applications? Uh, and so we built the 251 course materials, I'm sorry, the 201 course materials, all around interactive slash dynamic music systems. And because there is a lot to conceptually understand around this. If you're, if you're a composer that's coming from more of a linear-based medium for television or film, uh, this course will change how you think about your compositional phase. The more you know about how dynamic and interactive music works, and the more you know about the mechanics of how it works, the more it will change how you think about things literally as you're just conceiving your ideas. Uh, and that's what I, I really kind of, a, proud of about the course is to try to expose that creative mentality uh, about things. Um, same idea as you move into the 201 course, same flavor. It's here's the idea that we need to accomplish. Uh, you know, for example, I, I heard, you know, I heard the guys talk, a gearbox type, you know, talking about how, oh, some of the music we do is kind of the boxcar mentality of you have chunks of music that you want to reassemble, you know, kind of resequence or rearrange. So we explore those principles. There's an entire lesson just devoted to that concept. Uh, then there's the other approach of changing the idea of layering. Uh, some people call this like vertical versus horizontal approaches. And so we really built chapters around these concepts. And then using obviously WISE, we're then you know, uh, 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 creating the end work again within the cube game. Uh, so we're using that same game that you had in the 101 course materials. Uh, we had custom music content, the actual asset files, composed by the great guys at Vibe, uh, Vibe Avenue up in Montreal. Uh, and so it was fantastic because we had all these ideas that we wanted to be able to create and Audio Kinetic was able to literally uh, give us some budget to be able to go in and say, oh, this is the kind of material we need to really demonstrate these, these, these ideas. Uh, and so the material is all original uh, for a custom built game level uh, that uh, again, just uh, exposes these different principles. And then there's also the idea that it's not just about creating music that can change over time, but also having it react to what happens in the game itself. Um, and so that's where we get into the more the interactive nature of things where, um, uh, you know, when such and such happens in the game, how do we use music to, uh, to accentuate that, to deliver more information to the player. Uh, you know, as I'm, as, I'm, as I'm talking to you right now in the, in the green room, so to speak, I see Guy Whitmore, uh, you know, and he's like the master of, of that, uh, utilizing sound and music, music in particular, to change the whole influence of the game. Uh, you know, and so, uh, uh, so anyway, 201 exposes those ideas. Um, as we move into 251, uh, one of the big concepts I mentioned earlier is this need for optimization. Uh, it, doing more with less uh, is a principle that we illustrate in 101, and we felt that it needed a lot more uh, uh, discussion around that. And so uh, Mads, who spoke earlier, uh, created a whole lesson around optimization, um, kind of with a mindset of things like mobile platform development, although not necessarily exclusively mobile platform development. Uh, and that is the first game that features the magnificent um, 
uh, Wise Audio Adventure game. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's also where you can get a taste, just a little bit of a taste in the 251 of uh, Unity integration, because you're actually putting Unity into your um, system uh, and you're using that as, as, the, as the beginning point. It doesn't focus on that specifically, but it is using uh, the WAG game uh, in order to be able to uh, uh, demonstrate those ideas. So you get kind of a new game to start to play with. And then um, uh, that naturally then leads into actual certification course around Unity integration. And again, that was also created by MADS. Uh, and I will tell you, um, I have like no coding background. I had no background really in using middleware systems or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, I was involved a little bit on, on just kind of the, the quality assurance kind of side of things and just kind of reviewing uh, the content even before it came out. And I will tell you what, it's like I just learned, you know, I felt I, I was it, it, with zero level knowledge, no background whatsoever. And I was able to take that course and feel comfortable. And it's like, oh, yeah. I would feel comfortable in doing a Unity based project now. I wouldn't be, you know, scared of that. And so, in that, I mean, he's describing everything from, you know, um, you know, the, the the hooks, you know, and how games build. And I'll tell you, even if you don't work in Unity, uh, just if you're coming into this and you're trying to better understand how things get wired up between the actual game engine itself and Wise, it really exposes a lot of ideas uh, in that. And and so. Again, each of these levels of certification, same format, same kind of uh, uh, written material flow to the material. Uh, and then it always has the, uh, the support quizzes that you can take. And then those can also lead to um, certification. Uh, and, uh, and since it was mentioned earlier, we're talking about the creator's directory. Uh, uh, where that actually is found is, you know, again, just right straight back in the Audio Kinetic homepage. Um, if you go to community and you go to creator's directory, uh, then here uh, you can look at certified users. And so, for example, if I want to look at all these users are certified in 101, 201, and you can search people's names. It's a nice credential, uh, you know, for uh, people, resume booster, uh, and, uh, and it just kind of speaks to your accomplishment. So I've said a lot pretty fast. I've been trying to go quick because I know we're trying to make up some time here. But, uh, 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 you, know, uh, you know, it's fantastic. And I think one of the things you hit on, Brock, is just that the – Synergy between a tool likewise, we have this authoring environment, right? And like a DAW, it's completely contained experience. Uh, where it really gets interesting is that game engine integration, right? So you have the 101 and the 201 that start building skills. Uh, and then you have that game engine integration coming in at 251 and 301. Uh, that fills that out, right? So it puts in application what you've been learning. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, All right. Well, fantastic. I appreciate you walking us through that stuff. Uh, it got mentioned in the chat room that you're uh, the, the voice of some of these uh, tutorials on uh, the YouTube yes, channel. If Yes, if uh, my voice sounds familiar, then uh, yes, uh, there's uh, we did a lot of different video content, as Natalie talked about, that's designed to kind of supplement the course materials. It's it's not necessarily showing going through the course materials, uh, yep. but the 101 and 201 series uh, support tutorial videos. Yes, yes, recorded right here in this very room. Yes. Ta-da! <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Right. Well, Brock, thanks so much for your part of this. Again, it's been a great block of education and certifications. You've played such a, a critical role in, in helping to promote this education, both through the work that you do on the ground, uh, as well as uh, you know online as part of Audio Kinetic and, uh, and a wise developer. It's great to see you. I feel we're kindred spirits, likewise to you. And by the way, I heard you mention earlier the Commodore 64 said 64 chip. Oh, I had yeah, to break it out. Nice. Yeah, oh, that still in my closet. That rainbow All warms right. my heart. Love you, Damien. Appreciate it. Love Thanks. you too. Take care, Brock. <laughs> See you soon. All right. So that was Robert Brock talking certifications. Ta-da. We are moving swiftly through the fifth hour of this live stream extravaganza. Uh, How's everyone holding up out there? Uh, things good? Um, looking at the schedule. What is next? Where even am I? Uh, what's cool is we're just going to jump into the previews section. Uh, and this is what it's going to look like. I've got uh, 
Andy Vaughn in the green room waiting to step in and do some dancing for us around Dolby. Uh, then I got some cool and exciting new uh, experiments to put in front of you, uh, stuff that has never been seen before. And then we'll round up this section with a talk with, uh, with Remy McGill about our UI and UX evolving uh, process. So with that, I'm going to move on to uh, introduce uh, Andrew Vaughn from Dolby. Uh, welcome to the live stream, Andy. How's it going? Hey, Damien. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Yes. <laughs> you know, I heard you say I was going to do some dancing. I should warn people. I won't be doing any dancing. You don't want to see that. No dancing. Sorry. No. <laughs> uh okay great well so uh, uh yeah so sorry i just uh your presentation is staged and ready and right. this is just now up to me to figure out uh where i've gone wrong in my life <laughs> uh, after five hours i question that a lot <sighs> okay yeah i have been questioning this uh Okay, we're going to call this my first official hiccup. How's that? Uh, so, with that, I'm going to put a magic... Oh, yeah. Put this magic link into here. And you're going to jump over into this new Hangout only because of a major oversight on my part. So, I'll see you in the other Hangout. How's that sound? Give me just a second. Yeah. So video or, video or presentation in that hangout? Just your video camera and and oh. beautiful self. <laughs> You're too kind, Damien. Uh-huh. <laughs> we'll probably get some doubling here when I first join in. I'll drop the other one once you pick me up. Bam. Bam. Bam, indeed. Okay. And with that, we go back to... Oh, it's like you just got here, same as it ever was. And from there, <sighs> I hand you off to your presentation. Thanks so much for being here, Andy. Thanks, Damien. It's great to be here. And thanks, everybody, for your time today. I know I'm the gate between some cool new experimental stuff. So I'm going to be quick. I'm going to talk about how we're working with our partners a little bit in evolving game audio. So let's just jump right in. What do you say? Yeah. There we go. So, you know, just to kind of give you the basics here, Dolby's been around for 50 years. We've got 50 years of practice doing the, uh, this, the science of sight and sound. Um, traditionally, we prove a lot of our technologies out in the cinema. Those are environments that we can control. Those are environments that we can actually measure our results and make sure we're getting the things that we're looking for. Um, and that really helps us refine uh, what we offer when we extend those out into the home, into the larger ecosystem. So the audio formats we've played around with for the last 50 years have evolved a lot, obviously. Um, and these days, you know, we've gone from stereo to surround sound. We're working in a new form of surround sound now that we call Dolby Atmos. Uh, and Dolby Atmos, to give you the quick elevator pitch, it brings game audio to a new level. It brings all audio to a new level, but game specifically. Uh, and where surround sounds traditionally been delivered on a horizontal plane, Dolby Atmos gives you the, the, the ability to play back audio with height and with dynamic objects as well. And that allows content creators to render any sound with 3D precision anywhere around the end user, which is pretty impressive. The effects are pretty dramatic and they're pretty amazing. I'm biased, but I get to see a lot of the content as well. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll get to content in just a moment. Before we go too far here, you should know that the team that I'm on, small but mighty, there's six of us in San Francisco and, and Tokyo. I um, mean, we really handle all of, of worldwide game developer relations. So if you're thinking that's the greatest gig in the world, you would be right. Um, at Dolby, one of the things that makes this fun is that games are a perfect fit for our technology, a dynamite fit. And if you just look at the basics, Games are built in 3D, and as we have an audio technology that shows off 3D, that's kind of a nice match. Games are also built with audio objects and always have been. So again, gosh, 
what a great match. So when we give a technology like Dolby Atmos to game studios, they come back and surprise us to death. We've heard a lot of really great content, but every time we hear a new game come out, we see a studio do something that we never even expected before. Um, and, you know, the current crop of Atmos games are incredibly immersive and very tactile for players. So we're excited about that. Um, okay. So hopefully you're seeing a timeline here. My internet stinks, so maybe you're not. Bear with me. Um, we've, we've really been honored to, to work with some of the biggest studios and all of the major OEMs over the years here. And, you know, you'll see, hopefully, in this timeline that we've been able to, to really offer technology at points along the way with new consoles and with noteworthy titles that really, you know, give developers and give audio designers especially the ability to deliver the full intent of their experience. Um, and you may have noticed on the tail end of that timeline, it looks like it stopped. Um, Dolby, uh, sorry, Xbox One S and One X are both at the end of that timeline, and of course that's not the end of time, but that for us is a point of inflection with Atmos because both of those consoles were the first to offer a spatial audio platform that could deliver a Dolby Atmos performance in room to consumers, and we're, you know, we're honored to be able to work with Microsoft. And so, really the story of how Dolby Atmos works in your games is much more a story about how the Microsoft platform works and supports spatial audio. And so, instead of saying Dolby, 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 now I will in a minute, well, let's talk about Microsoft first. All right, there we go. So, you know, initially when we came up with this technology, we had some game studios who really wanted to use it. And certainly we were happy to give them the libraries and have them build it in, and they certainly did. But it took a lot of work. It took an immense amount of work. And, you know, it's, it became a high level of effort that we were worried was going to become available only to the triple A-est of triple A's. I, I doubt I'm the first person to ever say triple A-est, but if, if I am, copyright. That was legit. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, okay, so, you know, we had this direct integration path, but when Microsoft stepped up and launched the spatial audio platform, that accelerated things for us like you wouldn't believe. Um, and we've enjoyed great experiences as a result. And really, you know, that's because the platform provides a lot of uniformity. It provides a lot of efficiency to get people past this direct code integration pathway and use APIs instead. Um, moreover, there's some other benefits here as well. For developers especially, we should talk about the costs. And that's one of these. It costs you nothing to use the spatial audio APIs from Microsoft. And there's no licensing fees at all for Dolby Atmos to play back in the living room. So zero and zero, nobody likes zero until they don't have to pay it. And I think that's right where we want to be. The Dolby mantra here is that we don't want to charge content creators to create their content. We'll make our licensing up elsewhere. So great. Best of all to us also, you know, once a platform comes up that's supported on Windows 10 PCs, and that's all Windows 10 PCs, plus the entire Xbox One family of devices, that exposes over a billion users. That's billion with a B. I can't even conceptualize how many people that is, but that's a pretty amazing technical, uh, uh, total addressable market. So, you know, it's worth paying attention to that anybody with a stereo headphone port can experience spatial audio today on Microsoft's platforms. So then, we should probably take a quick look at what it takes to enable spatial audio and wise. And again, I will thank you folks at Audio Kinetic for making this as easy as possible because my code chops are not what they were. Um, it takes that. So as long as you've downloaded a copy of the Microsoft Spatial Sound Platform plugin in your WISE install, you're ready to get to work. From there, you go to your master bus and you add an audio device share set for the Microsoft Spatial Sync. And you can see it depicted here as the Microsoft Spatial Sound Platform output. Um, and once you have that all wired up and ready to go, you're ready to get to work. A footnote here. You'll notice I'm showing eight channels because at home I'm one of those poor souls that only works in 512. I know, smallest violin, right? If you were plugging into a 714, you'd have you'd have 12 channels here. For now, I have the eight. So just imagine a couple of extra channels shown in the meter there if we were hooked up correctly. Um, the reference environment, in fact, is 714 for the spatial audio platform. So you should be seeing 12 channels in the meter there. Um, additionally, anything past this really is in an engine integration. Um, and I've left a link down at the bottom of the page there to show what a typical Unreal Wise integration looks like and where the code calls go to, to instantiate the, the spatial audio engine with Microsoft to make sure that works correctly. I kind of feel like that's outside of the scope of this, so I'm going to move on. Um, so, all right, great. Now that you have Wise configured, and that was 
ton of work, right? The remainder of the work really involves thinking about how you're going to route your, your signal audio. I mean, that's pretty much it, your audio signal. I'm backwards. And so I want to show you a couple of the of the, the models that we've seen so far and the ones that have seen success. But before we do that, I should talk about what the traditional game audio workflow looks like. And of course, you're used to this, right? This isn't news to anybody on the stream. You know, you have your your average seven one panners built in. <laughs> average. You have your standard seven one panners built in. Going to a seven one master bus, a little bit of DSP sprinkled in for good measure, and then routing out to either home theater or headphones, where things get mixed down to two channels. And that's the way audios worked for a very long time. Simple and straightforward. And this is that point where I talk about we use the stack that you've been using all this time because once you once you turn on that spatial output, you get this. And really. All you've done is expand your panners to 714 and your master bus to 714, giving you the height plane now with that last dot four. Pretty easy. And when it comes out the other end now, you'll output to any, any home theater output over HDMI. Here I'm showing 714. Know that the platform's smart, smart enough to do some endpoint detection. And if I'm only playing in stereo, no problem. It folds down into stereo, no work needed from you. Moreover, we push spatial audio now out to headphones as well, and with a couple of renderers out there, which I'll we'll talk about in just a moment, um, you're able to get the full spatial audio performance over your favorite headphones today as well. So that's pretty cool, and that's what's you know known between us and Microsoft as the easy button integration. Turn it on, let it rip. Um, but there could be some fallbacks here. For instance, you're seeing that your music is being spatialized in 714, and pardon me for pointing this way, my display monitor's over there. <laughs> You notice your music's being output in full spatialized. Well, maybe you didn't compose with the idea of being in spatial, and so maybe that gives you some weird effects, and you want to keep that under control. So there are options here. And the first one that we see is the dual mix bus strategy. So one spatialized bus, one non-spatialized bus. For developers, this gives them a great way to constrain content and hold it down to the horizontal plane. If you want things in stereo, if you want things not to be spatialized, this is a great way to exert control over those two different presentations. Um, and I won't read through the whole chart here for you, but you one of the things I'd like you to notice is that both spatial and non-spatial elements exist at the same time. So if you're playing through the Wasapi endpoint, the, the standard Windows Audio Session APIs for horizontal surround sound, they coexist perfectly with spatial audio endpoints as well, and they play back simultaneously and render as expected. So you have a lot of control in that kind of model. Nine minutes, I should, I should get hurrying, shouldn't I? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, one of the other ways that we've seen developers work is to reverse that a little bit and to create a non-spatial master bus and then instead create objects for dynamic objects with metadata to fly those around the room in 3D precision. Like, you know, obviously a dynamic object is a 3D object. It has full freedom throughout the entire room. Um, you'll notice here that we bypass the mastering bus altogether. So when you do create objects, you have to work a little bit to keep track of what's going on because they're outside of your master mix. But still, you'll see those de delivered in spatial while your master bus is still delivering things in non-spatial. And it gives you another control point. Um, one of the last ones here is the hybrid model. And I think this one has a lot of promise. Um, this shows full spatialization for everything again. Um, your 714 panners are available. Everything works in the, in the 12 channels that we would expect, or eight in my case. Um, but this time, what you're able to do is use dynamic objects to constrain position absolutely. So you're able to keep things on the horizontal plane if you want to as a dynamic object. You're able to fly things overhead as a dynamic object. And for us, this model right here actually represents what we think is, is probably the most efficient way to build a fully spatial game and to call out those little bits and pieces of a game performance that you want your players to pay attention to, be excited by, and remember. It's a great way to call out hero objects. Um, that's, only, that's only a couple of approaches. And you know, I'm sure there's going to be about 25 more in the next couple of years. We'll see. <laughs> but those are, those are the major ones right now. Um, and those seem to be giving us a good amount of efficiency across the ecosystem. And so the question becomes, great, I've routed all my audio, it's coming out in 714, but who's going to hear it like this? And I think that's the right question because we've been guilty in the past of dragging a gigantic 714 system in to do demos, which I love, it's mind-blowing, 
but it's not exactly the, the, the common user's way of playing back. I think, Damien, we've given you the demo on, on the 714 system before, too. Oh, yeah, it's awesome, and I don't have it at home. <laughs> That's okay. It's a monster to set up. You're saving calluses here. It's cool. Um, actually, it's not that bad. It's getting better, but still, you know, 714 is a pretty big buy for a lot of people, and we know that a lot of the people who are buying our games out there are not listening in full home theater environments, and so we've worked after we got started with Microsoft, and probably during, to make sure that we've worked with our OEM ecosystem partners as well, because it's important for us, to, for people to be able to hear this across the range. We don't just want audio files, but we want everybody, and we'll convert them to audio files by doing this, and so you'll notice on this slide here, top right, we show televisions that have Atmos built in. They use the surfaces upon which they're mounted and around them to project sound for height and for precision. And they work astoundingly well. It's creepy how well they work, actually. I, I look for the magician behind it every time. Down left, you'll see a couple of a, a rendering of a soundbar. And again, soundbars jaw-droppingly good and down to price points at about 500 bucks now. So you can spend as much as you want to on soundbars. Sennheiser has a just wonderful one um you know samsung has a bunch of them sony has a bunch of them pick for your budget they do a very good job of atmos but for us at the end of the day headphones is a thing we have to get right um, because we think that's the great unifier across of all all the games and across all the consoles and so again i'll repeat the headphone wrap here which is the window the windows spatial audio platform is capable of outputting a full spatial mix to any set of headphones so you keep your favorite headphones and when you get there, you've got a bunch of different renders available to you. You've got a Windows Sonic one that's free. You've got the premium version, as we call it, shockingly, for a $15 called Dolby Atmos for headphones. Creative, creative naming there. Um, and there are a couple ones out there, too. And we'd encourage everybody to listen to all of them. You know, we won't say one's the best because we're all different, but you should get a chance to listen to all three and see what spatial audio sounds like across any of these points. All right. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least throw this out in front of people because Dolby Atmos games are now starting to win awards. And so if we look at the BAFTAs and we look at the Game Awards this year, you'll notice the three nominees for Best Audio, all Atmos games. The game that swept everything, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, has some of the best foley I've ever heard. And, you know, I, I think the, arm, the, the hair stands up on my arms every time I play that game. It's, it's marvelous. Same with Gears 5. It's a really great precision audio environment to run around and shoot your stuff. So I think we're going to see this trend continue. And I think, you know, if I were to place bets, I would say there are going to be some great games um, in the awards again this year. And I would put the mention of a couple of them out there. Now, this is not promoting one game over another one. These are all marvelous titles to play. I have a lot of fun playing Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I really enjoy wrecking somebody else's car in Fort. So these are all great games. And they're all a lot of fun. But some of the newer ones that I think have done a really amazing job Division Two, um, the guys at Massive went out of the way to build great audio that modeled a, an abandoned Washington DC and as close as that might feel these days, they've done a marvelous job of making an empty DC sound real. Beyond that, they've also given you a way to interpret the threats coming at you, position for all, all the attackers coming at you. It's a, it's a game that really involves you in the action from the word go and it brings your ears into the mix. Huh, audio pun, um, which is an amazing effect. Um, another one I'm going to point out here, and it's one of the newest games, is Ori and the Will of the Wisps. And the reason I point that out is a couple of reasons. One, it's not a game you would look at and say, oh, yeah, that's an immersive 3D title. I think my computer's crashing, so I'll just keep talking. Um, it's not an immersive 3D title per se. It's not a first-person shooter. It's not what you would look at and say, that's an Atmos game, but play the game. Not only is it just beautiful. Just mind-numbingly beautiful. The colors are vibrant. It's a beautiful-looking game. The characters are beautiful and have a great story. But they've also engineered the emotion into the audio as well. And so as you play through this game as a platformer or a side-scroller, you find yourself really falling into it, which I, I have to congratulate Moon Studios for building something that has really defied the way a genre has been seen before. It's an amazing game. I love playing it. I'll stop rambling on. Play or rainbow the best. Um, that's pretty much all I have, and it's just the light touch. So if you have more questions, I'm delighted to talk to anybody out there. Um, and, and there's my email address, so by all means, drop me an email. Don't forget that extra A on, on Vaughn. Um, while that got me in trouble from like first to third grade learning how to write my name, it does not deliver to my email anymore, so real-world impacts. 
Um, if you forget that, if you lose that, if the email bounces for whatever reason, developer.dolby.com is the website where the games team kind of lives and works. There's a contact link at the, at the bottom of every single page, and you can always get a hold of us there. We're looking forward to working with anybody who wants to build in spatial audio or not. We love game developers, so contact us if you need us. And thanks a bunch for the time. Yeah, totally. Andy, uh, It's I think we're... We're convinced people who have heard these things uh, in practice, either locally over headphones or on a real system, um, and Wise makes it easy to author. Um, we, we're seeing the growing number of titles uh, that are starting to take advantage of it. Uh, I'm glad you called out Ori. We're going to have Guy Whitmore on a little bit later, uh, who helped out with the sound for that. And uh, and and again, not a not your typical Atmos title. I'm I'm really glad you mentioned that because there's a huge opportunity space when you start putting uh, more fidelity into the positioning of sound in space. Well, what audio person would not jump at the chance to mess around with that? Absolutely. Right? Cool. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today and uh, and. And talking to us about Atmos, it's available right now. Uh, you shared all the links. Uh, folks can run out and give it all a try. Super stoked. Excellent. Thanks so much for your time today. And thanks for being part of the live stream. It's great. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Cheers. See ya. See you, Damien. And that was Andy. Uh, great to have him on the live stream uh, talking Dolby Atmos. Uh, we're knee deep into our previews and future section. And with that, I will waste no time stepping right into our next uh, section, which is gonna feature Ryan Doan and Sean. Let me get the two of you somehow focused into this magical space that I call home. Uh, almost there. Yeah. I'm actually, Whitmore, I'm going to kick you off for now. Can you come back later? Yeah, you can. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, cool. Uh, and with that, here we go. I've got two of our R&D team specialists. Uh, Sean on the left here is a software developer at AK, engineer. He works on the R&D team, likes to make fun and or useful interactive things. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah, it's very true. I make a point of saying and or useful because it just needs to be fun. I don't care if it's useful, although sometimes I do. Excellent. Uh, and got it covers like games and tools, right? So. Oh, yeah. Both fun and useful. I like that. <laughs> I like it. Uh, we also have Ryan here. He's part and another engineer on the R and D team. Uh, remember that time we were in New York and went to see just like freak out jazz at that school? At the new school, yeah, yeah, oh. that was great. That was mind blowing. Yeah, that was the first time yeah. I, I met you, and uh, <laughs> you were like the center of attention at AES, and then it was like an amazing surprise that you came. Into a to join all you connect. So. Oh man, yeah. we had a good time. It's always a pleasure digging into some weird noise with you. Uh, there's a there's a music channel uh, in the chat through work, and uh, Ryan and Sean are always feeding it with tasty, delicious sounds, along with uh, weird stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Lots of weird stuff. Yeah. Along with the rest of the developers at AK. Uh, so. I'm going to ha let you set up over in the Teams presentation uh, if you have some. I think we actually have a video. Oh, perfect. Uh, so we We're rolling a video, video, right? Yeah, yeah. You're keeping me honest, and I love that. And so, you did a very good job, as, as Brock said. Yeah. Okay. This is a marathon for you, yeah. Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm starting to get a little woo. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so set this up for us. Uh, give us a teaser. What are we about to see. Uh, Sean and I have been working on a, a experimental plugin um, for the past year or so that's um, uh, simple terms is an, an 
upgrade uh, to the original uh, SoundSeed Impact plugin, but it does a whole lot of other things. So uh, this is just a quick rundown of what we think that, like, what it does, what makes it compelling, um, and it's still a teaser, so there's more to come in the future. And like you said, it's a, you're incubating this idea. There's an evolution in process from the original SoundSeed. Uh, it's still a work in progress. And this is really unique for, for us at Audio Kinetic to be sharing something that, that we're working on. It's in development, um, but we're super excited about it. I'm really glad that uh, you put together this presentation. I'm gonna roll that. Let's do it. But today I'm gonna show you some new uh, spatial audio workflows. Oh, yep. Hi, I'm there Ryan. it is. Welcome to our demo for the upcoming Impact plugin. To get started, I've created a sound effects in our default work unit, and I've added Impact as a source. Now you can see the source editor on screen here. I'm going to drag and drop some sounds into the plugin, and they'll be analyzed. Let's have a listen. The analysis separates each sound into an impact and body component. Each play event will randomly select a different impact and body to cross-synthesize. We can see which combination is being played and use the solo button to audition specific combinations. If we don't like a particular combination, it can be excluded as well. Impact 2 has four primary parameters for manipulating the sound. The mass changes the size or weight character of the sound. Velocity reduces the intensity of the impact. Position changes the sound as if the impact were occurring at different parts on the surface. Think of how a drum head sounds different when struck at the edge compared to the middle. Finally, roughness adds a metallic character to the sound. Now let's take a look at what an actual game scenario might look like. Hello, I'm Sean. I've been working on the Impact plugin together with Ryan. I'd like to show how the Impact plugin can be seamlessly integrated into the physics of a game by driving the plugin parameters using RTPCs. First, let's take a walk through the environment. All of the sounds in this environment are generated from instances of impact. As I walk over the different surfaces, a corresponding instance of the impact plugin will cross-synthesize sound files for that material type. My weapon fires projectiles, and I can hold down the fire button to increase the size. When collision happens in the game between two or more objects, each colliding object will trigger a corresponding instance of the impact plugin. The mass and velocity values of each object will be sent to Wise via RTPCs. For most of the impact sounds in the game, the position parameter is randomized to provide further variation between each subsequent playback. However, the position parameter can also be mapped directly from the game in some circumstances. For example, in this environment there are large glass walls that are less resonant in the center and more resonant at the corners and edges. Some of the objects in the world are destructible and the sounds for objects being destroyed are also driven using mass and velocity. The impact plugin is an effective way to get the most out of a small set of recordings and to realistically integrate them into a complex physics system where multiple objects and materials can interact.
Thank you. <laughs> Right. Unmuting the microphone. And what I'm saying is <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, I love it. We're talking maximal variation out of a minimal content set. You have that randomization ability to, to be able to, yeah, get a, a lot from a little. Uh, and then also my favorite piece is that position uh, used with that plate of glass to hear that the difference from the middle to the edge, uh, that's pretty fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we, uh, they're like, it's a fairly complex analysis and synthesis algorithm, and there are tons of parameters we could choose to expose to the UI, but we did try and keep, keep it focused on just the idea of like physics integration, and position was like a good kind of use of these parameters and that we could kind of roll into one slider to give you this it's a uh, influence inspired by the the act of like a resonating membrane how it might resonate differently just depending on where you strike it exactly exactly and then i th i thought that the the profiling integration where it allowed you to see the different um the different components that were being matched again, gave a great visualization into how that, how that was being presented. Uh, tell me, you drag the waves in, uh, does the magic just happen? Uh, it makes those, the model and the, separates those things? Yeah, um, so the, the story goes that the old impact, there was a, some tool hidden somewhere that you needed to an analyze your files with. And uh, we've brought all of that into WISE. The analyze, analysis happens in the background when you load the files in. Um, it's, uh, it can take some time with bigger files, but it's all quite reasonable. It shouldn't lock your computer up. And um, once the analysis result is done, it's done. And uh, I saw someone in the chat asking about how performant, uh, performant it was. And uh, the synthesis is really quite cheap. It's, uh, it doesn't ask much more than any of the other kind of source plugins that we have. So. Great, and so as a source plugin, uh, it's something that's in development right now. Um, we don't have a release date for it yet. We're still having fun with it, uh, making it useful. Uh, this is a good theme. Yeah, it's a good theme. Uh, and and I think the there's a lot of excitement in the uh, in the chat room about it. So really solving that that problem of how to get the most from the least uh, from a content perspective, especially something like physics. Um, yeah, it's been really fun to make that Unreal demo because Unreal has a nice physics system. And uh, yeah, it was quite, obviously I'm biased because I made it, but it was quite easy to just take the, the values from Unreal and pipe them into Wise. And, and I'm not a sound designer, so if I can do it, a sound designer surely can. Excellent. We started with a 2D demo as, I think, just an experiment. Sean had the, the grow, instead of the, the launcher having growing balls, it was just boxes on screen. And it, it immediately popped. It like made sense. Oh, OK, we have to pursue this, pursue this idea. So, yeah. yeah. Great. And part of showing this is uh, you know, asking folks what they think. So if you have ideas uh, about it, let us know. Drop a line. Uh, we're interested in having that conversation as as we find a release strategy for it, um, yeah, this will be where we're looking for folks to put their hands on it, give it a try, and be kind of be our guinea pigs uh, to mm -hmm. to make sure yeah. that uh, that we're crafting this in the right way that that brings that value uh, to the to the workflow. Absolutely, definitely, awesome. Uh, well, great. It's so good to see you guys. Thanks for. Uh, for hanging around and being part of the live stream. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks for being part of the future wise. I can't wait. Uh, can't wait till uh, till this becomes something folks can get their hands on. Thanks so much. Take care. Have fun. Okay, awesome. So we just had Ryan and Sean talking about uh, the experimental impact two.
plug in. So that's pretty cool uh, stuff to be uh, to be thinking about here for our future. Uh, and now I'm going to roll this next video. Here is a sneak peek at a workflow that we're working on. Uh, this is a presentation that Nathan Harris did for us a couple weeks ago as part of one of our all hands. Uh, he is going to give us an overview of a future workflow in Unreal for automating rooms and portals inside of Unreal to be used uh, with WISE. So check this out. But today I'm going to show you some new uh, spatial audio workflows uh, in Unreal. So hopefully you guys can all see Unreal. And what we're looking at here is a slightly modified uh, version of the, the uh, spatial audio demo. Um, so one of our main problems with, um, with our current workflow with spatial audio is we, we require a lot of manual placement of um, various boxes around the world. So um, what we want to do is basically just smooth out that workflow. Um, so the first and simplest thing that came to mind is, well, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll point out that uh, I've deleted all the spatial audio volumes and all the portals in this level. And I'm going to go through and place them back for you guys. Um, so first of all, if I want to put a spatial audio volume in this uh, room here, I'm going to drag and drop it. There we go. So and now, instead of having to kind of fiddle around and make sure it's the right shape, um, got a new menu option, fit to geometry down here. And I click that, and bam, it, uh, it just fits nicely into the room. Um, have, let's have a look at the wireframe version here. So, and then I can copy this and paste it. And I get over to the other room, and then this is going to fit to the other room. It's not a perfect fit, so I'm going to move it to a slightly different location. And then it fires the rays, which hit these green points on the wall. And those are the um, sort of a bounding box. So it's, a pretty, it's actually a pretty simple uh, algorithm, and it works quite well. So if I do this one over here, it fits right into that room there. Another one here just for fun. Turn on my option. All right. Now, sometimes, you, like here, the ray goes through the, the portal here. So reduce the, the length of the rays that it, that it uses to fit the volume. And now it's confined to this room. Now, what about portals? So, so Portals, we have a similar fitting mechanism here. So I can just drag this portal into the room, or sorry, into the door frame here, and then click on Fit to Geometry, uh, which is here. And then, bam, and we adjust the, the width of the portal there. Now, I'm going to just copy and paste this. Move it over here, and it fits to that one. And I can very quickly fit more portals to this one. Just to give you an idea of how quick this can be. Now, if you're way off, like here, then it's not going to find it but really doesn't have to be that close. Snap right onto the window there. Oh, 
Okay, so that's all in good, but it can still be a little tedious to uh, drag and drop all these options, all these uh, volumes. So let's just uh, see if we can generate them all in one go. Hit the magic button. And this new volume, which is called the Spatial Audio Generator, has just created all these portals for me in one swoop. And now I'm going to try it with this house here. It's a, a little bit more complex. And it's got some windows that are um, opaque here. So I'm going to just go ahead and hide them. So that, that will make sure it's not um, not taken into account by the algorithm. And the doors inside. All right, so now the generator volume um, encompasses the whole house here. So I click that. And what it's doing is it's converting the geometry into a voxel approximation and then basically running a, um, an image segmentation algorithm, uh, but on 3D data, on voxels. And then after it uh, churns through the, the uh, voxel data, it converts it back to um, a triangle representation and then basically runs the same fit algorithm that you saw me individually placing the uh, the uh, rooms and portals with. So there you have it. Uh, there's a quick demo of some, uh, some of our new workflows for placing volumes in Unreal. Bam. Bam. Internet, we just dropped that on you. That is some new shit. It's not ready for prime time yet. We're still having fun with it. Uh, Nathan Harris uh, just ran through some new super cool uh, work that we're doing on automating uh, geometry uh, for rooms and portals. This is something that every game deals with. Uh, it's, uh, it's a process. I'm sure there are folks out there working right now, drawing their own rooms and portals by hand. And this is something that we're super excited to be cooking behind the scenes. It's not ready yet, but we just wanted to bring you into some of these cool things that we're working on. Um, we wanted to tip you off to... Uh, something about the future uh, that you can imagine as part of your workflow and, and invite you to share that imagination of the future with us. Uh, and so, you know, let us know what you think. Is this something that you got to have? Uh, you're already doing it. Uh, you have a magic wand. Uh, that's two W's. Magic wand. Yeah. Uh, and with that, I'm segueing to uh, our next presentation. This is actually our last presentation of the day. Uh, this is going to be Remy McGill talking UI UX with us. How's it going, Remy? Uh, let's see. So you're going to mute the Google and unmute. Yeah? Okay. Can you hear me now? I hear you. Yeah. All right. But only one of me? Perfect. Only one. We're doing great. Uh, and actually, <laughs> mute, mute button's working over here, too. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, cool. Sweet. Yeah, what's in the live stream? Lots of, lots of good stuff. Uh, that last bit with, um, with Nathan is really, really exciting. Um, yeah. And that the impact is amazing. Um, uh, you know, some folks have all the fun, but that is to say that I think that you've got some fun uh, to share with us as well. So why don't I transition to your presentation and let the let you do your deal? Yeah. So I'm trying to show you some behind the scenes fun. So this is no actual new audio stuff. So 
so curb your expectations. But uh, it's more about just uh, how we how we are, how we do the work in in Wise and and try to evolve the UI. Um, so, in terms of like doing design on something like Wise, um, we uh, have uh, some things to take into account um, and what we focus on um, while we're um, doing that and. So one part is, you know, center focus. So, you know, like Unity or like Unreal, you know, you want kind of a center area to work in. Um, comprehensive usability is really like all the little bits of the application, we want them all to be as usable as possible um, and have just affordances wherever we can, you know, things opening and closing, reusing space, stuff like that. Um, extensibility, we want this to be something that the users can extend and create uh, their own tools when they need to, um, and also customize the user interface uh, as much as they can um, to fit their workflows and, and speed things up for them. Um, and then property visualization, which is really um, trying to give you a visual uh, understanding of the system and, and what's going on um, and what your values are instead of, let's say, you know, uh, lots of text and, and numbers and things like that. Because um, we process things much more, much more quickly visually. So, so step to the next one, which is, um, you know, why is in 2006, so this is a snapshot of the original UI. Uh, dredged up from the archives, and it's pretty high contrast. Um, so, and it's got some interesting icons. Um, so, if we fast forward to 2017, we have uh, this, which the gray is, you know, not quite as hard on the eyes, but the contrast with the the white on the gray um, is really uh, pretty hard on the eyes as, as well. Um, and we got lots of comments from our users to uh, telling us that you know Wise hurts my eyes. I, you know, whenever I use Wise uh, for a length of time, it hurts my eyes. And also questions about uh, dark UI um, because dark UI has become you know much more common um, and uh, and they're cool. Um, so we decided to do a skinning system for WISE so that WISE could be skinned in a number of different ways. Before this, it was all sort of hard-coded. Um, and uh, so we wanted to move from something like this, which has a lot of details and a lot of light and dark moving, you know, uh, your eye has to respond to a lot of light and dark shapes all over the place. Something that's more uh, simple, sort of flat, looking um, and uh, also uh, have a dark uh, version of the UI. So this is like a mock-up uh, that I made uh, you know, a while ago before we did the, the skin system. And then um, step forward to this is sort of current, the current UI and what it ends up looking like. And we have a lot better uh, contrast. Uh, the contrast in the old one was it failed the, you know, the web contrast uh, guidelines. Um, and this is a fair bit better in that way. And we start to have things like, uh, we also integrated at the same time object colors because uh, our customers also asked us, you know, can we have colors on stuff? Because this is a very common thing in DAWs. Um, to help, you know, identify things, you know, your eye really quickly go, okay, purple thing, purple thing, you know, and be able to uh, match them. Um, and then we have the light UI. So after we did the dark UI, the dark UI was good, um, but some people still didn't uh, want a dark UI. Um, and there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because, you know, if you're in a very bright, environment there are more reflections on the screen and a light uh, UI deals deals better with that um, you, you don't see the reflections as much because so much of the UI is bright um, so we did a so let me just start step back um, so we did a light UI for to help those people and also people with um, more vision problems um, a lighter UI is actually a bit easier for them um, in terms of, of contrast and reading everything. Um, 
So another thing that we did along with this is that, okay, well, now we have the skins and we have some global way to manipulate these. Uh, Bernard had the great idea of, you know, well, maybe we can put contrast and color controls in. So we, we did that. Um, and so we now have like a user preferences where you can change between the different um, skin themes. Um, but we also have some ways to adjust the lightness and contrast of it. So this is the light theme, just the standard. And after some adjustments of, of uh, values, we end up with something that's even more high contrast, which um, for if you have uh, difficulties with, with vision, you know, that this is the thing that is the easiest to um, see um, and read everything. Um, so, and if we step back to the dark UI, this is the standard dark UI. We can play with them, some of the parameters and come up with some weird night uh, version of it. Um, so really you can adjust it a fair bit to um, your desire. You can tweak the color to more, you know, orangish, which tends to be easier um, on the eyes, uh, especially at night. Um, but really it's, you know, you can take the basic theme and then adjust it to um, to what you uh, what you desire. Um, so the the next thing um, is so as we're dealing with color, um, we want to make sure that we do you know good color for color blind users. Um, and so part of that means choosing colors that um, they can see a bit better, and then also visually identifying items without color. So whenever you have icons, you want to make sure that you can understand the icon, you know, even if you can't see the color of the icon. Um, so here's sort of an example. Uh, we have the old, uh, so this is like 2017, Moon um, Solo buttons, and then we have the new ones down here. And and these columns are what they look like um, in full color versus like a red green color blind versus mon monochromatic. Um, so in full color, um, you know, you can kind of tell between yellow and green, I guess, um, even though the contrast is not great. Uh, contrast for a bit better here. But when you switch to red green color blind, you, you see that actually they both show up yellow which is not super uh, helpful. Um, so in the new one, if we look at this and the, the red, green, colorblind, they you know both show up well because yellow and uh, blue are the colors that are more visible um, when you look at it through, through the color filters for this. So, and that's actually you know part of the reason that these colors were chosen. It's partially looking at other DAWs to see, you know, what are the commonalities between places, and then also, you know, what colors um, can colorblind people see well. Um, and then just monochromatic, your eye, you know, in terms of contrast, uh, the 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 quickness for you to you know see something and understand what it what it is 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 often um, a lot about contrast so in monochromatic uh, the contrast is a bit better and it's a bit clearer okay on versus off um, then we have some of these more complex states that um, that anyway you can tell that they're different whether you can tell exactly what they mean is is uh, maybe another question um, so uh, another thing that came up was, you know, one of our customers uh, came to us and said, you know, your colorblind icons, I can't tell what they are uh, because they're all dots and they look the same. So if we look at colorblind, you know, these guys, you know, this is um, unmodified, this is modified or I think maybe checked out and they both look almost exactly the same. Um, and then we have these guys. Just the the design of them was not great for quickly, you know, at a glance um, seeing what they were. So we adjusted them, um, made sure that they, the shape of them um, is distinct, even though uh, the colors, regardless of if you have color. Um, and if we look at colorblind, you can still tell what they are. Um, and also the you know the the default one 
which you kind of generally don't care about. You just you want to know when there's something you need to pay attention to. It's actually darker than than the rest, so that it doesn't pop out as much. And then these ones pop out for you. Um, another another project that we're currently doing is uh, some curve editing stuff, and uh, we want to work on the you know the colors to just make them more uh, accessible. Um, and this is kind of the old colors that we had. You know, when you look at it through a colorblind, you know, a lot of these really look very similar. Um, especially stuff that's like right next to each other looks very similar. So that's not the easiest thing to work with. It makes your brain work a lot harder. Uh, so we changed up the colors, and so now we have like a clear uh, difference between the you know blue and the yellow and brightness differences between things. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's about it. So, I mean, all these uh, decisions are really just uh, trying to make things as accessible as possible and uh, easy as you know, get some eye candy when we can, but also make sure that everything is uh, is easy to use. You know, over over the long term. Well, I mean, you showed a bunch of uh, different aspects of the UI, how it's changed over the years, you know, bringing user colors in was a big deal, right? Bringing skins in, like, I was there, man. I was there when Wise turned on dark mode and it was fucking awesome, right? Uh, and and I think that continuing to uh, evolve that against the pillars that you talked about up front, um, it really, it really brings um, the focus on accessibility in the UI and trying to, you know, bring the user experience uh, into a sharp focus. And, and that's as the UI UX lead at Audio Kinetic, that's kind of what you're up to. Uh, and, and you're using those pillars to measure each new feature and each opportunity to fine tune things. Yep, step by step, we we'll get there. Yeah, and it's a, and it's a long process, right? Because as as you showed that trajectory from uh, Wise two thousand six to today, right? Uh, it's a slow incremental process of of evolution, and uh, it's really great having you as as the tip of the spear leading that charge. Cool. Right. Thanks. On. Uh, happy to join the stream. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic to have you. Fantastic to see you. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. No problem. Thanks. All right. Bye. Cool. See ya. Okay, that was Remy McGill talking UI UX. Uh, just a fascinating evolution, fascinating process. I love, uh, I love the story there. It's really, um, it's really cool to see how that has moved forward. Where even are we? This is what we got left. Uh, we got an interview coming up right now with Guy Whitmore from Foxface Rabbitfish. And then I'm going to do a little wrap up because we're winding it down. And then we will uh, find our way to the AK Beverage Community Meetup. Uh, ask you to join us in a hangout. It'll be just a few, and then we'll drop the code for that so you can. Meet us over there and uh, forward to catching up with you. But first, let's see if we can't find Guy Whitmore in the green room and get him all set up. Uh, what can I say about Guy in advance before I bring him into this live stream? What indeed? Like uh, Guy and I have worked together for a lot of years, he actually brought me here to Seattle. I, I blame him and uh, in the best possible way. Uh, a, accomplished composer, uh, interactive and otherwise, um, in, an intense creative and currently working freelance from his new basement studio. I introduce to you, Guy Whitmore, welcome to the stream. Hello. Yeah. Can you all see me? Yeah. Oh, we're in. We're in. Okay. We're talking. I can see good. I can see you and I can hear you. This is incredible. Oh my God. Good deal. We must be living in the future. 
This is the future. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. Yeah. yeah. How's it? This has been a good day. Uh, I've been enjoying it. It's, uh, <laughs> we're, we're wrapping it down here. We're kind of at the end of it. And, um, yeah, I'm telling you, I feel good. I feel good. So, excellent. Uh, but it's good to have you here. Uh, you just finished up a project. Uh, Something that a little one. was mentioned here uh, just recently during the Dolby talk. Uh, right. Tell us about oh. Ori and Will of the Wisps. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, remarkable. Uh, you know, I, I remember playing the first Ori with my daughter and going, oh, I would love to work on that franchise. And it happened thanks to uh, the awesome people at Formosa. Um, you know, and got to work with Christopher Larson, who was the audio director. Uh, Alex Johnson was an audio lead as well. We all kind of split it up. Uh, I got to bring on a couple of my contractors to help out, um, Seth Wright and Jacob Denny, just because we needed a bundle of help on the integration side. And, uh, you know, it came out last month and, uh, so grateful. Yeah. <laughs> like the tide crashing on the shore, it came out. Yes. And uh, uh, just in time. Uh, just in time for uh -huh. everybody to stay inside and play. So Yeah. But uh, a, a great accomplishment. And as, as Andy Vaughn was saying, uh, you know, leveraging Atmos. So yes. even though we've got a, a very 2D game, um, just that immersion mm -hmm of bringing yeah. people into the world or putting them in the world with sound. Um, right. And I guess anything stick out as far as, uh, you know, just cool, cool things that, uh, that really lent itself to that immersion. Yeah. I, I know that Christopher did a full interview with Dolby on the Atmos side of that. So if, seek that out if you can find it for sure on details. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where it's a side scroller, but we wanted depth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was responsible for a good bit of the ambient uh, design. The first thing I noticed was the parallaxing visuals. You know mm -hmm. how it just goes, you know, there's the front and then you got, and the artists had names for, you know, they had the backs and far backs. So I started thinking about audio in terms of, okay, this is in front. This is in back, far back. Of course, my back was going this way. Yeah. Theirs was going in that way. So it had this interesting, you know, you look into the screen, but you hear behind you sort of approach. Yeah. Um, even though you never get to turn around. I mean, you do, but not in the same way as you would uh, in other games. But uh, definitely had the sense of being enveloped was the thing. Because it's, you know, surround is about emotion as much or more than, in my opinion, than... Uh, than telling me where somebody is or something is. It was, it's about the immersion and, and uh, storytelling. And it's almost like you're wrestling with a depth of field for audio, right? You're pushing some yes. sounds further back. You're, you're moving them uh, into the rear. Um, yeah. It helps with mixing a ton, actually, you know, sure. just to be able to take the ambiences and never have them in center, you know, and, and some things just pull back a little bit. Um, it was, you know, a lot of fun to, to work with, and Wise makes that really easy. Um, we definitely we worked with a lot of different formats too. Uh, I know a lot of people with ambiences come in with big surround files and quads and stuff, and we had definitely had some quads. Uh, but I tend to work with more stereo and mono sources and paint them around, um, and then be able to control them and reuse them in different situations. Of course, of course, and then. Uh Again, you're a longtime Wise user, deep, deep into uh, music systems. We're talking like Peggle 2, which I worked with you on, was, uh, was just a feat of music implementation using Wise. Uh, Bejeweled Stars, after that, uh, you helped out Gareth Coker on the music side of things yeah. with Ori as well. Right, right. Now, and... It was a really, really great to work with Gareth. He's he's not only a remarkable composer, but he knew this game inside and out pretty much better than anybody, as, including the dev team. Uh, he uh, he knows he's a composer who knows the game that he's scoring, and and 
you know, the way I use the term music designer, he was the music designer. Yeah. And that he knew where every piece of music should start, where it should end, how it should fade out. You know, we were talking. So uh, my job was to take that instruction and make it really work. Um, we had some back and forth, but given the time frame, we were like, all right, let's get this going. Um, at first, I was not intimidated because I was like, okay, well, it's going to be mostly uh, track to track, moving from one to the next, and as long as you do that well. But the devil in the detail here uh, was really more about a, a, what ended up being a massive state-based system. And um, in any given level or scene, that's not a problem because the number of states are small. But when you get across an entire game of I'm in this world with this thing or this thing happening, do I have the bow and arrow? Do I, you know, do I have this weapon? Uh, do I have that power? Uh, because the more and more more we wanted to do things, it wasn't just whenever you get back to this area, play this music. It's like, no, if you go back to this area after you've done this, that, and the other thing, then play this piece of music. But if it's after this thing, play that piece. So there was a lot of if-then uh, state systems. And, uh, you know, that was all done. Um, two things we had to do. First, there was a connection between... Uh, Unity and Wise. How do you get the game states over to Wise? And they built a nice little UI for me, and I was able to say, map this game state to this Wise state, and boom, 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 and that was superb uh, and worked really well. But there's still the issues of sometimes states in a game don't really know what each other are doing, so you you have to make sure that you don't have conflicts of you know, sometimes wise might go, well, did you mean this state combination or this one? Because they're both legal. They both fall under your, uh, you know, this situation and you can weight them. And the more states you're dealing with and the more uh, depth and, and breadth of a game, the more complex that, that that can become. And to me, that was the biggest kind of lesson, set of lessons and takeaways. I learned so much uh, just making sense of it all and do you have states that are one massive flat state system one parent and a bunch of little bunch of children or do you have it tiered in you know where you have this master state then a, another parent that's children of children of children yeah and that has its own set of advantages and disadvantages yep so yeah it's uh you never will be able to kind of i don't know how I would teach it in a class other than to throw a game at somebody because you don't really appreciate the complexities until you start wiring it with a game. Yeah, and this is something we were talking about with Brock early around the different WISE certifications where, you know, our 101 and 201 certification, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is WISE fundamentals uh, inside the box. But it really starts to make sense when you couple it with Cube, when you couple it with the Wise Adventure game, yeah. uh, when you actually have something to, yeah, exercise those opportunities within and a context to frame them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you're only dealing with Wise and, you know, you can work with the states, and especially in the music side, it has that state machine I don't know what what's the term for it, but where uh, uh, with any given switch container, you can set up multiple states. And if it's this plus this, yep, that's super cool. But it doesn't mean anything until you get to plug it into the game and have it uh, feedback with you. So, well, and every you know, game's going to be different, right? It's uh, absolutely. Uh, you are a living testament to that, right? The the complexity that you're able to undertake as part of Ori. Uh, is way different than what you built for Bejeweled Stars or what we built in yeah. Peggle Two. Like, and and uh, they were yeah. they were all two D games. Yep. Whatever. Right. Yeah. You think you know it all, and then you go, "Oh my God, this is completely different." And you know, another reason that my my brain was hurting. So yeah. it there's always something new to learn. People think, "Oh yeah, you probably know all this." I'm like, I learned so much in Ori and worked with in different areas of wise, you know, I've worked in the music system, but doing ambiences, I got to work in the 3d area a lot more than I have. And, uh, which is great. So, uh, yeah, you never stop, never stop learning. And for any composers doing this interactive or uh, study states and really, really, really 
boy, I, I, you'd almost have to, I'd have to give a course <laughs> there, in this. It's a thing. People do that for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but I think what you said, always be learning, right? There, uh, yeah. there's no, there's no end of the road really. And this is hearkening back to, I had RJ and Carly on, they were talking about, um, VR and kind of the evolution of it. And we compared it to, you know, game audio. We compared it to rock and roll. It's like these things are always yeah. evolving. So you, there's, you do yourself a favor to be a insatiable learner and continue to, yes. to find opportunities to do it. Not necessarily. Um, well, again, there's the difference between, yeah, I'm reading it, I'm learning it. And there's the, mm -hmm. I'm applying it in this very unique way, which requires a kind of creativity that, that doesn't exist in the box, let's say. Yeah, absolutely. The, what's the, it's in theory, practice and theory are the same. In practice, they're not, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's been a motto for me all the time. It's like, oh, this should work. Well, but it's not, so I gotta, move some levers and get it to work or like right. why does this work like it's working uh yeah it shouldn't be i don't think theoretically theoretically yeah don't touch it <laughs> don't touch it let it do its thing yeah always uh, so you have to that's, that's the process and you know the other thing too uh ori was a unity project but it's their own brand like they've they branched it and done their own thing so it was learning basically a new engine other than some of the ui looks familiar but then a whole bunch was totally brand new so you're it's never like oh, i've learned pro tools and i've mastered it it's like no it's it's going to keep evolving and as wise keeps evolving we'll keep growing with it you know so yeah i think so i think so uh i believe it and it's it's always it's always fun to get a new toy in the toy box right uh, yeah just as much fun as it is to rediscover a an an old way of doing something that applies to a current situation right yeah all those concepts come back they come flying back you go oh i haven't done this since the 90s and all of a sudden yeah you know it becomes relevant again for yeah. something or other. Again, hearkening back to Carly and RJ talking about how, you know, hey, VR, spatial audio, it's a total oh, yeah. thing, right? Uh, and yet here they are, they're kind of in between worlds where they're leveraging game audio technology and techniques that have existed for years and sprinkling on that spatial audio component, um, you know, in... Uh, yep. It, in collaboration, right? Or in concert with yeah. each other. A little, yes. a little bit old, a little new, uh, a little bit blue, a little bit full. Yeah, when I'm, yeah, when I'm teaching, I always talk about learn. The thing you're really learning are the concepts, yeah. not the tool, right? Because the tool is going to change. And the concepts are the thing that you bring with you year to year, project to project, even though it's the button's in a different place, right? So you just bring the concepts forward and uh, you'll be all right. You know, it's kind of my motto. And it's always, every project is totally different. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's so, well, after, yeah, it's it's been. I would say after all ahead. these years, it must still be engaging. Uh, oh. Always new yeah. challenges. Yeah, from that standpoint, you know, the I'm never bored sort of thing with my job. I don't have that problem at all. Um, I also do want to bring up, I, I think there's opportunity when I talk to composers in particular, um, I, I see opportunity here with the, the exact thing, with the things we're talking about, integration, music design, and bridging that gap between DAW, um, WISE, and Audio Engine, that the big three. And when, when you get in game production and going fast at a clip, the, the best moments were when all three of those were up and humming and seamless. Yeah. Like I could go from daughter wise to game, daughter wise to game, blah, 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 and just iterate that. And I encourage anybody who's learning to kind of really get that cycle moving. And that moves in all directions. Like I'm going from wise to daw to back to wise and back to game. And to me, the more we can get that, the UI between that, but I mean how you have your screen set up, 
flowing, the better your your flow is going to be. Um, it's not, I did all my doll work last week. I'm going to do all my wise work this week. It, it, it can start that way. But by the time you're in production, it's like, I got to fly back to the, I got, you know, yeah. and just connect it. And uh, there are painfully few composers who do that work, that whole zero to 100, very few. Uh, and I've been seeing a good amount of work because part in part because there are few very few composers who can't who to do that at a at a certain level you know sure and and, uh, and we're kind of hoping here that that some of the evolution tools wise will help bring that accessibility to folks who maybe don't live across all those worlds and i'm going to throw back to uh benoit santari when he presented on the unreal integration uh mm -hmm. and the way that we're now syncing wise across unreal and the authoring yeah. application so you can bi-directionally communicate so you can change yeah. an event name in unreal propagate it to wise automatically and just keep flowing uh previous iteration mm -hmm. was not as smooth was not as tight and i think that as software yeah. developers that's our job right our job is to increase that accessibility and bring the workflow to people who need it, right? And in your case, you're saying yeah. if composers had their hands in these tools across those three pipelines, if they had that kind of connectivity and were and it was accessible in a way, uh, that's really yeah. where the power and kind of the fun of having everything humming on all engines um, really Yeah, happens. absolutely. And I think because there's a chicken egg situation there because sometimes it frustrates people, uh, sound designers and composers alike, um, you know, we had some nice things like you you could open Unity and WAPI would automatically connect with WISE. So without even clicking, yeah. you know, they just had little things like little things. You go, oh, that saved me a minute here. But over the course of the project, it probably saved me several hours. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a chicken egg thing because we need people in it to help develop the tools but people won't get in it as much or the uh, won't be as uh, as many people in it until the tools. So we tools kind of have to move towards a better UI yeah. and then people need to get in, have that conversation and make it better, um, yeah. you know, as we go. Cause uh, you know, so we're still all pioneers really, I think. So we're talking about, is it early days or not? I, Still feels pretty early to me. <laughs> Still feels wild frontier as well. Uh, and with that, yeah. I think tremendous opportunities um, to continue evolving those workflows and uh, and and learning. I think right. That's going to be my favorite takeaway from this conversation. Uh, it's just great to land here at the end of this live stream with you on those kind of deep thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. Really great information here. Some I love. The DSP stuff, the you know plugin stuff that's coming along, uh, the you know physical modeling stuff. It's, it's yeah. You can see it in the chat room that everybody's getting excited about certain things. And, yeah, yeah. It's it's been fun yeah. to watch it flow by and uh, and see people talking about what's cool and what they're excited about. Uh, of course, here we're excited kind of about everything, uh, which is why this ended up being six and a half hours long. Uh, right because right. there's just so much cool stuff happening. There's so many cool people working to bring this uh, to the community. And uh, I'm glad you were able to share a small piece of it here at the end. It's a perfect landing Always. for me. And uh, I'm getting ready to tie this off. And uh, I bet, right? Yeah, it's about beer 30 or something. Yeah, so with that, uh, I'm going to put up a link to the community hangout here in a few minutes after a little wrap up. But I just wanted to say thanks so much for participating today. It's, My pleasure. Uh, As always, thanks for putting us on. In a way, we're closing a loop from the first live stream oh, that yeah. Audio Kinetic ever did, which was hosted by you. That's right, in this very room, yeah. The studio's further along, it's coming along. We've still got Murphy on the floor. Murphy, help! Oh. oh, yeah. Come here, buddy. Say hi to the crew. <laughs> There's Murphy. Yeah, dog's a game audio. Yep. Awesome. Ah, oh, fantastic guy. 
Well, all right. Thanks again so much yeah. for being a part of things. Uh, had a great time, and I'll see you soon. Take care all out right. there. Stay safe. All right. Cheers, man. Okay. Bye bye. So that was a great talk with Guy Whitmore. Uh, just a casual chat between friends uh, about game audio, uh, about learning. Uh, it's really a gift to be here at the end of our live stream. That just lands me right here at the wrap up before we go off to the community meetup. Um, yeah, this is just, I, I put this here just so that I could kind of have my, the last word, right? Because over 20 speakers, uh, four development partners, uh, and a couple special guests thrown in. Um, it's been quite a day. So I just wanted to say thanks. Uh, we missed seeing you at conferences uh, recently. Um, we're all trying to find our way uh, in the world right now under the circumstances. And this felt like an opportunity to bring some of the cool stuff that we've been working on uh, to you, give you a chance to see what has been cooking. And most of it is, is available. Um, jump online, audiokinetic.com. It's waiting for you. Uh, take some of the time that you have uh, and do that learning piece um, if you have it in you. And if you don't, hey, that's okay too. What does productivity mean today? Uh, not the same thing that it did yesterday. So be easy on yourself. Um, take care and take care of each other. Um, we all need to work together. And as a global game audio community, it feels as important now as ever that we try to bridge these gaps between people. So if uh, you're looking for folks, uh, there are online resources that you can leverage during these times. Uh, and you don't have to throw a rock too far to find the game audio community online. Uh, there's lots of resources across social media. Um, just, again, bridge that gap in any way you feel comfortable. Um, and yeah, just really glad to be here today. Thanks to all of our presenters for taking the time today uh, in you know technical run-throughs, presentations, uh, giving themselves uh, their time to this event, to the community. Um, it's been, it's been a whirlwind, honestly. Um, and I'm super stoked that, yeah, six and a half hours later, like it's still going. Um, so I'm just going to take a, a breath, a little victory lap, and, uh, I will see you over in the community meetup. Uh, we are going to open up a Google Hangout that you're welcome to join and just chill. Uh, we'll call it the wrap down. The green room seemed to be a term that picked up speed. Uh, so even though this slide is red, I'll see you in the green room. Uh, I'm going to keep this slide up for a few minutes. Uh, let that kind of roll on out. Otherwise, take care of yourself, take care of each other, stay safe, and thanks for, for participating in the WISE Worldwide Online Expo. Maybe we'll see you next time. Take care.